Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Saturday Showdown. Not all Saturday Showdowns are created equal. This one is a telecom war. Very, very excited to see what's going to happen this time around. Of course, when we had it in round one, it was three full games. This time around, you've got KT coming off a loss against Humble Life Esports, but T1 also dropping a game to Nongshim. It could be scrappy, it could be messy, but if we know anything, it's not exciting. I'm Atlas, this is of course Huni and Wolf, as you can see right now, and it's time to dive in to another Telecom War. Yeah, I, I feel like a lot of people going into this week of matches, myself included, looked at it as a big opportunity for KT. That loss to Hanwha Life, especially in which they, like the way in which they lost it, um, does make this matchup feel a little bit uh, rougher around the edges for them, as you love to see old shots like this. Good old KT rolls to the old logo. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a tradition here that we've had in Korea since 2004. It's been almost 20 years. I like the photo because I was there too. Yeah, that's why I'm here. I was gonna say, I like, I recognize that mm -hmm. SKT jersey. That that's mm -hmm. that's a bit of a Huni vibe over mm -hmm. there. And of course, a little bit of a uh, hearkening back to when Deft was on KT back in 2018. Of course, that was a brighter time uh, for KT fans uh, all the way up until the knockouts of Worlds, where everything just got dark and gloomy once again. And that is often the way with KT. Your hopes keep rising, and when they get too high, that's when all of the troubles come in. Let's have a look at the match record over the last three years between T1 and KT. You can see there is a brief, bright spot in summer of last year where KT really did uh, get in form. That's when things were looking very, very good for that roster. That was, of course, the roster that got all pro every single player uh, at the end of that season. I mean, in 2021, KT had a lot of problems. That was not a strong year for them. But you notice besides that, since we started 2022, there's very few zeros here. These teams have actually played each other very close over the last three years. So, or last two years, I should say, now moving into the third. Uh, and including 2024, that also went to three. Both of their playoff games went to five. And I think if KT could find form tonight, we might have another three-game series on our hands. Yeah, but when KT actually won as a record, it always was 2-0. So if KT take the one game off from the T1, there's a pretty good chance they go 2-0 again. We'll as have to see. Wise. Of course, game one of uh, the first round, Robin, was in fact a victory. As you can see right here, KT were able to take that one, but then it was the reverse sweep in the best of three. Looking at this, uh, these results, though, you can see that T1 are on a ridiculous winning streak. Um, just losing that one game against KT, and then it was 2-0, some smooth sailing, all the way up until that blip against Nongshim. But of course, Nongshim actually playing extremely well in that series. If you go back and watch it, I think that a lot of what you're thinking about is the fact that Nongshim has so much untapped potential, uh, which is great to see. But let's uh, dive in and... Uh, Recall what happened in the first meeting of these two teams only a few weeks ago. Yeah, the first game was really impressive. I remember watching this game and thinking to myself, like, wow, Barrel on Alistair, you know, Deft on Callista, this this bottom synergy that Deft and Barrel have had for so long is really showing itself once again. And, you know, obviously there were a lot of uh, mistakes made in the series by T1, but I think it was just really well punished and really good proactive play out of KT. And for me, for KT in general, this is one of the series that really started to make me believe that maybe this team was actually going to be a top three contender just because at the peak of their display of skill here, you really they really showcase this team's synergy is so good. Yeah, I mean, I just wouldn't say like like it's a really draft gap. It's just like I really like the draft around like their strength, which is like the barrel champion pool and also their synergies. Like you synergize really well with the, especially Kalista, I think today is like it's going to be really main focus. And these things like they played the, T, the, TK, the TK lane really, really strongly. And with the owner actually just diving bottom in level three, just Parma just living in bottom, just pushing enemy jungler. And it was like really, really great to win. Like it was so easy for them executed. Yeah, I think Zyabrakhan, this was the early days of the season where we were starting to find out this uh, this duo doesn't really feel very strong into a lot of the meta picks right now. And even Tom Kench, uh, Jinx, which is very much not meta, uh, allows you to set up dives if you have a poppy pick. And 
just super vulnerable here. Now, in the mid lane, we're also seeing uh, Faker kind of mind game BDD a little bit. Both of these players having some good moments, some bright moments, but Faker definitely getting the better of him overall in the series. And it's really exciting to see this really historic matchup between two mids who've been part of the LCK for so long. We're both so good at both the Orianna and the Azir, which are obviously very meta right now. Yeah, it does feel like we do have a little bit of uh, champion pool synergy between uh, both of our mid laners here in this game. And I think that now that we're on this patch specifically as well, it does feel like things are starting to open up. Maybe we get, you know, the world famous Faker Rise. Who knows? Karis has already played it. But we do need to delve into what recently happened to KT because they really did struggle. Um, I think that uh, the Zyra Khan highlight that we saw from the previous um, set of highlights that we had really is kind of exposed here as well because range has been an issue uh, for KT to deal with. Yeah, I mean, this is like really tough lose. Like, I mean, especially the meta of, obviously meta, uh, it changed a lot like between like the first highlight and this highlight because it just happened yet. Yeah, like yeah, uh, the two days ago, which is like, I think this week, I think it's gonna be whoever actually read the meta like faster or adopt out the meta faster. It's gonna be the key point of the two-day matches. Yeah, there were some big mistakes made by KT, uh, like for example, walking into this Rakan as well, and just playing really overconfident. You know, I was talking to Atlas about this before the show started, saying I think KT kind of choked. They were a little bit nervous, but Atlas kind of gave me a different spin of it, which is basically they were playing overconfident. You know, looking back at some of these plays, they kind of just face walked into brushes and tried to to win because they were so far ahead, and they choked away a very one game, and then the second game was not close at all. Unfortunately, it really just got destroyed by Hanwha Life, and I think KT very much showing that they can be a momentum-based team. If they take a tough loss like that, they do not bounce back in game two, which is so different from the world's 2022 roster that makes up most of this team, because they were down and out so many times, were able to recover really well. Not so much so in this series, and I think KT definitely really going to have to go back to the drawing board a little bit here. I don't think that necessarily they shouldn't play Smolder, but maybe they should rethink how they play Smolder. That might be the case. This was, of course, the highlight of uh, Delight taking an Elder Dragon and then the bigger Elder Dragon actually winning uh, that particular battle. Um, but this is some of the lowlights, like you were talking about, Wolf. And it did feel like KT kind of got exposed for ego plays in Game 1 and then felt embarrassed in Game 2 and refused to actually make any of those proactive plays, which is what makes KT strong. It's... Uh, it's, it's, it's a thing that we've actually seen with a lot of these players many times in the past. Yeah, I mean, I really think the KT, when we are actually expecting that not, they're going to be performing. Like, that's the time that they actually perform. Yep. And when we are actually expecting the KT, they're going to, oh, they're going to be 2-0. They don't. So today, they're going to show something different. Well, we, expectations. we expect that they're going to lose. So I guess maybe that means... It's going to be interesting. That maybe it means that we're going to see at least an extended series. Because that's all I think anyone wants for a telecom wall. We just, like, give us three games, give us close series, and give us fun picks. And we've got Carrier and Barrel. Like, surely we're going to be okay for the fun picks. Right, guys? I mean, I'm 100% okay going just two hours game. It's a telecom <laughs> war, man. Like, I've been through there. It's all good. And I've been there... We had an hours game like in the last KT series. It was the longest of the season. We had the 56 minutes or something like that. It was absolutely ludicrous. And we're celebrating some milestones here tonight as well. When it comes to some of our matchups, it's actually going to be really, really fun. Um, but let's have a look at the top side of the map because this was the first time that Perfect was truly tested. And I think that we can all say that it was a resounding failure. Yeah, I mean, for Perfect, it was like really big test. Like we were like actually having a lot of question mark to Perfect, like the start of the seasons that we, sh we we knew that Perfect was a decent top laner, but we didn't know that he's going to be good or on the stage especially. And especially against the T1 series, they was clapping. But the thing is like Perfect was like having still didn't need a time like more to adjust to playing on the stage, get used to it. So Jay, uh, Zeus obviously he's like by far right now is like one of the best top laner in LCK, like I would say even worldwide as well. So I think it was like really good inspire for the perfect. It actually, especially after the T1 series is over, I think he's been performing actually better. It wasn't like he dropped down performances, like he he learned more like actually 
like from the opponents that oh this guy actually was he played really good so I gotta I gotta learn something so I, I saw a lot more from the perfect was more delicating to play. Yeah, we've heard a lot of people saying from the KT side that perfect is like staying at the practice facility late by himself and just grinding solo queue games and trying to really get the most out of reviewing scrims and stuff like that. And I think he's leveled up massively since those games that he played against Zayas in that first telecom war. And obviously, you know, he passed the keen test after this, right? And Zayas also had a bit of a rougher game against Nongshim, to be honest. That was an uncharacteristically weak series for him. I think definitely this top matchup could be one where KT could shine, and I think people will be surprised at how well Perfect plays. I mean, I think that's the hope if you're a KT fan. Yeah, and I actually think that it was the biggest mismatch that we uh, witnessed in the very first outing of the Telecom War, and I'm just hoping that we see the top lane not be this huge hole that the, that KT fails to fill, and instead it comes down to you know what you've drafted, how well you've played towards your win conditions, and things like this. Especially on a day like today, as we're going to highlight, this is going to be... A pretty interesting one. This is the hundredth time that we're going to see both BDD face off against Faker and Deft face off against Faker. It's actually kind of nutty that it works out this way. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Like, obviously, they play like a long amount, like really, really gigantic amount, like yearly, like more than like actually like nine years, you know, 10 years, especially Faker and Deft. But it's both, it's crazy. The triangle makes it nine, eight games. It's both. The three people is gonna hit the 100 games together. And Faker just has such a insane winning record against both of these legendary players, right? And consider, obviously, some of the teams Def was on uh, towards the later part of his career. That's part of why Faker has such a winning record there. But BDD, a little bit more dominant team still, though. 20 wins behind Faker. It's absolutely insane. And I mean, Faker and Deft, old time rivals. We saw them clash at Worlds in 2022. That was a really exciting storyline there. And I mean, these are some of our oldest players right now that we have in the LCK, and they're still at peak form. And that's always just really exciting to see. I think people in the old days would say, once you get 24, 25, like there's no way you can keep playing professionally. But a lot of these players are really changing the narrative on that note. And you know, players like Deft and BD getting closer to that age mark definitely, I think, have a potentially long career ahead of them still. Yeah, and you've like there's been a huge turnaround as well. Especially you mentioned Deft. Like first it was the last dance in 2022, and now he's like. Yeah, but like, I want to keep doing this. So even if I have to go, go to military, like I'll come back and well, I'll just keep playing afterwards. It's fine. Just take a little bit of a break. It'll be okay. So uh, I really do like that this whole stigma of you can get too old and then you can't play anymore, like is slowly but surely going away. And that is absolutely fantastic. Let's have a look at the mid lane matchup first though and really dive in as both of these players definitely known for control mages can dip into, you know, I mean, Faker's got like 76 unique champions played over his career. That's a lot. Um, so they've got lots of strings to their bow, but it's mainly been control mages this season. Yeah, I think uh, some unique things here, obviously the Syndra that BDD has played um, and then the Karma that Faker pulled out, BDD hasn't shown us just yet. Um, but also the proclivity for BDD to play Talia, which has been so meta oh, basically yeah. all tournament long. And he's one of our best Talia players, if not the best Talia player in the league right now. So that's one I think T1 have their eyes on. And the Hui is very strong right now. Faker proved that he is very good at this pick. So I think that's another one that KT should have their eyes on. Yeah, I mean, we definitely do have to highlight the Faker Oriana. The win rate is really, really crazy. Of course, we know that T1 is winning a lot, but still, like in terms of like he has a like the long history, like he has a, so many um, amount of game he played it, he's been professionally, and he's been playing for t more than ten years. The Oriana, like yep. obviously, he's gonna be good at it. I remember a Cho'Gath in a game where Faker had a pretty famous uh, shockwave as well. He, that's what I make. It was, that, that's all? me, by the way. Yeah, no, that, I think that was Huni. I think, and, and he, he flashed silence to stop. <laughs> I flashed play. silence first. The yeah. faster the yeah. shockwave, exactly. And fast, even Rock kind of faster than Rokan getting, yeah, getting exactly. In. So they couldn't get it flushed out. Need to make sure we set, mm. set the record straight for I that do one. Wanna, I do want to touch on this for a <laughs> before we get in too much into Tahuni's glory days. Um, this is a pick that both of these mid laners have utilized quite heavily, and even uh, we did see Keria utilize once in the support role. Uh, it's been banned against BDD so much, he actually hasn't even played it yet this season. It is disabled, so it feels like in a lot of ways a big nerf to both of these teams, but because they both utilize it well, it kind of evens out 
But just want to let everyone know that Nico, of course, is disabled this week, so there's no way that we're going to see that, even though I think in a normal telecom war, um, if it was enabled, it would definitely be a prio pick. It absolutely would, and it might be heading towards that bottom lane, like you were saying. Let's uh, have a look at the bottom lane champion pools between both Carrier and Beryl, our master chefs of uh, the LCK right now, who just like to pick whatever the heck they want to pick. And you can see in red uh, some of the more dangerous ones, um, especially Carrier, his Lux performance was out of control. I mean, it's just like if you see the, the pocket pick like or like the Joker pick, like which is like it's crazy that it's just a lane bully. Like, which is also, they're all winning with those pick that they're just, they're bullying in lane so hard that it's like, they're just games end like in five minutes. Like some pick, like as we see, like Kate Locks, those kind of pick, like they, they broke the turret B for 10 minutes. They just yeah. swapped to top. They take the plate and they swapped to mid and they took plate again. Yeah, we're seeing a little bit more uh, ranged, uh, or not ranged, rather, um, late game AD carries, the scaling AD carries that are being played rather than like Lucian, Varus, right? I'm not saying Varus doesn't scale, but you know what I mean? We're seeing more Aphelios. We're seeing Zeri come back. So picks like this, I think, could be strong to punish those types of champions, right? Um, and we'll see if the Zyra, for example, for Barrel does come back out. I'd love to see that. I do think that there is a pretty high chance, to be honest, that we see something like that in this best of three because both of these players know each other so well. They have such a history, and uh, the meta is, is very open right now in terms of how you can get that lane bullying going. And the best teams are so good at it. So I would expect it's not just going to be um, Lucian lanes today or anything like that. I think at least one of these potentially three games will have something crazy in it. No, I would I would 100% agree. I actually think that having some of these trap picks in the bottom lane really could turn the tides in this series just in general. But we did hear from both Hirai and Koma about this matchup. Uh, Koma saying we won't let our guard down for round two and we'll be ready to show you a good performance on stage. And Hirai will do our best together to make each day meaningful, both in the process and in the results. It really does read beautifully, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I love Hirai so much. He's just always got something really profound to say. And I think for KT, you gotta make these days meaningful. You gotta bounce back after that loss against Hanwha Life. You gotta keep this team in a good mentality moving into the second round to try to keep them competitive, keep them top four. So maybe they can make that playoff run they failed to do last summer. If I, if I was a player, if I see that, like uh, it, it means a lot. It'll be really touchy. <laughs> I agree. I, uh, I did feel a little bit like it didn't have a lot of specificity towards the series itself. Just more words to live by. And uh, what we're living by is our prediction uh, for this particular match. I think all of us unanimous with a T1 prediction even prior to KT uh, losing to Hummel Life Esports. After that happened, um, we were even more okay with it. Yeah, I mean, I think most people were looking at this being a huge week for KT. You have to to try to win at least one of these series. The Hanwha Life one seemed easier. They lost that one. We're definitely feeling much better about our predictions now, I would say, uh, than we were at the beginning of the week. I mean, honestly, for me, I think I'm more scared that they actually lost the fact that they lost against the HLE. They're going to learn more. They're going to become stronger. Yeah, so, Huni, I'm, I'm kind of right there with you. Uh, and if we would ever say anything about a KT series, that is, the lower the expectations, the better the results. And on that note, it's time to head to the intro and get into our Saturday showdown.
데뷔 선수랑 굉장히 많이 만나는 것 같은데 만날 때마다 항상 재밌었고 좋은 자극제라고 해야 되나? 그런 게 됐었어가지고 하지만 이제 KT는 역사적으로 티원한테 좋은 모습을 못 보여줬기 때문에 저희가 이번에도 마찬가지로 승리하도록 하겠습니다 8년도 때는 그래도 KT가 되게 좋은 성적을 냈어가지고 8년도의 기억을 받아 이겨보도록 하겠습니다Another day of the LCK. We are here for Saturday Showdown. We got T1 up against KT Rolster. Not only Saturday Showdown, it's the Telecom Derby. It is a wonderful Saturday morning, it feels like, for us. Two hours earlier, hope you guys set your alarms. I'm Valdez with me as Chronicler today. How are you feeling about this matchup? I am insanely excited. And the cool thing about KT, and I think the desk also highlighted a little bit, the fact that they got 2-0 bought by Hanwha, it doesn't mean anything. It's a brand new day. Uh, it might mean something. We'll see after. probably means that they're going to be stronger now, is well, what it means. It might. <laughs> I, st I still, I, I've completely given up on trying to assert the strength of this team, but historically this matchup always delivers, and I don't think today will be any different. It should be a lot of fun. I would imagine that, uh, yeah, definitely T1s are the favorites coming into this one, but... You never know with KT Rolster, especially with this new roster. They have been surprising and they have been great so far outside of their last matchup. So now maybe they bounce back hard as T1. They're looking to hold on to that first place spot. Only one game win ahead of Gen G right now. T1 have their own control about whether or not they keep that first spot, which is really, really big as the first Saturday showdown of round two, return of the Telecom War. The expectation, as mentioned, is a T1, I, I'd say 2-0. I think these, uh, these games often go the distance, but they don't often go the way of KT, uh, barring when KT was at their strongest last split in summer and T1 was at their weakest. We haven't really seen them able to consistently get wins and I don't know if today will be any different, as this is so insanely cool to me. <laughs> How does it line up this perfectly? Scriptwriters outdid themselves today. Unreal. Yeah, because we will have the 100th game of Faker vs. Deft and the 100th game of Faker vs. BDD in the same game as BDD and Deft are on the same team playing against Faker. And who's going to win it for the 100th time? They might win the 100th no. game. I don't know about winning the series. <laughs> we'll see what uh, was yeah. going to end up happening as Karia is approaching his 300th LCK win, of course, coming up way back together with Deft on DRX. Uh, I think that's where he really gained a lot of fans like Valdis right beside me. <laughs> yeah, back in the day, that was a very fun DRX roster and uh, should surpass Gorilla eventually. Obviously a legendary player in his own right. Lahens still playing though, so Lahens still in the lead at first in terms of supports. Uh, let's take a look at the fan prediction as on the <laughs> That's... Korean side, it's very one-sided. On our side, also pretty one-sided. I don't think that's that one-sided, really, really, given that it's T1. Yeah, I guess I'm the fact usually, that it's not 90% plus. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You, you need to look at these stats in context. And in context, this is, this is you know, maybe 60-40. Mm. I'm an optimist, Veldas. The, the most one-sided on the Korean side was 85-15. So not too different from us. But exactly. let's introduce our teams. We do have T1 over here, of course, as these guys have stayed together after their 2023 victory and are looking to make a mark once again here in spring, and so far they have. And 
Legends looking to uh, win their first match of round two as well. They did cross over into round robin number two yesterday. And this is just the second match of round robin number two. T1, some, including me, were expecting a more of a cooldown period, given that this roster obviously not only won Worlds, but then also kept appearing in things like the Red Bull tournament, kept doing a whole lot of stuff in the offseason. And we've seen some happy games, mostly when it comes to draft. I think the execution has actually been pretty uh, crisp for a team that really likes to play with their food. On the other end, KT, a roster that has been positively surprising. The form of Barrow in particular, as well as Pioshek, have been two of the surprising standouts, I think, for this roster. Yeah, the bands came back together and they're making good music so far. It isn't top of the table uh, in terms of, you know, trying to challenge against the T1s and the Gen Gs of the LCK currently. But definitely, as you mentioned, it was a positive surprise because I think this was one of the teams, one of the rosters coming in that uh, it was the most volatile in terms of predictions of where they would be, right? Some people were saying, hey, I think they're going to be really good. Some people were saying, no, they're not going to be good at all. And I think it just comes from the expectations of the new players coming back into the roster. But let's take a look at our key player matchup here in the top lane. Zeus, pretty much first in everything. This guy is definitely the best top laner in the LCK right now. As Perfect is trying to hold his own as a rookie here, can he have a better look against Zeus this time around? And yes, Zeus did have a rough matchup against Nox, but that's against Dundun. Sometimes Dundun obviously. just obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Dundun. Uh, for all his faults, is a player that when he does get ahead, he just solo kills because he just all ins on every second wave, which is also why I'm pretty sure he's also leading in deaths uh, or isolated deaths, or at the very least, very high. Yeah, but he's second in solo kills, so that's what's important. Exactly. And Zeus and, is first. Uh, Zeus having an off day <laughs> in of itself, not going to be the end of the world. And it was also a really big match match before, but. As the desk already talked about as well, Perfect has been grinding a lot and actually passed the Keen test with Flying Colors. That in of itself should be a good sign that at the very least he isn't going to be a liability. And realistically, anything that isn't getting solo killed a bunch of times and becoming a sole loss condition for his team should be enough. We've seen that T1 have been friend a little bit when their comfort gets banned away. We've seen a lot of power picks initially being banned away against them, and recently we saw teams targeting the Aatrox, the Orianna. While T1 still was good, still won the series, we have seen that some of that lack of comfort could be a possible angle here for KT. And then the, the support matchup. Anything goes. Anything is possible. Anything. And we don't know. Besides Santa, probably not gonna be available because neither of these two supports, I'd say supports, should be allowed to play alongside the Senna because <laughs> it gives them too much Newman, power. Newman, do you mean? Yeah, exactly. The support players. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I do agree. We're not gonna be seeing Senna. I think if you leave Senna up, that's a big mistake. Even though there is a lot to uh, talk about. Goma is here on stage for T1 in round two, and he will be here for the rest of it. So, will be interesting to see if that will have a big effect on their drafting. As that's a very nice little pin there. The KT, tiny, it's very small, it's but I like very, it. very, I love it. Very stylish there from here, right? as we expect from him. Can't wait again to drop Does he have the, the best style of all the coaches? I think yeah, he I would does. Say, I would say so. Yeah. yeah, in terms of like classical, like. Yeah, no, it's the. Old style coach, you know? It's the yeah. old school suit style. Yeah, he pulls exactly. it off very well. Well, guys, we do have a draft here for game number one. Talia is the first man. Talia currently one and six on 14.3, but that's BDD on the other side. So everything changes. It is BDD. It is also one of those things where the sample size is not going to be too big. And to me, it's more telling that Talia is as highly prioritized as she is. Uh, as opposed to just looking at a win rate in isolation. The Viego, though, is really, really interesting because even though Piojic has had good performances on the pick, I don't feel like it's a standout in the current meta. And I'm wondering if they want to push Piojic towards the more tank-oriented junglers because he has looked the best on things like Viego, Lee, and Zinzo is not a jungler that kind of falls within the same category, but not picking up the Azir as a prior pick when Orianna's already taken off the table and the Talia is also not there. 
I I'm wondering if T1 is expecting KT not to ban Senna. And then it might be... You gotta ban Senna. It might be a Lucian B1 otherwise, because normally otherwise you would expect if they do ban Senna, you B1 the Azir. It's one of or Hui. the comfort picks. That's the other one because Faker wow. has been spamming this and he has looked incredible on it, but you're banning away Hui and you're giving them Senna, which I think is a huge opportunity given over to T1 here. KT though, they gotta know that this was coming. This is a no-brainer. We'll see what their response is going to be. And we have seen some lanes trying to match the scaling of Senna with Smolder comes to mind and some other hyper carries. I don't know if that really is the way to go. So we'll see what KT is gonna give over the barrel here alongside this Kalista. Alistair is the one that really comes to mind as the Nautilus does get picked up here. And this is a, this is a kind of a gambit here from Gate. KT, I, I gotta say, because right now T1 gets what we currently perceive as the strongest bot lane on the patch, as well as Zayus says, I will blind pick this into anything and not care at all. And Kalista Renata, really strong combination. Definitely, Renata is both exceptional into Nautilus specifically and is obviously really good with Kalista. But we need to see an aggressive jungler here, and I'm kind of worried that the jungle pool might get pinched even further by T1, because if you add a lead to this, like Renata, Lee, and Kalista, especially with the prior that Karma is going to generate, you are really not going to have any say in the early game. So KT going all in on trying to push T1 out of the game right from the get go. Yeah, I'm just I'm not sure about giving Senna not over to T1. I mean, this is at oh, least, I don't like it. At least Caria doesn't get to cook up anything too delicious. But I mean, maybe Nautilus is just maybe the most delicious support on the patch, actually. So yeah, it's. It's interesting for sure. It is a gambit, as you did call it. And Cassante's taken away. They're going to take away some of those top picks. TF also to be banned away here. So they don't want to give that one over to Faker. No pinching of the jungle pool. Instead, we're seeing being some of Perfect's picks being banned away. I wonder if they're going to ban Udyr as well. It's another pick that he has gone towards that can feel good into the Aatrox. Not amazing, but Udyr really is one of those picks that you can feel relatively fine into absolutely everything. It's going to be the lead, so still some pressure here towards Pioshik. Wonder if he's going to go to Zin Zhao next. Expectation is that they pick up a top laner here for Perfect, something that deals well with the Aatrox. I don't really know if there's anything that you want to go towards that is too aggressive. This makes sense with what they've been playing thus far, and it keeps Pioshik his pick still hidden. Yeah. Top two picks for perfect, Cassante and Udir, yeah. and Udir is five and one. So definitely very comfortable on this pick. I think it's a good choice uh, for this current situation. Can handle the Aatrox, you just kind of run away from him. And proxy waves, potentially. Corky, that's not a champion on this patch, but apparently it is. What are we thinking about this one, Chronicler? This is very strange. Yeah, I wonder how that is going to play out in practice. With the changes to Corky, our expectation was that he would kind of fall off. He also is in a lane that is going to be supremely punishing for with BDD having run of the map. And it feels like T1 is saying, KT, you, you are not going to be good enough to win this game against us. We're going to find a big team fight. We're going to get to the point where our champions scale making it impossible for you to take us down reliably as we do see the Poppy come in. I not mention Poppy yet, but it makes a lot of sense, particularly into the Kalista. It's always going to feel good. This would be something. Obviously, it's a big comfort pick for Pioshek, and I think their composition is somewhat light on AD, with really only Kalista providing a lot. But playing Kindred into Poppy can can immensely backfire. I think this is a lot safer, even though obviously trying to engage with the Zinzao is still going to be hard. And the engage of KT is really lackluster. The amount of prio and early skirmishing power that this composition have is absolutely bonkers. Yeah, it definitely is. But I feel like if T1 can kind of keep them at arm's length for a while, get their Nautilus tanky, get Faker fed. Oh, it's done. Um, you yeah, they can't fall behind. You F. don't have engage, and then you're losing the pork. Uh, <laughs> Pork War, the Poke War um, <laughs> versus the Gorky, and then you're just kind of feeling sad. So it's just going to be pretty interesting to see how this early in the big game plays out. I think it is going to have a larger than normal effect on this game compared to others. Really has to. No early mistakes. No, even no mid game mistakes that uh, is given here by the composition of KT. 
you do have an incredible amount of power. Again, you have prior lane bot, prior lane in mid, and a neutralizer lane in top. So perfect if he has been able to maintain the form we've seen. You have up until this point should just be self-sufficient, allowing P.O. Shik to play around his insanely strong mid and bot lane, stack up early cr uh, grubs, stack up early dragons, and then hopefully that's enough to carry to a win. But with how consistent T1 has been in specifically finding team fights from a deficit, I think this is going to be tough on 4KT. Yeah, still want to wait and see how aggressive they're going to get here in the early to mid game and how well they can force these fights with their Xin with their Kalista. Either way, guys, we are ready to hop onto the rift for game number one. All right, here we go. Game number one, the Telecom War Saturday Showdown. And just a wonderful Saturday afternoon. So, reason why we're not uh, too thrilled about the Corky pick is because he did have a big um, interaction taken away where the Malignants um, and the Eclipse don't quite work together where the Malignants procs the second uh, attack for the Eclipse, so you do Omega Boom Boom damage with one rocket. Um, can still poke. They changed up his timing on the package as well. And I'm just curious to see how it's going to play out. I feel like there were other choices, but Faker definitely liking these long range poke mid lane champions at the moment. There always remains possibility as well for him to hit big equalizers with, or, uh, well, it's packages, but you yeah. know, it's basically an equalizer. Especially with the extra damage that First Strike does provide you. We'll see to what extent they actually get to get to that point. Because I do think that, like always, getting to that point on the Corky is going to be the toughest thing. As Death and Barrel playing aggressive early, as they should. But not the best of trades for them. I'll end up uh, throwing down an Ignite. But do expect them to be fine. And they still have control over the waiver. So should be able to, at the very least, keep the pressure on this bot lane. Yeah. I mean, Karia takes the teleport on the Nautilus. So he doesn't have a combat summoner. And that's normal. Because you just want to get back to the lane. You want to be farming. And Senna might be roaming around. So you want to keep control over this lane. So you take that teleport. But it does mean that you will lose these early trades. Especially into the double range. Compared to just the Nautilus. Who can just stand there and take a beating. But they're fine. They're going to be able to heal up with the Senna and just farm it out. The meta raid is so interesting for me from KT as we do see Faker has played a lot of Corky and has won a whole lot. And this used to be a... 19 game winning streak, yeah. casually, and on this pick. I, I, I'd say a lot of this is due to Corky's power as a counter pick, but for T1 it doesn't really apply because we have actually seen them B1 and when it is strong. I think on the last patch we saw some of that as well. But specifically the meta read from KT to be like, so we 2-0 Genji with Senna not, and we're still going to give it over and still yeah. going to try and deal with it. It is definitely confident, which I do think is befitting of this bot lane, but we have to see whether it actually pays off or whether they do get punished in a way that they, they punish Genji in exactly the same fashion. Yeah. Well, that was Lucian, which... Definitely is weaker than yeah. Callista Renata, in our opinion. Absolutely. Callista Renata, also a very top tier combo in their own right. And we just don't get to see it very often because Callista gets banned so often. So, yep. <laughs> also, high presence on that pick. As Pesek is down here, but a very nice ward in the river is going to spot him right on the timing, right before the ward goes down. It's actually going to ex expire in front of him, and they all ping it so they know that he was spotted. And he's just going to back and won't do much of anything as owner's just gonna return to full clearing. Owner did not pick up a crab, so opportunity for Pio Shakir to double crab. Might head towards that, do see some things going down, so maybe he wants to go towards his Raptor camp first, but we'll see. Perfect got his first proxy off, now making his way back to the lane. And that top lane is one that uh, I'm really gonna be looking at with a high level of interest, because the last time these two players faced, it wasn't pretty. Perfect really was getting pummeled. This was uh, relatively early on as well in round robin one. I forgot which uh, which specific matchup it was, but 
Well, there was a uh, Cassante versus Rumble um, that oh, happened a lot, yeah. and the Rumble Zeus was uh, having a very fun time. Yeah, that doesn't often involve fun for the opponent when Rumble is having a good time, yeah. as we have been <laughs> often told by Huni Pioshik and owner might fight over this crab. Yeah. We do see Faker though still on the back, and maybe Pioshik doesn't even care. Does have Karmaier though, so owner. Needs to be mindful, but not going to make the rotation. Yeah, I think Owner's just going to take the crab. I mean, he might show up here, and uh, he just smited the crab, so he's got to wait for that second smite. But yeah, he's just going to let it go. And Piercic will be able to get all three of these early grubs. I like the call, actually, because Piercic already got a crab. There's no need for him to go to him. This allows BDD to maintain pressure on his lane while simultaneously ensuring that they do start this objective stacking early on, which with their composition is basically a necessity, as BDD actually running the uh, minion dematerializer there, if I'm not mistaken, trying to maintain as much lane pressure as possible. He is a big laning guy. Yeah, he definitely is. Uh, a famous scorcher of days past. He's almost definitely got it here in this game, even though the AP ratios on a Karma that's going to scale up would be really nice with Gathering Storm. Almost no. guarantee he's got Scorch. And that's fine. I mean, you, you mentioned it before. Definitely want to keep that pressure up on the Corky as Perfect's having a fun time in this top lane. This is why I really like the Udyr pick. I think he's just going to be able to essentially neutralize the lane. And that yeah. allows Zeus to kill him. Now, KT are getting all of the objectives early on. We're going to get this Drake here as well as the first three bubs. So they're feeling pretty good about their map state. So far, so good. Like the Dark Seal pickup as well. My opinion, a really underrated item on Udyr. He actually does benefit from these AP ratios, as a picture owner was able to get that with the smite. Yeah, he definitely Five. did. And now Faker's coming over here, but there is BDD right in their face. So not going to overcommit to this because owner is uh, rather piercing is so low. Owner, though, is going to overcommit to it and flash on top of a guy who just runs away from him. And does flash as well, so just gonna lose his flash. Now owner does have hex flash, so can utilize that and make Atlas happy at least. Two flashes traded for one, but it really is a one and a half given that hex flash is available for owner. Barrel had to invest his as well, so owner not gonna be feeling too bad about that trade. And the big thing here is that even with KT picking up these early objective leads, that's kind of a, a given, given what KT have drafted. And we see T1 as well. They did, they're happy to take some skirmishes left and right. We saw Owner take some risk when he took that crab. We see a little bit of a small skirmish here. But T1 ideally doesn't really want to commit to any of this until they can get to actual fights, to the front to back team fights where this composition is going to shine. And they don't even necessarily need Corky to be online because I do think that with the CC that you have available uh, for Owner, Zeus and Carry If you can get those three together, you can blow up a lot of the targets on KT before they really get to make anything happen. And that's where Barrel's specific use of the bailout is going to be really big. Because if T1 shake a skirmish, thinking that they can blow someone up, and then Barrel hits a big bailout, that can be game deciding. I think that's why T1 is just saying, well, I'm going to take the risk. And they're a little bit behind, you know, five, six hundred gold here yeah. at eight minutes, some bubs, a dragon. There's no real reason for worry yet. I do like to see KT be punchy as we get to these yeah. second objectives in particular. I mean, they definitely have to be, right? T1 sitting back here, Faker's picked up a Hex Drinker. He's in it for the long haul. He's like, okay, oh, yeah. I'm not going to be very relevant until two, three items ideally, and I'm going to delay my build with the Hex Drinker just to survive against the Karma and be able to farm up comfortably. So you're, you're not going to have a lot of threat for the mid lane from a long time in this game. T1 will just have to wait that one out and hunker down hibernate for the winter, whereas KT wants to do the exact opposite. Barrel walking up menacingly. You know, he broke the record for latest First Blood yesterday. I did. I was watching. Of the season. The entirety of it. Not ever. It was definitely an experience of a day. <laughs> yeah. The that was um, in particular was, uh, was uh, I think, a highlight of LCK entertainment. We, we were having a great time. Um, 
Bulldog killed Karis at 16 minutes and 24 seconds yesterday. That was the latest first blood of spring 2024. Uh, so far. So far. So far. And uh, the latest first blood ever. 38 minutes <laughs> and 59 seconds. Still can't believe that. 38 minutes. Yep. That was uh, that was a fun year. That was. Um, let me just take another look here. We're doing a history lesson. Yeah. Nothing is 2018 happening. 2018 spring. So it was right after 2017, which was famously um, pretty boring. Just straight up uh, as a meta. Uh, just a lot of farming, a lot of sitting back, and uh, playing for late game in 2017. I think it kind of like went over into 2018. It carried as over. Well. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. Jin Air, Green Wings versus King Zone at the time. Yeah, the involvement of Jin Air in that scenario does not surprise me one bit. Yeah, no, that, that just makes sense. But uh, in this case, we're trying to break uh, records here because Fate's Call is going to be utilized to deny us any action down in the bottom side. Malignance was just picked up by BDD, so he'll be able to put on pressure. Perfect's putting on pressure in the top side, and Beryl isn't dying in the bottom lane. He can't, because he has the freedom to go wherever he pleases, thanks to his buddy Deft. Next objective, this is where T1 could opt into contesting. We'll see, depending on where Faker goes, just finished his back. They do have a lot of MR on both Faker and Zeus if he does decide to join, although given that he's proxying currently, not going to look too likely. It will be uh, a 4v4 package is available here, but Malignant's power spike is so big, BDD might be able to do some heavy lifting here, and early on, if Deft gets the movement, uh, the freedom rather, to move and join in this fight without getting locked down, do a lot of DPS, that could be game deciding. T1, they're going to take the risk. I mean, they are going to go for it. They open up on a Sin Tao who is going to press his ultimate ability. As now, helicopter coming out. BDD is flung into the air as the package does isolate one member. As Death will flash over the wall, though, he gets away. And now trying to save Faker's life. We do have an ult on top of Yoshik, who doesn't have his anymore. And we're at a standstill once again. And I think this will favor KT with all the low health bars here on the side of T1 and a lack of package. So KT Rollster, no kills, but they do win the fight, I guess? Maybe the sustain from Senna is bigger and carry has TP because mm. he is the farming Nautilus. Yeah, that's definitely going to be big. And you really don't want to give this one up. BD flanked with a TP there on the Karma, but gets knocked away immediately. And as a result, T1, again, colossal win here. Picking up an early dragon is going to mean that the possible win condition for KT is going to be so much further along. And it's Ocean Soul. We we had so many of these yesterday. A lot of teams didn't want to fight over them. But let's take another look at this fight here. Because BDD didn't get to interact very much. If they have BDD, there might be an angle there. But instead, Death doesn't get to do any damage. Has to flash over the wall immediately. Thanks to the ultimate from Barrel, he does stay alive, which is a small win. But BDD, by the time he joins, T1 have already peeled back. He doesn't, they don't get to use their biggest power spike that they have in that fight, which is the Karma with a Malignance. And yeah. can't help but wonder if BDD was either flashed the ultimate from owner or just teleported maybe closer. I don't quite know what the word is. I don't think there was a better ward, but maybe he could have teleported to the wave and coming from the bottom because they needed his damage to win that skirmish. Wasn't the case. Big win from owner. T1, no first blood, but a big win nonetheless. BDD also not level 11, so not really able to get in there and spam his mantra cues just yet. And so eventually he was kind of the only person that was still healthy and willing to poke, but he can't do it 1v4, especially with Karia TPing back in. So a big win for T1, we will say. Although at this point, big wins are coming in small packages, let's say, because... You know, not not a, a massive comeback for T1 or anything just yet, as Beryl is going to miss the handshake here. Zay is flying very fast with his World Ender and will actually flash away just to make sure he doesn't go down to death. Don't want to die here. Give over a kill to the Callisto. Hasn't been able to build that big of a lead. Some Blades, as well as a small CS lead over her farming counterpart is Poppy. Oh, 
We're not going to hit Piochik, though. It will come down to a smite fight. Who's going to get it? It will go the way of, well, Callista. She's got her own smite in the way as the knockup does come in. And look at that combo as immediately Depth is going to go down. The BDD is in a lot of trouble here as well. The Renata ult was pretty good, but I think now that Faker shows up, they are just down a member and down any sort of damage. The bailout comes in on a Piochik, but way too late to do anything to change the fight. And T1 will pick up the fight. That's the benefit of forcing those early summoners at that Drake fight. Deft needs to be in close range. It's so hard to play that out. Even with Zayas flashing, t one's still able to win the fight. The Herald goes over to KT, but I don't think they're going to be very happy about it. As we take another look here, this is one of the issues that you run into, as I think Kalista specifically, into the amount of CC that's available on the enemy team. Karia hits an ultimate, and even with Pioshik trying to feel like the moment that you get hit, you get targeted, you just end up going down, especially without the flash. Perfect little late on the TP. And then Pioshik uh, tries to go for a target, but you might not gonna go down in that quick a time, and it would have at best been a one-for-one -one trade. Really big win there for T1. Now sitting on a one and a half K gold lead. And we will see probably a turret, maybe mid lane turret, if they get some free time be picked up. Although I'm, I'm looking, they didn't even get to pick up the Eye of the Herald. Or they used it in the replay. But I'm given how that fight played out, I, I'm gonna, gonna assume that they didn't pick it up. And yeah. that is not a great look, KT. Still have it in them. I don't think that this, is ma this match is done just yet, but. It is definitely an uphill battle from here on out, and even stacking an Ocean Drake. If it was Inferno, I'd be like, ooh. Yeah. Hey, there, there, there are opportunities, but it's looking quite rough in our first turn, but also going over to T1. Yeah, they were able to just group up into the top side and get that one, and owner has been, well, he's going to be denied on this ultimate, actually, just pushed away. He's been good about just making sure he lands those. I feel like the target selection hasn't been 100%, but that's fine. I mean, he knocks somebody away and gets value out of it. It's obviously good in the first fight against BDD. But, yeah, I, it does feel like T1 are in total control. And the, the difference between the Kalista, who just gets blown up 100 to 0, and the Senna, who's just in the back line providing so much sustain and damage, is, is pretty incredible, which Brings us back to the draft, right? I mean, you're you're playing this Callista into Nautilus alone, not to mention all the other pieces of the draft, and giving over the Senna Nought. Still pretty confusing to me, and still waiting to see the uh, the power of the duo of Callista Renata versus what they gave. Makes one wonder whether that TF ban should have been a Poppy ban. Owner is definitely someone who loves to play the Poppy, has had a really big success on this pick. And it's so good into two, I think, of the biggest damage dealers on KT, namely the Zinzao and the Kalista. And then look at the atomization as well on the other end. There's double Hex Drinker available. There's a lot of early MR, meaning that Pyoshik and Deft are at a lot of risk. As I have a new deer here. That's pretty I don't old out that. of the side of T1, although with the Senna ult okay. on top and no flash or ghost for perfect, it does work out and the package just kept him in place. Generally pretty hard against the Udyr. I feel like if maybe he just ran at them instead of back over the package in a way, uh, maybe he would have been in a better spot. But I do digress as Deft is in a lot of trouble here. He was just existing in the mid lane, but that wasn't allowed, said T1. He just tried to get a turret, man. He just wants a cross map. Wasn't allowed. Prime. You already get the kill on perfect. Give Not him allowed. something. No. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's, it's uh, not looking good, Valdez. Doom is running through the enemy jungle at 18 minutes into the game. Like nobody's there, nobody can touch him, and he's just doing the red buff as they take the tier one for free. I don't think that the plan of KT worked. The gambit did not pay off. No, it was... So, do you think if he, like, runs the other way, like not like over the package. Down. Yeah, because he runs over the package and that's what kills him. Yeah, right? probably. Obviously, he'd be taking more I'd damage from Zeus and Faker, but... Yeah, maybe he's afraid that if he gets hit by another Q and, and Faker turns, or like as long as Zeus is tanking, faking a turn around, might not have been enough damage. Not sure. Yeah, either way, a nice little gank onto Perfect. Dude. 
is generally unkillable on the Udir. And that gets Zeus in a really nice spot. I mean, Quirky already two kills. Senna farming for free, 103. And then you've got the top lane, which, yeah, it was serviceable for perfect, but Zeus is also 30 CS ahead, and it's an Aatrox who is farming, you know, excellently in this game. Uh, the most CS in the game. So definitely kind of everything has gone right for T1. Yeah, Zeus was, I think, maybe a wave or two behind at some point. Then, as he always does in mid-game, started to take over, sitting on an unreasonable amount of CS as well. I just want to highlight that we're 20 minutes in, yeah, and he's sitting at almost 220 CS. And it was still somewhat okay up until the point where he got that kill. And now it's starting to feel like it will not be okay. And Zayas will just TP behind them at some point and blow up the enemy back line. And one more fight is what KT have. If, if you lose either Baron or you lose the next fight, it's already done. And even that one fight, yeah, I can see your yeah. face. It's I'm looking of, at you, I'm like, I think they had that fight it's already. It's a stretch. <laughs> I, you, you'd have to rely on T1 making a mistake. Yeah. But it is possible. We have seen Kalista pop, uh, Kalista's pop off. If T1 overinvests their resources into like perfect, trying to get a catch, and there's an angle, but no, it's not. It's not looking too hot for KT in this game number one. And they took a risk. Doesn't look like it paid off initially. And I assume that they will try something very differently as we go into game number two. Might have been as well that T1 obviously chose blue side. Maybe they feel like this is the way to try and win on red. Imagine they will move over to blue if they do end up losing here. Which right now their jungle is getting taken. The scaling composition has a 3k gold lead, <laughs> and things are not great. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty dire straits for KT here. Just waiting to see when they're going to pull the trigger on the next fight, because the Ocean Soul comes in and you're like, well, I mean, there's not even like great dragons that we can take to try to get some really nice mid game power to to do something in this game. Maybe you can try to go for like a Baron if T1 are out of position, but I, I think that requires a pick at this point, even with the Callista. It's a little messed up as well, because I think Ocean Soul is actually quite good for T1, because they have Senna at extra sustain on top of that, and they have a Lethality Aatrox, who yeah. already heals a ton. So, it's not fair, Valdes. Should have been Infernal. That would have been nice, too. I would have liked Cloud. Like for, Boss Udir. For both of the teams. Guma just stacking up. He's already at 88 stacks as well. So doing a pretty good job of farming those up. You know, last couple of days we've seen a lot of Smolder play. We've seen a lot of just sitting back, trying to stack up, trying to hit 225 and essentially be a late game menace. Uh, no Smolder in this game, obviously, just because there were so many other top-tier bottom lane picks available in the Senna and the Kalista. But, yeah, this game definitely feels like that style of play as well on the side of T1 where it's like, okay, we're just going to sit back and farm out and you guys got to do something, and then KT just never got to do anything. Hail Mary Baron? Ah! Uh, That's what I was saying. I come mean, on! Maybe, yeah, maybe there we go! T1 out of position, no vision. They, they don't they know. They scry her right now. They do know. They know. I don't think they have enough time, Bell does. Yeah. They might still send it. I mean, they have a lot of Callista sticks in this Baron, but no, nah, they're just going to back off here. They get the TP out of Zeus, and T1Se, thank you for the leash. We're just going to continue this objective as Owner holds on to the helicopter. He's not going to use it just yet. Perfect, trying to get that flank as Baker goes over the top. And it's just going to flash away from everybody as, meanwhile, Piotrzyk's just isolated on the backside of this fight. They do get Baker, but the damage is already done here as Karia gets a massive three-man knockup with his ultimate. And that just might be the nail in the coffin. KT are being wiped up here with a triple kill from Zeus. As Perfect might be the only one to get away, but a big team fight win going the way at T1. And that Baron call was all KT have left. They knew it was a Hill Mary. And T1, they have a fair share of experience with setting up Barons when the opponent might not expect it. The funniest part about this is that they are just like, no, it's, the, it's our Baron now. This, <laughs> this is no longer yours. The ultimate from owner uh, sets up a really nice level of zoning. And then Faker 
with a colossally successful, because it splits the fight up completely. He flashes away, so he's completely fine. Yeah, he ends up dying, but it doesn't really matter because on the other end, the fight is being won. And this is where the level of tankiness comes through for T1. They've gone to the point in the game where unless KT is behind, they just don't chew for any of these players. Yeah. The Callista trying to deal damage to Nautilus at this point is just hilarious. Yep. Not for Deft and for KT, obviously, but just objectively, it's like, you don't touch this guy. No, you <laughs> don't. so tanky. Even with for Hollow Radiance next, I mean, it's just the Frozen Heart and some health. That's just what happens, and, and you're never going to get in range without being ulted by Nautilus. So not only are you not dealing damage, you're CC'd half the time. It's just it's just sad feels playing the Callista into not only this, this champion, but into this comp. I mean, not to mention the Poppy that you talked about before. And now T1 with their Baron just barreling down the bottom lane. Guma's done the most damage in the game, surprisingly. Thought it would be Faker at this point with the packages, but he is up there as well. Guma just doing his job, surviving in the back of the fight, and just poking people down and keeping people alive. Senna is incredibly strong on this patch. It's one of the hidden upsides of playing into a lane like Callista Renata as well, is that you do actually trade a ton. So you get way more souls, which allows you to accelerate to the point where... He's at 108. Yeah, already. 26 minutes in. So you, you accelerate early, and obviously you outscale the Callista to such an insane degree. And the benefit of Guma already being this far ahead, we're seeing in these fights as well, making this front line even tankier. And this, this one is... Barring a complete collapse of T1, this one is pretty... Uh, it's pretty over, Valdez. We'll see if they can kill Zeus. There are no TPs. I think they can. 5v1. <laughs> can they? I think Zeus is in a lot of trouble here, right? Um, that's an insane amount of damage going into Deft as he hey! got that Q3 down, but it's a thousand gold into the hands of Deft. They did it. They did kill Zeus 1v5. It didn't work out. That's, that's a big win. That's gold into the pockets of KT. It's pretty nice. And now perfect. He's being focused down, but he's a tank. I mean, that's not where you want your damage to go in. There's no barrel. You see, Carrie is incredibly tanky himself as an ult is going to sail wide from owner. And yeah, barrel not being here. It looks like he took some extra time to farm in the bottom lane. I don't know what he was doing down there. Uh, just trying to make sure that the turret went down. But either way, this inhibitor will stay up. And C1 will not risk the 4v5. That's a gold positive trade for KT. Yeah! 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 They did it. They did do it. They did kill Zeus. No help for him. If he gets one more Q off, uh, Def is definitely dead. And then he trades one for one, he would be very happy. Although with Barrel there, he could have bailed out and it would have been fine nonetheless, I guess. Yeah. I wonder what happened to Barrel. That he wasn't there, like maybe I don't know if he backed like on a ward and the minions got him or something. Or he wanted to make sure the turret went down, but then yeah, even it, it was like even more delayed after that. I don't know. It was a little, a little weird. It was a little rough. Just a little barrel moment. It happens. It is barrel. It is barrel. He also went. We didn't talk about this at all yet. It hasn't really come up too much. But actually went for aftershock here as opposed to guardian, which is what we see most often and a more very tanky build, Slay, as well as the Locket here. Pioshik on a flank angle. It's just so hard when you get to this point in the game because Faker is going to poke you. Guma has his summoners available, TP coming in. <laughs> Harry is like, yeah, I don't really care about the uh, <laughs> Karma in this case. Alt is going to be utilized on the perfect, and Zeus oh. is so huge, and he will take him out. Gets that slow below the 50% mark, and yeah, this inhibitor will go down. Doesn't look like Faker's got a package at this point in time, so they're not going to overstay their welcome. And we do have Baron here in a minute 30, so it looks like they will just play for that. Might just pick up a cheeky Ocean Soul on the way, because why not? The experiments to keep Senna down are, are again not looking successful. Yeah. We've tried smolder, we've tried outscaling lanes, we've tried aggressive lanes. 
Just doesn't seem to work out as perfect, unfortunately. Carrier Salopo doesn't get cancelled. This is a full tank mood here. Until the Felidy... No. No, no, he doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't. Yeah, nah. Yeah, no. He does have Surreal Dust, to be completely fair. So Zayas, gonna be feeling good about that. And all I'm wondering, Veldas, is uh, when is T1 gonna decide to walk down mid and end this game? Because they can. But they're not taking any risks. Cheeky Soul, Cheeky Baron. And as we all know, all this is setting up for is for this series to be even better in game number two. Because game number one didn't really give us what we want just yet as the teleport comes in, they're contesting. Yeah, and this is over Ocean Soul, so let's see how this does work out for them. As Perfect's doing a good job of trying to get in there, but uh, now oh, he's no. getting out of there. Oh, God. <laughs> as the massive no! package comes in, and Depth is just dead immediately. The poor guy has no chance in this game. As Bozik is going to go down as well. That's three of them out of this one. We got TPs all over the map. As Zeus will be looking for the kills while Faker is looking for the kill on the Nexus. TP coming down here from Perfect into the base. And he will try to defend as owners just running through the turrets. And yeah, this one is a done deal. Has been for a while, guys. As Faker nearly goes down, but he's just fine in the end. C1 are playing with their food. Just a bit here, Guma trying to get those max stacks. He's going to end the game at 133 in this one on the Senna, which was given over to him. As I say that, he's getting more and more, 136, as the Nexus will go down, and T1 will take game number one. Early plan from KT was very obvious. Draft these aggressive lanes, stack early objectives, and try and never give T1 the opportunity to play the game. They lost second dragon. That was kind of the end of it. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it wasn't, if this wasn't T1, right? And this is something that I think is important to note. It, there are opportunities for the composition of KT to find comeback fights, to find these really big mid game skirmishes. They just never really were given the opportunity to. And then the moment that the topside fight happened where they ended up losing the Baron, that was what cemented hey. it. Carrier, 300 wins, third support to ever do it in the LCK. And he's just going to try to catch up to Lahens eventually. Crazy to think about that even with how short, relatively compared to the length of the LCK, Lahens and Carrier have been in the league, that they've been able to pick up that many wins. Also, Honestly, no idea who gets POG in this one. Zayas obviously had a very quiet early game, but then popped off as he always does. I think Owner, his early control of the fights and his ultimates were really, really exceptional. Faker had a, two really big equalizers. Guma is kind of self-explanatory. Karia was Nautilus. He did, he did do a lot of hooking and ulting people. Yeah, that was good. Um, <laughs> guys, we're done with game number one. I hope that game number two offers just a bit more than what we saw in that first one. But guys, we'll take a break and have the space after. We'll be right back.
돌아. 이거 그냥 바로 그래. 걸 생각하자. 아, 어. 아래가 크게 돌아올 거다. 아. 이거 우디를 날릴게. 3분자, 3분자, 3분자. 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 잘 걸어, 빨리, 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 빨리. 사이 터졌어, 사이 터졌어. 나 몰라, 그랬어. 많이 좋고. 타타, 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 타타. 오케이, 타버려, 오케이. 타버려, 오케이. 어. 잘 할게요. makes a yordle. I'm glad that you asked. Explaining the answer is no easy task. Sure, yordles agree in both size and in name, but that doesn't mean we're exactly the same. In gadgets and yordles are all about tech, like Rumble, inventor of flame-spitting mechs. There's bots, electricians, a chemist or two. Explosions set off by suspicious shampoo. The yordles of Greensprout grow lush, wholesome crops. They farm and they garden, they fish and climb rocks. You think you're outdoorsy? You might lose that bet to Timo, the Grove's greatest vandal scout yet. For fresh inspiration, escape to the aisle of artists, musicians, and chefs by the mile. With Lulu to grant you that whimsical spark, you might find yourself at a huge water park. In Yarnville, where yordles make scarves and warm hats, it's there you'll find knitters and Yumi the cat. This stuff is like magic wherever you walk. Yarn houses, yarn bridges, a yarn jogging sock. From surfing to fashion, from acting to math, we've all different passions, our own unique path. Some call us obsessive, some say it's a phase. That one little thing sends us into a craze. When yordles can't tinker or teach or make art, it ain't long before our whole world falls apart. However we fix it, we must fix it soon. By might or by magic, we're just but one thing's for sure, that for worse or for better, what makes us all yordles, we're yordles together.
Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to The Space. I'm Atlas, once again joined by Hooney and Wolf to bring you the breakdown of game number one, a game that we hyped up to be contentious, to be one of these games that could uh, make history. It wasn't. It was pretty straightforward, to be perfectly honest, and I think there are a few glaring things that we might get into in the draft. Wolf, do you want to take it away? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I feel like I've done this rant a lot, but I mean, before I go into it, I will say scholastically, like from a, you know, early game versus late game type of conversation, KT do have, in theory, the tools to grab objectives because they got prio bot, they got prio mid, and they should have prio top. Perfect didn't mess it up, actually had a pretty good laning phase. So you're winning all three lanes, you get six grubs, you get two dragons, and if you can win that third dragon fight, you should be able to win the game. You should be able to snowball the game, right? And I think... That is what a lot of teams have been thinking. Like, we can beat this center. We can actually overcome it. We can get a big enough lead. But as I've been saying, they're like, no, you can't. You can't actually do it. And if it's a good team with a good center player and a team that has good coordination, like a team that won a world championship and stayed together with the same five players from that roster, um, I don't think this, maybe banning the center is actually the best way to beat the center. In theory. You know, in theory, you can definitely beat the center, but that's in theory. You have to play like really optimi optimistic, like every single moment. Like Dave actually messed up one time in the lifter fight, and the game is like, wow, well done, T1. You guys are so 13 good. Thirteen winnings, thirteen wins in a row. This is in a row across multiple patches. It is at seventy-three point six percent pick ban, so its involvement is very high. Still has eleven losses, but since a few weeks ago, teams have really figured out how to play around this pick, how to protect it, how to slowly inch towards objectives. And we've seen Azir being used defensively to protect the Senna. Corky, in this case, really helping out in those team fights. Just don't let T1 have Senna. Don't do that. You can't. You can't overcome it. I would even go as far as to say, don't let anyone have Senna. I mean, two of the victories that have been in a row of the Senna Nautilus have been Deft and Beryl as well, and that was in their match against Gen G. That was how they managed to take them down. The power of this bottom lane is extraordinarily, extraordinarily high. And Wolf. You mentioned uh, when you explained how you're supposed to take this apart, because I agree. I think that the draft was actually fine from KT in theory, but in theory doesn't often equal in practice. And you mentioned two Drakes is what they need. Well, let's have a look at the second Dragon. Well, actually, let's start with the Herald fight first, where things started to go horribly wrong. Yeah, I mean, it started with the po the owner's puppy ulti and it hit the barrels out. It's just like the KT here, I think they were just like way too greedy. Like, sure, they got the Herald, they just have to be wait for three seconds until the barrel arrived. But they overstep as soon as the carrier just uh, with casting the R into the death and also coming from different angle from the Zeus, it just jump over the wall. It's just like, it's so good for T1, but also in KT side, like the TP was late. There are so many factors that they can't just go. Like, it's just not possible because like, TP have a channel there, the barrels is not out of the fight, nothing actually cast any ability yet. I think if the, in the beginning of that fight, before the uh, Keeper's Verdict goes off, if Barrel ults and they just secure Herald and leave, that's an option. But because of the way he came in, the Fates call for Def to actually try to bring Barrel in faster and turn with a re-engage, he's not able to bail Def out, so Def can't be bailed out. The Fates call doesn't allow Barrel to ult properly either, he's just not in range, so it ends up backfiring in a big way, and I think KT really just not thinking about their win cons. I mean, we see so many teams who have this early game comp go, well, what if we just force this fight right now and 100% we win the game if we crush them? But like, you could just walk away and, and then try to do it on the next objective. You didn't have the right win conditions there in that fight to actually win the, the fight itself. And then ultimately, we had uh, a corky situation, Faker having a fantastic game. Let's have a look at uh, this attempted Baron Steel. Uh, the KT went for. This was a Hail Mary, and this kind of felt like the game was already done at this point, but this was where really, really, really was done. Yeah, I mean, before I watch this highlight, you guys have to know that T1 is like really, really good shape. Like, they, they, are, they are having lead with this top of the composition. It's like, I thought I was like actually just like in my mind, like individually was thinking like, oh, this Faker just throwing his body for, just throwing the package on the three people was good. Like, I was having question mark, but how much they have a lead on the T1, the four people that the left left over the members, like how strong they are. They're, it's really easy for them to be able to clean up and into the Baron. So like, I think it's like the Faker actually deciding there, just going in and just like die, dying to make the actually team fight just the 100 to zero. I think it was really smart. Uh, KT also chasing Faker there as well. And that means Piochik's left out to dry. It becomes basically a 4v4 fight, but KT are all at half health. Really messy fight there, but I like, 
Atlas just mentioned. It was a desperation call. Certainly was. And now it is time for the POG. I'm actually uh, intrigued as to who's going to pick this one up. Let's bring it onto your screen. It will be the GOAT of the mid lane. 700 POG points and the corky win streak continues for this man. Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm personally, I vote for a faker. I mean, he run one time on the bottom, like this type of the one kill, the pick on one kill, it actually just generate the lead, generate the gold, it makes the first pack so much faster. Every single time he hit the, basically the package, like more than three people, every single time when it's like there's a skirmishes or that the big team fight, especially at the Baron, that's gonna, that's gonna be the, just the game, right? And also just playing this quirky, like really solid into Karma lane. I think it's really well deserved. Yeah, he moves up to first place. I, I thought, like you mentioned there at the end, also his laning phase was really nice. It's really tough to play quirky into that Karma in the early game, especially with DMAT that uh, BDD did take, but he handled it well. I voted for owner. I thought his keeper's verdicts were, were game changing. I think I probably won't be alone. Yeah, Chronicle and I, we're linked up, like to see it. Yeah, and I, I think that, like, you know, Faker obviously having a fantastic game, but I don't mind a spattering of votes when it does feel like a team effort. It did feel like T1, yeah, they just weathered the storm of the early game, came together, and then just won in these team fights. Coma, very vocal, as you can see in the coach's booth, as the lighting also very dramatic. Actually, quite like it, you know, like very, very top down, lots of shadows. And uh, speaking of shadows, certainly some shadows in the faces of the KT players as they have now chosen blue. It's now their opportunity to maybe get a center. I don't think T1's going to leave it up. Uh, I if, I, if I had to guess, I, I doubt it. I mean, I believe, I mean, I trust the coma, right? So I doubt it. I mean, also, like, it's just not, if they want to play the KT, like these type of the comp, like, you have to crash way harder in all the game. Yeah, I, I I just think that like don't take the risk. You got three bands for a reason. Use them on center. That's that's how you that's how you have an honest game of League of Legends if you're a red side team. But it is now time to throw it back to the casters to get into game two. Thank you, spacemen, for that wonderful breakdown. As we're getting ready for game number two, we do agree over here. Don't give them Senna and Nautilus. <laughs> and pick short range into it. But yeah, I, I think that, you know, the guys did a good job of highlighting that KT did have some opportunities within the game, but not really able to uh, get the job done. And once they weren't able to get it done early, the game kind of just floated away from them. And uh, it just floated away. Disappeared like cotton candy in the water. As we're getting onto the rift for game number two, KT did select blue side, thankfully. Have you seen that clip of a raccoon? That, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It always breaks my heart. I don't know why you had to remind me, Velvest. Hopefully I don't see Senna so I don't get reminded of more cotton candy as Zeus is going to get his Aatrox banned away. And T1, they do know what to do on red side. They do hit the Senna ban. That will be a different bot lane matchup to come through here for KT, which I think they're going to be very happy about. Yeah, Talia going to be targeted once again. Uh, we did have a Zeer band by T1 on the blue side as their third ban. I wonder if Faker's going to get his hands onto the way pick this game or if they're going to ban it away here third because that was one of the bans that KT did go for on the red side. They also banned Oriana though, so they're just going to leave both open and take away the Callista. Wonder what KT wants to prioritize here. Oriana is the standout pick to me. Something that I think ideally you'd like to go towards. Doesn't really have any counters. Goes well with a lot of different junglers. The alternative would be like Varus, maybe. Varus is really high prio. Azir is obvious, as in it is a comfort pick for both of these two players. As oh, perfect, actually going to get his Udyr band away. Sign of respect there to come through. <laughs> Zayus like, I didn't win lane hard enough. It wasn't good enough. Yeah, I mean, they take away Zeus' Aatrox, so it's it's one for one. It's only fair. Varus, the selection here for Deft. And now, definitely a lot of stuff available. You got Wei, you got Orianna. There's the Smolder still available, especially with Senna and Kalistagon. That could be something you could look towards. What will be the choice? Might want to take away the Nautilus as well and not give it over to KT for Varus Nautilus, which is a very strong duo. Oriana Nought makes a ton of sense. Doesn't lock you into anything specifically. Still gives you plenty of counter pick opportunity, but nope, not going to be the case. Going to be the Cassante forcing Perfect off of his two favorite champions, Udir and Cassante, while 
still giving a lot of power. We've, we've been kind of distracted by our dislike of Cassante due to Senna coming to the forefront. Does mean that Barrow will be able to play Nord. Not going to be the farming variety here, but still going to be a very strong pick. BDD. Expect this to be regular old Vizier. The Grass Vizier, which will Showmaker pick up double POG with, I think is a lot better when you play it into melee matchups, not when you try to play it into something like Yoriana, which has a really oppressive laning phase. Don't know what Faker's win rate slash win streak is in Oriana, but I'm still at something ridiculous. I'm sure we'll see it early on. We saw, I think it was Call Me, go for the Grasp Azir, but with second wind and not um, conditioning into the Oriana yesterday. So another option if you kind of sure. want to go half and half and still oh. be a little bit tanky. And Love that. Yeah. Perfect. As we know, is good on this pick. It's a pick that should be able to do on to Cassante if you're able to get to mid later stages in the game. And the Vi pick up here. Imagine T1 is going to want to ban the can share, but you can also leave it open and then pick it here on R4 and then pick it up for yourself and just pair it with any of the hyper carries that are still available. Your laning phase is going to be tough, but I think that can specifically makes Vi's life so miserable that it warrants a look at at the very least and Vi, Oriana as we know quite a strong combo there great ball delivery system for T1 right from the get go Zeri targeted has been coming back into the meta here in 14-3 and they will take that one away from Guma what's it gonna be T1 final ban away here Gonna be Viego, so maintaining the pressure on Pioshik, his jungle pool. Not allowing him to play any of those. Could go to Zin again, but the Zinza was rather underwhelming. Vi, or a Poppy rather, is another opportunity to go for. Does, in theory, allow you to play a really good defensive role for your team. As the Smolder pickup, Guma gonna be the main character? in my T1 in 2024? That's crazy. And Smolder, as we know, is incredibly strong once you hit 225 stacks. And they ban away the Lucian instead, which has kind of fallen away in favor of oh, wow. other picks such as Smolder. Um, but they could just go heavy dive and try to shut it down like we did see yesterday. Home Life Esports was able to do that very effectively against poor Jiwoo. Do you catch? If you feel like all your eggs are in the T1 basket, it might not be a bad idea. I think the main issue with Kench specifically is that into the amount of AoE backline dive that's available for T1, it might feel like it's a bit too much. So they're going to go with Alistair instead, still allowing a way for Karyat to provide peel, but might have a little bit of a better time in the mid to late also providing another form of engage as opposed to it just being owner which with the Kench obviously you don't really get yeah so definitely a uh, couple of ways for T1 to play aggressively but also defensively and wait and scale up and get the Oriana and Smolder to a spot where they'll be very powerful but then reliable engage as you did mention or on the side of KT Rolster definitely going to be looking to get in there and try to shut down those somewhat immobile carries, smolder not as much as the Oriana, and try to essentially push them out of the game. Gonna feel a lot better about this one. I imagine if you're a KT fan, don't feel like you have quite the same level of pressure on you, this composition, even though it isn't a smolder, I think can actually go the distance. So not gonna feel reliant on stomping the early game, while still having a decent amount of early game agency. It's not like you don't have any power with a Varus in the bot lane, might turn that into some early dragons. Do have to get to level 6 for a lot of the maps to already unlock both Azir and Wukong in particular are going to be somewhat reliant on that. But the mid to late game team fight for this comp looking a whole lot better here. If you can get the Narad, could be a win condition as well. Yeah, maybe some more pressure on to Perfect. Going to be curious to see how he will play in his A's this time around as we're ready to hop onto the rift for game number 2. Yeah. 
There was a sign that uh, was like, I remember Pyoshik Deft Barrel, November 6th, 2022, San Francisco. It was a pretty good sign. Hoping to bring back some of those memories here for game two, because game one was a disaster. <laughs> so it really was. It was not a good game. And I'm hoping that this one is a bit more competitive. One can only hope. We have seen that Lethality Varus actually beats Smolder when piloted by Viper. So just do that. Yeah. Just just be as just just do that. Just, just do uh, that. How much was it? Seventy K? Yeah. Seventy thousand damage from Viper. And look at this! Faker against BDD and against Deft. These three guys have all played 100 games against each other at the same time, in the same game. And Faker's playing Orianna, BDD's playing Azir. It's perfect. <laughs> Deft is playing Varus. Yeah, it should have uh, been should have been Jinx for Fematic yeah. consistency, really. Or at least Caitlyn. Oh, that would have been good. It's it's fine. Varus is also cool. <laughs> I really like Varus, but it does feel like he doesn't really have as much of a strong identity. He just He's just good. He can go for different builds, tailor it to the situation, has great follow-up for team fights, particularly with the variation that we go for here, which is going to be Lethality with Halo Blade, so decent amount of early landing pressure, and then chain your CC into barrels. Uh, That's good. Yeah. Gumba just kind of stepping into that one, and Barrel's immediately there to punish him. He did go for the Greedier Smolder start, which is the non Doran's ring and Q start, as BDD is in a lot of trouble. Oh, he's just dead. Okay, that was quick. Owner comes up, clears the top side of his jungle, has red buff, flashes on top of BDD, who can't even react. And he just gets back to clearing his jungle. That's optimal pathing. Oh! Oh boy, Deft in a bit of trouble here as Karia sets it up, and already we have KT in trouble. Deft will survive, which is very good for his sake. Ooh, might actually end up working out there, because Deft not dying is quite big. Because a Yeastail or a Barrel Rider still has the sums available, whereas the same can't be set for Guma and Karia. Yoshik trying to fight Owner here. I don't know about that one. Owner doesn't have Smite, but certainly Owner is in a much better spot health-wise versus Pyoshik. Although Barrel is trying his best to try to zone him away as Pyoshik has to flash, but now the hook comes in and Goomba's over the wall. Deft is in some trouble as one auto will get it done. Pyoshik is super low as well. Oh, God. I wanted this game to be more no! competitive. Not like this. Three kills into the hands of T1 in the bottom lane and three minutes into the game on a smolder lane and owner's just three and zero. What? <laughs> I asked for more competitive, not less competitive. Well, clearly you didn't put in the right request, Feldes. I messed something up. This is a block. That kill in mid lane, really well done by that duo of Owner and Faker. Faker sets it up, Owner knocks it down. He can come back from what that. What is this? That's that's 2022 regular season barrel, baby. The re engage with the hook. Guma having the presence of mind, knowing that there's no sums available on his counterpart, just flaps over the wall. Meaning Deft doesn't have any safety, meaning KT doesn't have the prerequisite. DPS to actually win the skirmish. And I don't know why Pioshik was trying to duel the Vi early when you're Wukong and you can... I mean, just <laughs> I they had them pushed under turret and Barrel was trying to get in there and help. So, like, yeah. you can kind of see, okay, we're going to use this pry. We're going to try to push Owner out. He did go for that earlier gank. But, yeah, it, it was still very risky is something you could say. As... Uh, Jonas Strong is trying to tell us here that Karia executed himself on the turret, I guess. <laughs> he keeps zooming in on the Alistair, he just zoomed in on the turret. Yeah, because so. he, he, uh, Karia has a death. Yeah. It's like, huh, where did that death come from? Wasn't from the fight. That is peak storytelling from our Observer team there from the LCK. Thank you, Jonas Strong. Him and the boys, they do a great job. We get to, we get to talk about that now, because this game, Valdez, is it's not looking so good. This is not my telecom war. Yeah. Saturday I was, showdown. I was promised <laughs> excitement. I was promised gameplay. Yeah. Sometimes you can't force the games to be good. 
but hey, if KT come back from this, that would be epic. Uh, it's going to take a lot. There you go. Uh, especially because, you know, Faker's playing Orianna very comfortably. He's also 8-0 on this pick so far. Nobody has been able to beat him on this one. Oh, that, this is not the energy we need, Val. That's what we need. And no, I know Smolder's <laughs> fed. Smolder's fed. Yeah, I know owner is 3-0. And, and Guma went for the, again, he went for the greedy build, which is Q first, not going W to help out in the lane, not going Doran's ring. And he gets away with it. With flying colors. Now, Karia might not get away from this one, as he will have to sacrifice himself to try to keep Guma alive, which he will do. Nice little gang set up here by the side of KT. This is how the comeback starts, Feldes. That's what this game is in service of now, as we do give P.O. Shik an early kill. Guma obviously going to skill really, really nicely with those. Good punish of the lack of flash. T1 will be able to pick up a Mountain Drake, but two more of those. Guma does not have <laughs> the ability to flap. And so he will just take some damage, but doesn't really seem to care. The big thing about the Smolder, as well as that his wave clear, is pretty good, and it only gets much, much better. So, you know, even if you're trying to push him under turret, you're trying to harass him out of lane, it's very difficult to do so. I do want to highlight that while the bot lane and mid lane situation is somewhat of a disaster, with owner's position being known for most of this, Perfect actually has been doing a really good job. And this is to be expected, but I think it's still worthy to highlight given that this player, when coming into the LCK, really was very obviously a rookie. The rest of the team was talking about this in interviews as well, you know, like he's very nervous. We try and give him as much support as he needs. So seeing him actually utilize the counter matchup is quite cool. Pioshik, you're a level down. But Barrel is there! He's got Barrel this time, and you know what? Owner's in a lot of trouble, as he does have his flash. He uses his ult on top of that. He's going to queue over the wall, and he holds on to his flash. He doesn't even have to use it, as BDD will have to divide away from Karia, who's being very annoying there. As BDD was not quite able to help out in the trade, but now with Level Perfect six. and the Pryle from the top side, they should be able to take this red buff away. KT is not gifted. They're, they're playing into the arc. They're keeping our expectations as low as humanly possible. <laughs> right when we fully gave up on them, they're like, We hey, really did. It's time. Now we're going to play League of Legends. Uh, we do see Yoshik hit level six off of that. Owner not going to get his red buff. Still not going to be too sad about the state of his jungle. But a big win for KT. And one more pick might be enough to start equalizing this gold score. Oh, boy. Well, we got Deft in a lot of trouble. He's going to run forwards because he can't run any other way. Well, there was a Baker's pick. going to uh, pick up that kill. Uh, it was just not the one we wanted or needed. Faker, really good roam there. The butterfly effect from the earlier uh, scuffle that we had where BDD had to defensively ult, meaning that it's harder for him to maintain prio, meaning it's harder for him to keep Faker locked in lane. Which, again, it's, it's Oriana. We don't really expect her to be locked in lane because her laning phase is so oppressive. And Guma, after so many games, finally gets to have a moment. He gets to farm plates. He gets to be a fun Elder Dragon. And here, you see Barrel and Deft really wanting to look for the 2v2, not knowing that it is, in fact, not a 2v2. The 2v2, they could have won the 3v2. Impossible. It's going to be Faker picking up a kill as well. Yeah. So, nicely set up there by the side of T1. Uh, the wave was being held nicely by Guma uh, down on the bottom side of the map. So you can see they were just trying to get some vision, trying to exert some pressure, and it came back to bite them. In the case of the KT bottom lane, of course. As now, Kosu trying to get in there, but owner, he's just doing the bubs. And he will be able to pick up six in this game, as well as picking up the first dragon. So they don't even need an early game comp. They just need early game wins in terms of the early trades that have gone their way. Owner going to pick this up without any issue. She mentioned Valdez, Zay's standing guard. It's also the mid lane prio, still available. Do you think Bioshik was spotted? So Faker should be fine, or has his flash available as well. And with the existence of Owner near his top side, not going to be feeling too bad. Yeah, that they do know. Uh, just another confirmation, Pio, she could be looking for a play on Faker there, but not going to lead into anything. And it's not quite as rough. Interestingly, uh, after the early kill and after the fact that the laning phase for 
anyone outside of BDD actually is looking pretty decent here. Perfect in particular, really able to build up a decent gold lead here is what is keep, keep, uh, keeping KC in the game. And they don't need to win early quite as much. I still don't think you want to go up late game against Oriana. And Guma has 75 stacks at 11 minutes. That's, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's fairly accelerated. Wow. And this is the benefit of what you were saying earlier, the fact that you don't feel obligated to go for the Doran's Ring and the early points in W mean that we get to level your Q more. And he is looking good on those yeah. stacks. He's also had a lot of free time with the wave, so he yep. can just kind of hold it and wait for his Q to come off cooldown so he can just stack it rather than desperately trying to clear waves against, you know, being pushed in by the Varus Nautilus. And that's just kind of all due to the lane state and the, the game state, I should say, and the way that it has played out. As Xeos is beginning to have a bit more luck in this top side, he's not going to hit that knock up and he'll be kited away just a bit. He is down a lot of CS at this point, nearly 30. Although there's the wave going into Zeus. And he doesn't seem to care because the rest of the map is winning for the side of T1, and they will take down a second Drake as well. What's it going to be here? Ocean Soul. No. Oh, Camtex. Hey! Sorry, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the bottom lane could be in a little bit of trouble as Caria is going for a little walk. Carol, that's bait. You got to know. Oh, they. Oh, okay. That's not bad. It's an yeah. okay trade. I Pretty guess. interesting that T1 didn't try to force that, but maybe not knowing exactly where BDD and Koshik were. Just want to play it safe. Chemtech, that's good for KT. That's what you want. That means that you don't actually have to care about Drake. And hey, a 2k gold league is a big deal now, but in about, you know, 10, 15 minutes, 15 if T1 is quick on the trigger and you need to find for Elder, that's fine. That's surmountable. That's doable, Valdez. That's, yeah. that's really what we're looking towards. Generally, the team with Smolder is trying to hold on and not lose the Chemtech soul well, I, I, or the soul I, at I, all. I, <laughs> <laughs> I need some leeway. Uh-oh, we got Perfect in a lot of trouble here. He's being CC to death, and he will get his hop off and immediately get ulted in the face. Doesn't even bother flashing, as it was a very nice and clean setup there from Owner and Zeus to take down the top laner. Good call from Perfect not to use Flash there. Was never going to get him out. Particularly with Owner still having Flash available. Pioshek is stealing away that buff. And this is the problem that has plagued many a team into T1. Zayus taking a beating in lane. All the credit to Perfect. But generally, Zayus needs one of these moments. And now he has a kill. He's going to get two blades. And he is going to be even. And maybe even slightly ahead. Because Perfect only got a single plate add the kill on top of that, and he's going to be completely fine from here on out. Probably will be able to build the lead back up. And these are the moments where we often see the game kind of turn 2.5k gold lead, 2.7 now, in the favor of T1. <sighs> Deft, pretty scared. We haven't seen uh, Mom be used just yet by Guma. He's just holding on to that one. Generally used to clear the waves as you're usually being pushed under turret, but instead just holding on to it for if a team fight does break out, but you can see that KT not exactly uh, confident about taking a fight on the bottom side of the map, so it's just free farm for the Smolder, as it will be this Rift Herald given over to the side of KT Rolster. Teosik just gonna clone away from that one. Perfect is level 11, and should know that Karia could be up here. Objective times nice. have actually been quite nice from KT. When they when they contest, because they've they've gotten like the small ones and a herald, you know, a red buff here, a, a grump contest early, which I'd rather not speak of, because <laughs> it set this game on a rather yeah unfun path. But first item spikes are being hit. Perfect has his triforce now. Deft, as we saw earlier, has been sitting on this Yumus to give him a lot of added safety, which he is gonna need because. If owner ults him, he probably just dies 127 stacks at 15 minutes already. Yeah. Um, I think he's going to hit 225 by 20. He might just get there. Yeah, that's bad. We had, um, I think it was Viper, hit 210 stacks by like 20 minutes. 
And that was really fast. <laughs> so Yeah, it is really fast. Yeah. Once we get to this point of the game where you hit 125, it's uh, it, get, it gets pretty easy to farm them up. This top lane is still just being a top lane. Just farming. Zayu's still 20 CS behind, but he got those two plates and the kill. And he's feeling still pretty good about his situation. It's an improvement of game one. Because yes, they're down two dragons. Yes, Smolder is stacking for free. But they do genuinely have really good ways of getting on top of this Smolder and not letting Guma play the game. Between Nautil Assault, the backline dive of both, Perfect and Pioshik, and then BDD with his shuffles. Feral <laughs> is in a little bit of trouble here. The Shockwave is going to miss, though. Well, that's big. That might be enough for KT to start stacking a Dragon. If they want to contest heavily here, no Shockwave available. Could be an angle. They could begin to get some Chemtech Drakes. That would be nice. They need something. <laughs> something, Veldes. Yeah. Chemtech. It was all right. We do have Pyoshik looking for a little charge on into the mid turret. We're not going to see any Cuz maneuvers as he is the best driver declared uh, by us yesterday. But uh, yeah, KT is going to set up for this objective. We do see that T1 are hanging around. Barrel is very much behind enemy lines. They don't know. They do not no. know about this, but now they're going all in onto owner. Gets knocked over the wall, but Zolt back over. Still goes down, though. Very nice snipe here from Death. But BDD is in an awful spot in the front line and was in a lot of trouble. Perfect in the mini NAR as the three man knockout comes in from Caria as he knocks Death straight into the danger zone. At the same time, Carrier really shoring up the end point of that fight. And now KT is just on the run. Away from this tiny little dragon that is getting very fed. Already 163 stacks now as Carrier is looking for a bit more. Not going to hit the knockup at the end of this fight. But still a winning fight for T1 as Faker will take a mid-tier 1 potentially. Some serious heavy lifting from Carrier and that fight there. And crucially, even though they end up getting owner, a lot has to be invested. And Perfect never ends up getting Mega. If they have Mega Nar for that fight, I think it is one. I think it equalizes the game and everything looks a lot better. So Owner ends up getting shuffled over here. Again, this is a lot of investment and they do pick up the Vi, but the amount of damage that comes through immediately means that BDD is down. And then Zeus gets Perfect into the enemy line and Caria, not only does he keep the backline from KT from doing any damage. He then also hand delivers Deft yeah. with one of the few remaining damage sources because BDD already went down and because Perfect came into that fight as Mini Nar and was blown up relatively early. So that one, two of Zeus and Caria and the way that they use their CC gonna mean a big win for T1. Yeah. And I got soul point here. Things are looking dire, Feldus. And you know why BDD was out of position is because he went over the wall to try to all in onto owner. Which who, he didn't need to. You know, they got him. <laughs> they did. Credit to them, they did. It was a nice little snipe from Deft at the end yeah, but they got of his him. life. But then BDD was in the middle of four people but and they, immediately died. They got him before that. He was he was out. Like, you had won. He was gone. He was not going to be able to make his way back into the pit. And there was no... Well, BDD was shuffle. the one who went over first and shuffled him over oh, no, the that's, wall. No, I, yeah, yeah. So... I, but even before... It just felt a little bit like they had found their moment. And they were so excited. And they went very deep in to get the pick, which they got without considering how out of position they were going to be. And all kind of stacked up against between the two walls as well makes Alistair's life very easy. Like, credit to Kerry, it was a very nice timing. Got the awesome uh, flash Q to knock up three people. But also, you know, KT just kind of bunching up there and not having the Meganar, as you mentioned. Yeah, it's the classic, you know, they could, but should they? No. Yeah. No, they should have. It's not over yet, Valdez, because it's just a Chemtex. <laughs> <laughs> It's not that big a deal if they end up getting it. Still have great team fighting. But I do think they get one more, and after that, the gold lead is going to become too much of an issue for them to really fight their way back into the game. I don't want that. I want free games. I want my Saturday showdown, my Telecom War, to deliver. I want something to show for this showdown. Yes. Something needs to show up. Not, 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 not game one. Not show up, but showdown. 
Yeah. <laughs> He's at uh, 197, by the way, so... Yeah, didn't quite hit the 225 of 20. That's very difficult, but... It's, it's still extremely accelerated, we could say. It still is. Yeah. And... It's too bad. The comp that we saw Hamalei Viewsports utilize into Nongshim Smolder was Rakan, Kaisa, <laughs> Vi. Um, stuff where it's like, okay, so you press R and everybody is on top of the Smolder. And there are some parts, especially the Nautilus and the Wukong, that can kind of emulate that, but it's not necessarily as strong of a dive comp. Plus, oh. Hamalei Viewsports were very far ahead, so made it just look even more dire for the Smolder. It's going to be pretty difficult. Also, the fact that Zeus now is fed. You got Owner who's pretty fed. You, you have Faker who is doing a great job in mid. So there's just so many threats on the side of T1 that even if you do take out the Smolder. TP for red? Yeah. Um, looks like a TP maybe for a game winning fight, as that is an interesting mom call. Mom got a little bit distracted. But uh, that's fine. Everybody on the side of KT is going to flash out of there. At least Barrel will. Maybe a miscommunication. You know, Guma tried to tell his mom where everyone was, and then they left. And then mom was like, even even still? I'm like, yeah. Okay. Guess I have to. Yeah. Use my fiery breath on no targets, which is very sad. But looking at the cooldown, I think Guma's going to be feeling too bad. <laughs> As a uh, yeah. fair amount of ability, he's already level 2 on the ultimate. So he's fine. He's okay. And by the time they fight over the Baron or the Chemtech Soul, he will have 225 if he doesn't have it already. So yeah. he is going to be in that insane state. Should nearly have three items as well, working towards that rapid oh, fire cannon. Has, if he has RFC and 225 stacks for the next fight, whew. I think he will. I think he will. We did see BDD was doing a nice amount of damage when everybody was standing on top of his soldiers, but in total in this game does not have much. But he did finish his Leandris, so maybe can make the difference in this next fight. They have to. If they do fight, which I don't know if they want to, maybe you just let this one go and accept that you will not be getting your hands on the dragon as 224 <laughs> we have being hit here. So realistically... Guma is going to hit it here on this next wave. It always feels like somewhat of a celebration. It's like, hey, he did it. We made it. <laughs> it's Christmas morning. He doesn't have RFC, though. So there is a glimmer of hope for I KT. think he's got the money for it, to be that honest. He, he's sitting on quite a lot, although I wouldn't back now with the Drake about to spawn. This is, this is the all or nothing for KT. Two item spike for Deft. For BDD, for Bioshik, and for Perfect. This might be as good as things get. We need to all or nothing here. Type TP coming in, they know. You wanna try and contest this time? Mega Narbar actually not looking too bad. Yeah, it's pretty well timed, but look at the damage that's coming out already on a Bioshik. He just gets caught out in the front line as Bob will be called down on top of death, but we do have Owner in a lot of trouble. They do isolate him and essentially see, see him to death. He was not able to flash out of that one. Now T1 have to reconsider their options here in a 4v5. They have done a lot of damage to KT, but that big pick onto the jungle could be nice for KT to at least delay things for now. T1 is one of the only teams that consistently does this, where they are member oh, down and they're still contesting this aggressively. We do have the TP coming in from BDD. I mean, they're so healthy. And they are still, again, a member down. Faker doesn't complete his back, does always have teleport, but not quite have it available and looks like T1 decide the better of it. Although I'm not sure. No TP getting ca or a uh, back rather getting cancelled. Owner's on his way back. Now let's see how this one goes. Back as home. <laughs> will they even try to steal it away? There is a kind of half-hearted cue from Zeus, but yeah, now they're just gonna run towards the Baron and threaten it at least. They have owner up. I know about Fred I think they're gonna they, just do it? They're just going to do it. There's no vision. There's Zero. no vision. At all, things are going down. But no. KT, they, they don't know. They have zero idea. But they got to know. I mean, there's... 
But can they move in? Vision going gonna let them know. They're gonna move in together as a team. Look at Karia's position. He's gonna be spotted. He gets out of that back line. Depth is in a lot of trouble. They died very deep for him. As Mob will help out, but they don't take out Depth just yet. But it is going to be him eventually going down. BDD does have some nice damage in that back line, but now he's all alone here. Zeo's getting pretty low, but BDD will eventually get executed as Smolder. Guma will pick up the triple as Perfect is the only one left alive. And he will just run away, sadly. Carrier with the setup there, gets on top of Deft. Deft doesn't get, uh, get to play the game, and this is why we mentioned maybe it's a Kench angle, because otherwise it becomes so incredibly hard to play out to actually get anything going there. T1, they give up the Dragon, but they get the Baron in return. They're gonna take that trade. And if it was Soul, it's like, Maybe not the best of trades, even for Kemtech, like I think that's arguable, but as we go way back here, the combo of both the ultimate from Owner and Faker being used on only BDD, who then doesn't end up dying, is a really hefty investment, but it's this play right here. Because of the CC chain from the, uh, from the Alistair, even with the flash that Owner has to invest, like he still ends up going down. The Mom on top, yeah, Death doesn't go down immediately, but it doesn't really matter. And here, Carry also ensuring that Perfect doesn't get to maybe get like a Mega Man into the wall. Yeah. And the BDD can ex there's just no space. It was kind of sad when Barrel was trying to peel for Deft at the end of that, and he couldn't because Owner just flashed over him, and then he died in about the span of 0.3 seconds to Smolder. It was like, oh, well, I guess this is what non-farming Nautilus looks like in this game state. You just immediately get burned by the extremely overfed Smolder, who probably has four items after that fight. I mean, Guma, five zero and five in this game. He's sitting on three and a half items. I'm sure he's pretty happy about his situation at this point. See when they take the Baron. And just looking to take out all the objectives that they can. 2,000 gold ahead in terms of current item value. It's not over yet, Valdez. They get one more fight. The Nexus hasn't exploded, Chronicler. You are correct. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're smolder. Uh, the baby Elder Dragon breathing, uh, breathing fire down their base. Yes, there is a fat Cassante in this game who we haven't even really talked about, which, remember a week and a half ago, that was all we talked about. Smolder entered the scene. Senna Nautilus entered the scene. There were other OP things to talk about. But uh, yeah, they also got Cassante, which was pretty interesting. Was first rotation, right? They got Oriana Cassante first couple of picks. They did. On the side of T1. And they were given Smolder after the second phase of bands as well. You remember the bands were Zeri Lucian. So. I'm just wondering whether. Again. That Lucian <laughs> ban was really a necessity. No. No, it wasn't. Absolutely not. And no, I, I was I think, wondering, yeah. Dallas. I don't need an answer. We just need to ponder. True. Yeah, we're just thinking, not answering. Um, we're just asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think that the draft has come back to bite KT a couple of times, but uh, T1 have also played very nicely in these two games with what they have been given. A lot of power picks is what they have been given. And Vi it was almost permaban in the first couple of days this week. They got that as well. Smolder after the second phase of bans. It definitely felt like KT did go for some flips in the draft where they were like, okay, well, we got to try something a bit off the rails against a team this strong. A bit crazy. And it didn't work. The gambit didn't work. Well, so in game one, I'm 100% for blaming draft. In this game, though, they did take an early... I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They did take an early 3v3 that did, did not have to happen. Shouldn't have happened, realistically, and definitely put the game very early on on a highway of pain and disappointment. Uh oh We got some Mega Cone action, gotta love it. Actually creating some good action in this case. First time I've seen it, as now Mom will be called down just to burn BDD just a bit. As meanwhile, owner on the flank here. We do have the Azir turret up, so don't necessarily want to dive that. They will back towards this dragon. Okay. Guma's oh is down. Maybe that's enough. No, it's not. They're going to give it up. It's 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 just Kemtex Soul. It's fine. Just get a turret, maybe. Top. No, that, you can't do that. Wave position isn't good. Get get Krugs. Get Krugs? Get Krugs. Get Krugs. <laughs> Hell yeah. They're getting Krugs. Getting the Krugs. <laughs> yes. 
11% slow resistance and increased damage. And decreased damage. Yep. Below 50% health. As Cassante really is going to like that, actually. <laughs> so uh, there is one champ that really does love the Chemtech Soul on the side of T1. And it is that man in the top lane here. As T1 trying to go for the mid turret. They do not have the Baron buff at this point in time, but they don't seem to need it. As they're just going to utilize that Chemtech Soul and the power in their wallets to eventually take this one down. They also have six Void Bubs, which is actually helping take down the uh, objectives, the structures here, as Barrel is in some trouble. But the damage coming off from Perfect is actually pretty nice, as now we get a big knock up immediately. Barrel is taken back into that back line, as Smolder's just doing way, way too much here, as Bob will be called down. BDD, though, still alive, looking for his angle. He tries to go for it immediately, just gets bursted down 100 to zero. As that looks to be the end of the game, BDD tried so hard to find that one Azir moment like he normally does, but it doesn't look like he was able to do it this time around. Guma just collecting kills. Owner going to steal that one away. But it looks like T1 has done it, guys. 2-0 on the night as they will take down the Nexus turrets and the Nexus in a couple of very one-sided games against their Telecom opponents as they're just having fun with their food here at the end. 2-0 in this series. And with that, I think a lot of the feelings that appeared right around the time when KT20 Gen G have uh, faded away after the Hanwha series, that alone was rough. And I don't think many fans were expecting a win here today, but at least trying to match would have been big. But unfortunately for KT, T1 were just straight up better in in drafting game one and in gameplay. But in game two, it really was just the early skirmishing, the early setup and the way that the fights played out that they had zero answer for. Yeah. I also personally, uh, personally believe that T1 was given a lot of extremely powerful picks in draft two. Uh, again, like you said, I don't think that's the reason why KT lost. Certainly that early game was uh, a bit of a sore spot. Maybe a bit of unhappy feelings after game number one that did spill over into the next game as Burrell was trying to make a big play. But yeah, it wasn't meant to be. T1 kept calm, cool, collected, and they did take the series pretty handily in this one. You can see the guys here on the side of T1. <laughs> little, little smolder sneeze. I like it. Except we didn't get a giant flaming ball of fire afterwards, which I would have liked to see as well, Guma. Reddy would have loved a little bit more commitment to the bit there. Yeah. What's Where's the, the ball of fire? What's some pyrotechnics in my League of Legends? Yeah. Would have been, been good. Like Where's the bomb guys. from the sky? Yeah, I, I don't know if... I, 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 I am going to draw the line him not being able to summon a giant flame-breathing dragon. I think that's okay. Don't let your dreams be memes. Okay, well, I clearly have to go back to magician school <laughs> uh, to uh, to study more, to try and figure out a way in which we can make this happen. Uh, it wasn't quite the same as game number one when it comes to draft, but when we saw this, I think we knew, Veldas. I think we both yeah. knew what was about to happen. This is the biggest issue, right? Just getting way too over-aggressive in the enemy jungle. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the reason why they did it, but it did not work out for them. BDD got into a rough spot here. He gets mommed in the face, immediately dies. We have Perfect kidnapped over the wall. Karia gets the three-man knockup, and then this fight is over. Well, that knockup as well, because if Perfect gets like a few more orders off, maybe he hits Mega. Maybe in the jungle fight, that can be enough. Here, they get owner. They win the battle, but not the war. Yeah. Nice angle from Karia. Definitely had a big game on the Alistair this time around. Multiple flash knockups that uh, essentially turned the game around in their favor. Didn't go Hex Flash, which is pretty interesting. Though there were like a lot of moments where he would have loved to have X Flash, but just didn't have it. Probably just wanted to shore up that laning phase with the Smolder. Zayus. He played Cassante. He tanked a lot of damage. Did his job as he needed to. So you take a look at the final fight. Given how fed Guma was, as long as he could just go in without fret, never really was going to be a way to win this. 
And the flash there, I'm sure he doesn't get shuffled back, BD with the Hill Mary will not be enough. And then they're just styling on. Smolder, I told you to get kills, and you didn't get kills. You don't deserve the kills. They're having a lot of fun here at the end of this game, as you guys can probably tell. Gumayushi really is just the egg on top of the ramen, even in a composition that should be all about him. And where he does the most damage, yeah. he's still getting roasted. Uh, two, clean 2-0 here from T1. Not a, not a whole lot to see. Yeah. Up Actually, clean 2-0, nothing to see here. Yep. Like, that was Saturday's showdown, that was the telecom war, but much like the first one, T1's kind of beat them down in KT Rolster. They looked good when they got the Senna Nautilus against Gen G, but now they're kind of struggling against some of the other top teams, so... Will be interesting to follow KT's road in the rest of this uh, round robin number two. But guys, we're done here on the cast for now. We're going to hand it over to the space to break down that game number two. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And yes, less of a telecom war, more of a telecom whimper there from KT. Unfortunately, uh, sort of just torn apart in back-to-back -back games by T1. They did manage to pass one test, uh, did T1. They did the Ben Senna maneuver. Uh, on the red side. That led to them getting a whole bunch of really good stuff. And uh, Hooney, Wolf, take me through what this draft looked like in the end. I mean, uh, bottom line here is it's a really similar draft to what they did in game one, where on the other side, you have a scaling AD carry that's going to be a big threat later on if you don't punish and get that mid-game lead. They had a winning lane top side with the Nar. They had the Azir, which, you know, was not the greatest part of this draft. But, like, you're playing Varus, you're trying to get ahead in the bottom side. And it's just, once again, the execution for KT isn't good enough to actually get it done and get those advantages in those early skirmishes. A lot of mistakes. The Wukong pick here, I didn't have a lot of confidence in for Pyoshik, just simply because I think while the pick is quite easy to play, I think it's very easy to disengage against as T1. I mean, I'll say, like, the, if you see the Ollie movement from the KT side, like, sure, they really wanted to punish on bottom, but, like, the, I would say the draft, like, really didn't make sense for me, because, like, it's not like they're playing, like, Poppy and, like, range support that they're going to crush on bottom. Like, sure, like, they did, like, kind of punish an Ollie on the game because of Nolas landed the hook on the smaller, and that was, like, actually kind of, it did matter. The problem is, like, just, as you said, the execution after the carrier just flashed, and it burned the, actually the virus flash, it matters so much. It actually impact the after the skirmishes after as well and impact the whole the lead that they had in from the KT roster. It's just like the whole plan screwed like at level two, level three. It's just like it's kind of weird, like how they're not actually playing like really delicate. Yeah, it it was uh a little bit of um yeah, I don't know. I, I think that uh carrier is just too good. Um, in a lot of ways. Getting that initial flash was just ridiculous. Let's jump into our first highlight here and uh, really watch how it all unfolded. This was a pretty ridiculous uh, gank from Ona. BDD, no time to even react. I mean, it's really good wave management here by Faker as well. Um, just pulling BD closer to the turret so you can guarantee that you can actually get the flash engage. And then Karia here, level two, knock up, push back into the turret. Deft has to flash and this is the beginning of what ends up being a very disastrous attempted kill lane here. And then this one, this one's the one that's a little bit inexcusable. Barrel deciding to go back in here. Everyone forgetting that Guma can actually go over walls. And yeah, Smolder in the early levels he is basically not a champion, but with that health pool, that was deft. And also, she, she just he could just jump over the wall, right? And it's like, it's just the deep, after, as soon as they hit the 4-0 in this moment, like when they actually have to kind of lead the game and it's just like just taking the Drake and using the jungle prior with the mid, like actually having Azir and Toriana and also keep making these type of the mistake two times in a row, three times in a row, you you can't really just come back. Where's the call where Faker is there? I mean, they got to get vision. I, I totally understand that because if they don't, they can't push their advantages there. They can't do anything with Avaris, but kind of walked in and died, unfortunately. And I did feel like there were a few of those moments. I think so many of them starting off with uh, Carrier Q flashing and Deft just being in a really awkward position throughout this entire game. Somewhat similar in vibe to what we saw from KT in game number two against Humble Life Esports as well. Sort of not really playing with any of that confidence, but T1, they just refused to let that three game series in round one happen again because this was a T1 that was just obviously better. 
than KT. And I, uh, if this is how they're going to play for the remainder of round two, I would be absolutely terrified if I was any other team in the LCK. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, we already said it. Like the game is like really, really tough spot for KT, but still, like it was like a little bit look, like playable because like they actually the TP landed this time really fast, and also flipping owner there is like really, really, really great. It's just like the after, just uh, keep eyes on just carry at the Alistair movement, and also the perfect and Meganar the management was really, really poor, and they can't really actually continue to fight. It was like. I think also Zeus really play well, like because like, he didn't give the time to perfect took advantage the the rage. But as soon as the carry has his Q flash landed on the Devaris again, like it's just the fight's over. Like that's like the fourth time already. Yeah, and they're also, I mean, chasing into trying to kill Guma, which is obviously what you have to eventually do. But at this stage in the game, Guma isn't that strong yet. I think they could have definitely played it slower, tried to punish Carrier there, burn through the front line, and actually front to back the fight instead. They were just constantly, constantly, constantly trying to force that backline access. Remember, Faker didn't even have ult for this fight. He blew it on a missed ultimate just moments before. And I understand the idea for KT. Like, this is an angle where we should be able to win this fight. It was a good engage onto the, the Vi, but... The way they followed up on the fight, I feel like some rookie mistakes from Perfect, et cetera, as you mentioned, Huni. A little bit unfortunate for KT, but a fantastic victory here for T1. And there's a player of the game, or I should say a carrier of the game, a cow of the game, if you will. 400 points now, as he is nearing the top of the standings, only 200 away from his mid laner, as Faker is still in the number one spot. Yeah, I mean, sure, I think he he did kind of die one time, like, kind of, you know, randomly, but it doesn't really matter because, like, he's shown the impact. Like, I think I would say he saved the game as soon as, like, he hit the Q flash at level 2, which is doubly into the turret. That saved the game. Yeah, we didn't even show that that part because there's so much to show of carry of this game. A um, few votes for Smolder. Uh, I guess they he did have a bit of a taunt on KT, didn't, they, didn't he? Um, I, I guess. I, I, I guess so. I don't know. I I knew at least one media would go for Smolder, but I didn't expect a KR analyst. Mm. And I'm sure he's got his reasons, but... I'll find out who, it's, who it is. Yeah, Thank so it, it's, it's either... It's Coco or Pony, right, today? Uh, Captain Jack. Ah! Oh. Pony, I think? I know Pony is here. Uh, I will punish them. Don't worry about it. Yeah, okay. okay. Hooney. We'll get Hooney on it, and we'll make sure I got that you we back. report... It was Captain Jack. It was Captain Jack and uh, Coco. Uh, so, I mean, I know Captain Jack, you spend a fair bit of time with him, so you've got a lot of time to punish him in the future. And speaking of the future, we have a future of interviews. So let's throw it over to Jisun for some translation. Thank you very much, guys. This is Jisun for the POG interview translation. We are here joined by Faker and Karia after their win up against yeah, KT Roaster. It was the Telcom War that everyone was waiting for, and it's a clean 2-0 sweep for T1. How do you feel, Faker? Well, the previous Nongjim series was a little bit rough for us. It was 2-1. and one. So I was looking forward to getting a cleaner performance and game score today, and I'm really satisfied with the outcome that we managed to achieve a clean 2-0 um, game score, and also the performance. Same, I'm really happy that we were able to showcase a cleaner and better performance today. Faker, when Oriana was removed in the first game, you decided to choose the nerfed Quirky. Did you feel the impact of the nerf in this current version? I mean, it is nerfed, but it's not that critical. So depending on the situation, Quirky is still viable. With that win in game number one, your Corky is on a 20 game winning streak here in the LCK. Including MSC, it will be 21 game winning streak. I don't know why I keep winning on Corky, but it feels good to win every time. Carrier, in the first game, T1's comp was all about the late game value, especially around the Senna Nautilus, Nautilus comp. And Senna Nautilus is also on an 8 game winning streak. I wonder how T1 is evaluating Senna pick right now. I miss Senna right now. I think all the other teams are also thinking that it's a good pick. So we also think that Senna is a OP champion. She is really strong right now.
Faker. There was one moment in game one where KT tried to kind of sneak away the Baron quickly, and T1 was able to tell it really fast and deny this. Tell us about the decision making around here. Well, at this point, we were not able to spot anyone on the bottom side of the map, so we were like, obviously, obviously, this is gonna be Baron. So we wanted to, you know, chase them and punish this play. Well, T1, every time you guys do an interview, there is a record that we have to celebrate together. And today, Korea, you are able to achieve your 300th LCK victory. Congratulations. I cannot believe it's 300 wins already in the LCK. Thanks to the amazing teammates that I was able to perform together with and also all the support coming from the fans, I was able to hit this milestone. Thank you so much. Baker, any words of celebration for Karia? Congratulations, said Baker, very politely with a bow. Keria, also your matchup up against Beryl raised a lot of expectation for this Saturday showdown as well. What was the focal point for the matchup today? I think KT, their biggest strength comes from Pilsic and Barrel, so I wanted to make sure that we can kind of shut it down. And as long as we can, you know, deny their, you know, powers, we will be able to win the game and series. So I think that kind of worked today. And Keria, you played your first Alistar game this season in Game Two. Tell us about the concept behind Smolder Alistar Duo. When you play like late game value picks like Smolder, you know you get to play a lot of support champions. So I think Alistair was the pick that kind of suited our composition best. And we had some fantastic outplays from your Alistar in game two. Let's take a look at this replay. How did you see that angle? Well, even prior to this point, we were setting up for a play around Bear. We were not actually trying to get the Bear, we were just trying to set up a team fight around here. And I think because we were so well prepared for the fight, we were able to kind of take a very clean win over there. And we have another record today. Faker, interestingly, you had your 100th match up against BDD and Theft at the same time. Looking back, are there any memorable moments from your encounters with these two players? I mean, just being able to, you know, compete with them means a lot to me, you know, and it's a blessing that I got to play together with those two talented players for 100 games. It's just amazing. So I want to say also thank you over to Deft and BDD for making this beautiful moments together. And lastly, anything you want to say to all of the T1 fans supporting you guys? Yeah, round two just started. And I really want to make sure that we can get a revenge on Gen G, the team that we got defeated by in round one. And I hope to continue our good form and performance. I hope we can maintain a great form throughout the second round and also playoffs and finals. So we will keep working hard. That was the end of the interview from Kyria Faker on the side of T1 and back to the space. Thank you. So much, Jisun, as per usual, for the fantastic translation of both Faker and Carrier's interview there. And Carrier, 300 games. Um, congratulations there as well uh, on the victories. Really good stuff. Uh, and let's have a look at the standings. KT still in fourth place, but that is getting more and more dire. Kwanong Freaks. They do have to face off against Bro, who are fresh off a victory against them, but they could equalize with KT's match scoreline, and that is pretty worrying for KT, who KT, keeps slipping. Yeah, that's exactly the word I was gonna use. They're slipping pretty hard right now, and I think a lot of people gained a lot of faith for KT after that win over Gen.G, but now I feel like it's, they got Senna twice, man. That's what happened. <laughs> I mean, too many crazy things like Guangdong Freaks creeping 7-4.
You know, that's... Whoa. I mean, or like seven weeks. I mean, that's a crazy part, you know, which is... You know. Could have been, uh, could have been, been a fourth? fifth place. Could have been a f fifth place situation for KT. And now we're going to head into our next matchup. Genji taking on Fear X. That will be coming up right after the break. See whether Genji can continue their form as well and look to challenge T1. We'll see you after the break.프리비어슬리 농심 e스포츠 아카데미와의 정규 경기 이대영 참패 위기에서 베테랑의 힘을 보여주며 기적 같은 역전승을 보여주나 싶었지만 CL 최강의 벽은 너무나도 높았다 아니 그니까 게임을 좀더 하라고 이래서 다음 경기 이길 수나 있겠어? 역시 이대로는 안돼 특단의 조치를 취할 때다 가방에 있는 유니폼 아니에요? 유니폼 바지일 수도. 아 진짜. 아니 뭐 모자? 좀 짜치는데. 아 저기 안에 어깨권이겠지. 설마 저기 안에 있겠어? 자 상자 안에는 몇 천만 원 상당의 어마어마한 선물이 들어있는데요. 팀 일육공의 전력 상승에 도움이 될 만한 미션 세 가지를 하셔야 되는데요. 각 미션을 성공할 때마다 열쇠 조각을 얻으실 수가 있고 세 개의 열쇠 조각을 모으면 상자를 열수 있는 번호를 드리도록 하겠습니다. 어, 근데 이거 번호 키면은 두 개만 있어도 되는 거 아니야, 요새? 왜 보시고 이거 경험을 다 돌려? 컨텐츠에 약점이 있으면 안 돼요. 우리 게이머들이 되세요, 왜? 야, 컨텐츠 즐겨줘. 준비해 오셨잖아. 컨텐츠가 부실하잖아요. 그냥 즐겨. 미션 세 가지를 먼저 전달해 드리도록 하겠습니다. 진짜 짜치는 것만 아니었으면 좋겠다. 아. 안 이게 뭐예요? 뭔데요? 왜 혼자만 알아요? 야, 진짜 꼴 같네. <웃음> 아 이거 지금 하라는 거예요? 자 미션 1 나와 친구의 듀오. 앰비션 캡틴 잭은 을지로에 가서 우정을 빚으세요. 우정을 빚으세요. 
아, 생각보다 생각보다 어색하지 않아요. 아니 저희 <웃음> 나는 안 어색해요. 저는 다 해줘요. 두분 이름을 한 번도 안 부른 거 아세요? 저 비전 비전이라고 불렀는데 아니요 그런 적 없는 거 같은데. <웃음> 나도 못 들은 거 나도 못 들은 거 같아. 지금 처음 들은 거 같은데. 아닌데? 얘기하긴 하지 않나? 모르겠네. 그랬어요? 자 미션 2. 오마카세에서 이지훈 입맛 찾기 큐베 이지훈 메라는 인천 스퀘어 원에서 오마카세를 맛보세요 어? 그치? 좋은데? 아니, 어, 너무 좋은데? 어, 누가 좋은데? 찾았어요? 야, 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 너무 좋은데? 너무 좋은데? 너무 좋은데? 어? 네, 여기 인천 스퀘어 원이 어디예요? 어, 이거 근처 아니야? 아 인천이요? 설마 인천까지 인천? 잠깐 설마 인천까지 인천을 가라고? 인천. 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 그래서 오늘 지훈님 차를 끌고 오셔라 야 1번이 낫다 아, 가서 뭐 하나 더 즐기고 보면 되죠 오락실 갈까? 갈까? 네. 어 여러분 미션 수행 가서 자세한 건 미션 장소에 가서 확인하시면 되고요 자 출발하시죠 네? 자 지훈님 어요 네. 진짜요? 네. 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 진짜 옷도 이렇게 입고 가나요? <웃음> 아니 을지로에 뭐 준비된 게 있어요? 아 서로 건 피디님 피디님들 흩어져서 저희 담당하는 거 연인 촬영 같아. 앞에 봐봐. 카메라. 아, 근데 뭐 옛날 예능에서 나 보던 걸 여기서 하게 될 줄은 몰랐네. 아, 짱 신기한데? 나내 친구 중에 오마카세 되게 좋아하는 친구 있어가지고. 동창? 왜, 뭐, 왜 항상 이렇게 하는 거야? 동창, 동창. 아니, 아니, 일단, 일단 울프지 뭐. 아니, 그 질량 보조리 법칙이라는 게 있잖아. 그 체험을 유지하려면. 아, 근데 나. 그만한 질량을 먹어야지. 진짜 어메이징한 거 옛날에 진짜 말았을 거 재밌었는데. 프로스트 얘기부터 해가지고 그때가 프로스트는 뭐? 아 여기야 그, 그 시절이지 산, 산 증인이지 네. 프로스트 어메이징한 팀이구나 생각한 게 권우 땅땅땅땅 부터 해가지고 도가락 거, 딘, 딘, 딘맵 거, DF 거 근데 진짜 한 거야 근데 뭐? 아 말하면 안 되는 거야? 아니 말하면 안 되는 거야? 지금이라고 좀 규모가 나는 어메이징한 얘기가 옛날에 많았어가지고 지금은 네. 상상도 못해 그렇죠 지금은 상상도 못해 그럼 이제 하나하나 쌓여가지고 이제 좀 체계적이 됐다 네 맞긴 하죠 맞긴 하죠 일단 시행착오에 시행착오죠 네. 여기 분량 안 나온다고 뭐라 하겠는데 네. 상관없지 뭐 어차피 이거 얼마 아직 키겠어 보기가 메인 콘텐츠이긴 하죠 근데 <웃음> 아니 생각, 생각만 해도 웃기긴 하다 진짜 무슨 얘기 할지 진짜 무슨 일이 있었길래 그렇게 어색한 거야 여기 그 반지 사는데 아닌가? 아닌가? 아니, 아니 뭐야 아닌데? 카메라 아 진짜 이거 길거리에서 <웃음> 오른눈이 많단 말이에요 아, 아 이거 진짜 눈 없으면 연예인들 뭐 그거 하는 거아 쳐다본다고 <웃음> 아 근데 진짜 이거 너무 부끄럽다 아 뒤에서 쳐다보잖아 얘기 때 나왔지 않아 지금 방, 아까 방금 여기 지하철 나와서 막 뱀미션 <웃음> 이러면서 지나갔어요 아 진짜로? 어. 아 진짜? 네 어? 아, 여기? 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 아, 야 이런 걸 해보네. 와이프랑 도안 해봤는데. 앞치마를 <웃음> 좀. 아 네. 앞치마 해야죠. 앞치마요. 중요하죠, 중요하죠. 앞치마 이제 서로에게. 서로에게? 아 이거 <웃음> 또 오다가 또 그쪽으로 내려왔군요. 아. <웃음> 와 이거를. 와 이렇게. 야, 고맙습니다. 아유. 야, 여기다 팔 넣고. 어. 야, 나도 해줄게. 그래. <웃음> X 자로? 안으로 뒤로 아. 들어가야 된다고요? 오케이, 오케이. 아. 두분 동갑이라고 들으셨는데. 네, 맞아요. 네. 나이가 어떻게 됐어요? 92년생이고요. 네. 저는 93년생인데 네. 신고하기로 했습니다. 아, 진짜요? 네. 네. 어, 저도 92년생인데. 어, 저도 92년생인데. 아, 아 그래? 신고할까요? 네. 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 아, 잘할까요? 네. 네. 아, 잘 놀까요? 네. 아니 나나나안놀 거야. 나안놀 거야. 이제 화기 
특이한 분위기로 이제 접시를 만들 거예요. 네. 접시 색깔이랑 네. 이 안에 있는 무늬 색깔을 이 앞에서 컬러칠을 아, 골라주시면 음. 돼요. 약간 이런 색깔 어때요? 어, 그럼 한이 정도? 뭐 하나만 골라야 되나? 아니 아니요, 이거 아니요? 섞어도 돼요. 뭐 제가 색 준비해 네네. 아 예. 뭐가 있는지 모그릴지만 좀 구경 좀 해보자. 아 참나. 이니셜. <웃음> 앰비션의 A. 눈도 안 맞으시고. 지금 그 눈도 안 맞으시고 그래라고 말하시는 건 마치 눈 마주치라는 저한테 지시 내리시는 거 아니에요? 태종님 지금 딱 눈. 어. 나는 나는 괜찮아. <웃음> 요거는 <웃음> 도자기 알료예요. 그래서 여기 앞에 숟가락 있잖아요. 네. 요걸로 알료를 한 한두 스푼씩 쳐서 색깔을 넣고 섞어주시는 거예요. 와 근데 이거 아 손톱 갖고 올 거야. 잡았다. 세포하는 건지 모르겠다. 오늘 게임하러 온거 아니었나? <웃음> 이것도 게임이야. 혹시 어. 성함이 누군지 아시 네이밍이 있어요? 게임을 할 때? 그쵸, 닉네임도 있어요. 어, 어. 캡틴 잭이에요. 아, 아, 아. <웃음> 아, 예. 내가 캡틴 잭이에요. 잭 스페로우 아시죠? 진짜 그 진짜 그 진짜 그잭 스페로우의 잭 캡틴 잭이에요. 진짜 아, 아니요, 진짜 아니요. 캡틴 잭이라고. 네, 제, 잭 스페로우라고. 너무 좋아요. 저는 앰비션이에요, 앰비션. 앰비션, 네. 앰비션 잭님. 네. 네. 사실. 네. 왜요? 얘기하세요. 얘기하세요. 왜요? 혹시 알고 있었다고요? 아니, 아니면 뭔데? 아, 몰라, 몰라요. 저 페이퍼밖에 네. 없는데. 페이퍼 알면 다 아는 거예요. <웃음> 그 페이퍼한테 페이퍼가 첫 번째 키를 누가 따신 줄 아세요? 누군지 아세요? 저요. 제가 데뷔 전 희생양이었어요. <웃음> 저도 같이 있었어요. 아, 진짜요? <웃음> <웃음> 같은 팀이었어요? 다섯 명다 말살됐어요? 말살됐냐고요? <웃음> 거의 뭐 그렇다고 음, 생각하시면 그렇죠, 돼요. 그렇죠, 뭐. 배드엔딩이었거든요. 아, 나 오히려 이분한테 말 거는 게 재밌는데요. 어? 어? 와, 와 이거 진짜, 진짜 너무해. 아니, 아니, 나 아니, 마상. 이거, 그러니까 그거, 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 그 게임 모르시는 분한테 이제 게임을. 부차에, 부차에. 더 멀어지는 것 같아요. 더 멀어지는 것 같아요. 우리 선이 형만 얘기할 경우. 나 이제 적당량을 뜯어서 밀어줄 거예요. 오. 여기서 판을 만들어주는 거예요. 서서 해야 될것 같은데? 어, 서서 하는 게 좋아요. 음. <웃음> 또 여기서 이제 그 배치를 오려주시면 되는데 요걸 뒷부분으로 뾰족한 부분으로 그림을 한번 그려볼게요. 아, 그림을 먼저 그리게요 네, 네. 왜? 네? 아니, 아니. 저는 캡틴 잭의 옆모습을 그릴게요. 오. 왜 이렇게 나를 어색해해. 옛날에 같이 게임 많이 했었는데. 난 아직도 짱구는 못 말고 온라인 같이 했던 때가 기억난다니까. 야, 그거 어떻게 기억하냐? 네가 얘기 안 했으면 난 몰랐어. 이것저것 하던 때가 있었지. 저희 시대는 경기가 없는 기간이 길어요. 그때는 토너먼트였으니까. 그래가지고 그때 집에서 못댐륜 뭐 짱구는 못 말고 온라인을 하게 됐는데 그걸 또 같이 했어요. 어. 그때 막 이제 막 이것저것. 팀원들끼리 막 얘기하면서 같이 할 게임 없나? 어. 이러면서 그때는 진짜 선수들끼리 진짜 친구처럼 지냈어가지고 요즘엔 없는 그런 낭만이 있었거든요. 잘하셨는데? 근데 약간 <웃음> 그 제가 아는 그 영화 외계인 나오는 영화 같은데 네. 그아 색깔이 그래서 그런 것 같아요. 저는 최선을 다했거든요. 저도 일단 다했습니다. 이제 이거를 네. 그대로 밀거거든요? 네. 이거 밀어요? 네, 쑥 안에다 넣어주시면 돼요. 이렇게 그냥 밀어요? 네, 네. 쭉 밀어주세요. 어. 이순이, 이순이. 우리 잭이의 옆모습을 보면서 그렸고요. 그 옆에 있는 쿠키는 귀여워가지고 형과 또 귀엽잖아요. 제 마음을 담아가지고 다 하나하나 의미가 있습니다. 좋은 색깔 있다. 일단 좀 범용성을 생각했습니다. 앰비션이라는 이런 뭔가 딱 상징적이잖아요. 서로한테 한마디 해주면서 건네주는 교환식을 가져볼까요? 먼저 해. 먼저 <웃음> 하라. 아이컨택을 해야지. <웃음> 아이콘택 시키니까 열받아요. 아니 근데 
이거는 그냥 좀 다른 얘기긴 한데 어. 저 옛날에 저 살짝 마음에 빚이 좀 있다고 생각해요 개인적으로 어. 언제냐면 음, 그 롤드컵 선발전 때 12년? 어, 어. 그때 정말 결과가 너무 아쉬웠어가지고 음. 그때 좀만 더 열심히 했으면 어땠을까 아. 생각을 그때 했던 게 아직도 있거든요 후회했구나 그때 음. 좀 후회가 남아있는데 어쨌든 뭐 이번에 이렇게 같이 하게 되면서 그래도 그때 같이 후회하지 말자라고 생각을 해서 좀 게임을 열심히 하고 있어. 그냥 그때가 생각나서. 야, 12년 전이 생각이 나가지고. 그래서 이번에 후회 없게 일단 마지막 경기까지 잘 해보자. 아, 고맙다. 아, 고맙고. 아, 잠깐 울잖아. 뭐야? 아니 왜 울어? 아니 왜 울어? 야, 뭐야? 그 당시에 이제 팀에서 정말 이제 의지를 불태워서 게임을 했었어야 됐는데 상대적으로 좀 부족했었나 좀 아쉬웠었나 좀 후회스러운 게 있어가지고 뭐 이번에 같이 할 때는 저도 그냥 제 의지 최대한 불태워서 열심히 해보자 그냥 후회는 없게 하자 좀뭐 이런 생각으로 그냥 얘기했습니다 어 그게 기억이 날 정도면은 진짜 진심이었을 거라고 생각하고 사실 그때 졌던 기억은 있어도 뭐 누구 때문에 졌다 뭐 이런 거는 솔직히 기억에 아예 없었거든요 좀 마음고생을 했겠구나 내가 먼저 할걸 그랬네요 <웃음> 우리 이제 앞으로도 이제 같이 방송하면서 만날 일 많을 텐데 음, 음, 서로 어, 우리 친하게 지내고 같이 할수 있는 것도 많고 어, 그랬으면 좋겠다 <웃음> 그래. 다음에 또 만나자 그래 아, 음. 와 진짜 사랑이 아주 가득 담겨 있는 <웃음> 어떠셨나요? 아 오늘 재밌었습니다. 좀 집중해서 할수 있었고 잡생각도 진짜 많이 없어졌고. 감사합니다. 아, 아 예. 아, 아유 고맙습니다. 네. 오늘 수고하셨습니다. 네. 아, 네. 어, 그러면 미션지를 미션지를 드릴게요. 미션지요? 아니 <웃음> 또 뭐야 또 있어? 미션이 뭐야? 아, 이게 에서 티타임을 가지시오? 아니 미션 이게 미션이라면서요? 아니 뭐야 이게 또 미션이 또 있어? 나와 친구의 기호라는 미션 안에 네. 세부 미션이 상관이 없어 있었어. 아 어, 이건 쉽지 그래 버티 음. 타임 가지면 되니까 가죠 바로 오늘 감사했습니다 아 감사합니다 네. 아. 아 잡아 아 이거 아 개쪼봐 아 이거 주차를 저 오른쪽이 너무 좁아요 저못 나, 못 나올 거였어 네. 아 말하지 너무 좀 어. 제 어디로 가나요? 그 이마트 시식 코너는 아니죠? 해조 회 생선 저희 KFC 오마카세라든가 이런 거 아니죠? 그런 건 아니죠? 이마트 아니죠? 오케이 오케이. 진짜 너무 너무 부끄럽다. 왜요? 아래서 한 대화 봐요? 아니 아니 여기 이거 카메라. 아, 카메라요? 이렇게 대동하고 다니는 게. 어 너무 부끄러. 워 혹시 그 15년도 SK에서 활동하신 위지훈 형 앞에 가죠? <웃음> 앞에. <웃음> 앞에서 뭐야 여기? 연예인인가 봐 진짜 열받는다 여기 연예인인가 뭐야? 진짜 열받네 야, 진짜 야 왜요? 왜요? 아니 너 진짜 안 부끄러운 거 맞아? 못 벗는데 벗는데 제 맨살을 보여 본... 뭐야 여기 로지탱 와... 여기 오버카드라고요? 로지... 밥 먹는 줄 알았는데? 아 초밥은요? 로지텍 오마우스 아. 카세에 오신 걸 로지텍 오마우스 아. 카세에 오신 걸 환영합니다 전 여러분을 오늘 안내해드릴 셰프 조수민이라고 하고요 일단 자리 안내해드릴게요 아. 어쩐지 점심을 주더라 오마카세가 더싼거 아닌가? <웃음> 급격하게 떨어지는 이 장비가 더 비싸요 오마카세 미션을 듣고 딱 진짜로 오마카세 회 주는 줄 알았는데 적잖이 실망을 했지요 근데 저는 개인적으로 이제 게이밍 기어 같은 거를 되게 좋아해가지고 한 친구는 좀 아닌 것 같더라고요 아 이거 먹을 거로 막 약간 속이면 안 되는 그런 느낌이어서 아 정말 더러웠습니다 <웃음> 사람을 이렇게 굶주리게 해놓고 밥 준다고 하더니 말이 된다고 생각하십니까 이게? 아, 안녕하십니까 로지텍에서 준비한 최고급 오마우스 카세 오신 걸 환영합니다 와 네, 여러분 이렇게 로지텍 오마우스 카세에 초대한 이유가 있는데요 <웃음> 이제 지윤님께서 저희 단종된 지 오래된 모델인 지원 마우스를 곁에 애정해 주시고 계신다는 점에 정말 감사 인사를 드리기 위해 이렇게 오마우스 컷에 초대를 해드렸고요 제가 그 마우스를 초등학교, 중학교 때 PC방 다니던 그 시절 마우스를 지금도 쓰거든요 
이번 오마우스 카세를 통해서 세분 모두 입맛에 맞는 마우스를 찾으시면 미션 성공입니다. 네, 식사 전에 텃밭이 준비해드릴게요. 식사요? 식사. 어, 식사. 애기한테 이런 거 사줘요? 이젠 안 사. 나이 커가지고. 어릴 땐 무조건 사야지. 아! <웃음> 첫 번째 요리 준비해드리겠습니다. 첫 번째 요리는 이제 속을 좀 편안하게 할수 있는 에피타이저로 준비를 했는데요. 지훈이 쓰셨던 지원 마우스의 디자인을 계승한 G102라는 모델이고요. 베이직한 테이스티와 꿈맛이 아주 호불호가 없을 거라 즐길 수 있으실 거라 생각됩니다. 네, 나눠드리겠습니다. 왜 이렇게 좋아요, 성진아? 어이가 없어서요. 어이가 없습니다. 맛있게 즐겨주시기 바랍니다. 감사합니다. 아, 감사합니다. 아, 이거 괜찮은데요? 어, 벌써 만족해요? 네, 계승이 뗐잖아요. 괜찮은데? 저 이걸로 할까요? <웃음> 저는 일단 유선은 안 써요. 저도 무선파입니다. 네. 아, 유선이 없어서. 아, 난 괜찮은데? 저 이거 키핑할게요. 키핑이요? 오, 뭐야, 와인이에요? 네, 다음 요리 준비해드리겠습니다. 네. 두 번째 음식 같은 경우에는 여러분이 찾으시던 무선 마우스로 준비를 했습니다. 네, 모델명은 G304고요. 평양색색한 색깔과 아주 부드러운 목넘김을 가지고 있는 음식입니다. 감사합니다. 얘는 아까보다 살짝 별론데요? 왜죠? 어떤 재미 별로죠? 아니, 그냥 느낌이 좀더그 괴리감이 큰데요? 괴리감이 원래 쓰던 만 원짜리랑 괴리감이 3만 원짜리가 일단 괴리감이 가장 적고 6만 원이 괴리감이 좀더 커요. 세상의 기준이 딱 그거네요. 그러니까 아, 이거 하나 쓸 바에는 네. 그뺀 처음 거 여섯 개 쓰겠다. 야, 근데 저는 딴 거보다 이 건전지가 굉장히 마음에 들어요. 이게. 왜죠? 이게 왜냐면 그냥 건전지 뺏다 끼면 그냥 풀충전 아니에요, 사실상? 유선 마우스는 충전 어... 필요 없는데? 그러면 핸드폰도 유선으로 써요? 뭐하러 그 무선으로 씁니까? 핸드폰은 핸드폰 그냥 배터리 이거 보조배터리 꽂아가지고 유선으로 쓰지 뭐하러 그 무선으로 쓰는 거예요, 그럼? 근데 아, 네. 이게 단점이 근데 있으면 은 이게 다른 무선에 비하면 무게가 나갈 수밖에 아, 없어요. 근데 이게 6만 원인 거는 이제 좀 보급형으로는 나쁘지 않다. 네. 어떤 멘트가 나올지 기대돼요, 벌써. 네, 혹시 두 번째 요리는 입맛에 맞으셨나요? 아, 아 네, 색감이 예쁘네요. 저는 잘안 맞았습니다. 제 몸에는 너무 무거운 음식이 아닌가. 다음날 소화 안될것 같거든요, 이런 거. 소화 안 돼. 그런 여러분을 위해 제가 프리미엄 명품 코스를 준비를 했습니다. 와, 어? 먼저 사과를 드릴 게이 친구가 너무 제철이라 단 하나밖에 먹지 못했다는 점. 세 분이서 같이 쓰셔야 될것 같아서. 아니, 여기. 아니, 여기는 필요 없어요. 아, 왜, 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 왜? 왜? 아니, 유선, 저, 유선 무조건 무선이니까. 네, 여기 무선. 아, 아니, 뭔 소리야? 무선도 쓰면 써! <웃음> 오케이, 오케이. 네. 일단 요리, 요리 한 번. 네, 요리 공개하겠습니다. 네. 프로게이머들이 사랑하는 어. 마우스. 찾으시던 심플한 디자인에 무게도 아주 가벼운 63g의 초경량 모델입니다. 지슈라입니다. 똑같이. 아, 아 이겁니다. 아, 이 그립감부터가 이게 벌써 딱 와닿아요. 제가 지금 현재 쓰고 있는 마우스. 아, 지금. 쓰고 있는 거야? 네, 쓰고 있는 겁니다. 이 충전도 빨리 돼요. 이거 한 시간 정도 더 쓰지 말고 나줘. 너 써봤다면서? 어때 우리 비평론가 이지훈 씨 어떤 거야? 뭐 써봤던 것 중에는 아니 네, 현재 무선 원탑은 저게 아닌가? 어 무선 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 중에... 게이머들이 제일 많이 쓰는 또 이유가 있어요. 무선 중에 제일 나은 게 맞는 것 같다. 아, 근데 일단 그 딸깍딸깍 재밌는데? <웃음> 아니 촉감 촉감 놀이 아니에요? 어 진짜 재밌어요. 눌러 보세요. 궁금하네. 저한 번도 안 써봤거든요. 아 그래요? 진짜, 진짜. 오, 뭐야? 와 진짜 아니, 진짜 가벼운데? 네, 진짜 가볍다니까 음, 제가 딱, 썼던 것 중에 제일 가벼운 마우스 그게 아 저는 되게 마음에 들어요 딱 마우스의 기능만 있으면 되는데 딱 충족하는 느낌? <웃음> 더 남았다고요? 사실 일반 손님들한테 준비된 오마카세 코스는 여기까지였지만 이제 VVIP 고객분들이다 보니까 신제품인가요 혹시? 저희가 특별히 프라이빗하게 제공하는 신제품입니다. 아 어, 진짜요? 어, 이거, 진짜요? 이건 좀 궁금한데? 맛보셨던 지슈라의 후속 모델이고요. 어? 여기서 무게가 더 가벼워졌어요. 어, 더 가벼워질 수가 있다고 이거 보다? 더 가벼워질 수가 있다고? 라이트 포스 하이브리드 스위치라는 엄청난 기능이 추가된 지슈라 2입니다. 무게가 차이가 느껴지진 않는다. 아, 느껴지진 않아요. 느껴지면은 <웃음> 뭐 달라진 건 없는 것 같은데. 아 근데 내가 말할까 말까 하다 말았는데 클릭감이 좀 다르긴 해. 하이브리드 스위치 같은데 스위치 그 클릭감이 조금 다르네. 아 보통 마우스 고장 나면 이게 두번 더블 클릭 되는 게 보통 많이 고장 나는데 보통 그게 기계식의 방식 때문에 많이 나는 거 아니에요? 그 지원 어떻게 고장 난지 혹시 알고 있니? 뭐 몰라요. 그냥 쓰다 보면 그냥 더블 클릭 되는 거 아니고. 아니야 지원 더블 클릭 이슈가 없어. 그냥 버튼이 들어가서 안 나와. 아, 그건, 그건 좀. 어때? 저는 그러면 지슈라 추가 무조건 더 마음에 들 수밖에 없네. 왜냐면 이게 내구성에 있어서 그러면 이게 더 좋은 거일 수밖에 없으니까 이게. 둘다 재밌긴 재밌어. 어, 둘다 재밌다. 
곱창을 바꾸던가요? 장기적으로 보면 이게 더 고점, 네, 장기적으로 고점 마우스 고점은 고점 마우스 이게 훨씬 높게요 장기적으로 봐도 저도 원래 유선 쓰다가 프로 때 무선 나오고 무선으로 바꾼 거예요 좀 처음에 인식안 들어도 결국에 이게 장기적으로 좋을 수밖에 없어서 저희가 준비한 오마우스 카스는 혹시 입맛에 맞으셨을지 모르겠습니다. VBF 손님들 모실 수 있어서 저희도 영광이었고요. 아, 감사합니다. 혹시 어떤 제품이 가장 마음에 들었는지 한 분씩 들어볼 네. 수 있을까요? 비싼 값이 혹시 비싼 값 사는구나. 저는 무조건 지슈라 2. 저도 이제 모든 장점만 가지고 있는 지슈라 2로 택하도록 하겠습니다. 꼭 가지고 가고 싶어요. 너무 좋거든요. 지훈님 지슈라 2로 선택하셨고요. 네, 결국 게임은 휘적휘적이 중요하잖아요. 근데 이거는 지금 휘적휘적 딱딱딱딱만 하는데 이게 정말로 농담에 비교가 안 돼요 이거 너무 좋아 이게 아 진짜예요 눌러보세요 딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱딱
아나 진짜 이거 방송으로 나가면 난 어떻게 될까 난 진짜 상상이 안가 이게 반응이 어떨까 진짜 일단 뭐 그냥 게임 같이 뭐 하고 그래, 하면서 그래. 뭐또 지내면 또 재밌게 지내니까 어잘 지내자 그래 <웃음> 아 이름 물어줘야 촬영하아 아, 진짜 와. 됐다 됐다 와 이거 됐다 와 여러분 고생하셨고 네. 자 미션 성공하셨기 때문에 아 열세 첫 번째 여러분 들한테 드리겠습니다 고맙습니다 아, 일번이네 우리 160팀의 실력 증진을 위해 오늘 두 가지 미션을 수행하고 오셨는데 어떠셨어요? 재밌었어요 어때요? <웃음> <웃음> 너는 뭐였어? 너는 뭐였어? 인천 오마카세면 은 여기 주변도 아니고 멀리 갔으니까 맛있는 거 오마카세 뭐 비싸긴 했습니다 네. 한 사람당 20만 원? 거의 하이엔드였어? 네. 한 사람당 20만 원짜리 오마카세 네. 20도 아니야? 20, 23? 그 사치의 끝판왕이지 뭐. 파인다이닝 한 끼에 24만 원 태우는 사람들 <웃음> 개인적으로 알고 있던 제품도 되게 많아서서 직접 써보는 시간이 값지기도 했는데 그 제작진 한 분께서 약간 요리처럼 설명해 주시는 그 구간이 정말 기가 막혔거든요 아, 너무 재밌었어요 그리고 또 큐베가 아는 게 워낙 바삭하더라고요 저는 애초에 바꿀 필요를 못 느끼니까 사실 관심을 거의 안 가졌거든요 근데 최신으로 나온 그 로지텍 지슈라2? 딸깍딸깍 누를 때그 클릭감이 진짜 너무너무 좋아가지고 그건 너무 마음에 들었어요 전 시리즈를 쓰고 있었는데 이제 새 시리즈를 공짜로 받아가지고 아 루즈텍 분들 아 감사합니다 저 정말 좋아합니다 루즈텍 마우스 저희 네. 되게 궁금해하셨어요 아, 네. 어떠셨는지 좀 네. 아니 뭐 도자기 빗기 미션을 했다 하면 백화고는 당연히 하죠 그냥 찍어 꼈다 뒤에서 도자기 빚은 거 맞아? 도자기 빚으면 서로 뒤에서 이렇게 해서 네, 상의 탈의하고 <웃음> 도자기 맞게 막 진흙 바, 진흙 바르고 막 했어 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 다 했어, 했어. 아, 했어. 영상으로 찾아와 봐 재밌긴 했습니다 전에는 뭐 이제 뭐 사실 뭐 어떻게 살고 있나 뭐 그냥 그런 거잘 몰랐는데 이제 둘다 결혼한 처지고 어 같이 또 방송하는 처지고 그냥 좀 그런 데서 공감대가 좀더 생긴 것 같습니다 다시는 없을 추억이긴 해 <웃음> 미션 스크림에서 승리하기 브리온 상군 팀과 그리온 제가 이제 브리온 상군 힘들어요? 빨리하고 빨리 끝내줘 빨리하고 빨리 끝내줘 아, 쎄. 아, 이런. 아, 이러면 안 돼, 이러면 안 돼, 이러면 안 돼. 와. 안 된다.
PRX、PRX、PRX、ファイティング Hello and welcome back to the LCK. We're here for the second match of the night, and I hope it's better than the first one because the first one ended very quickly with the T120. Now we're getting into Gen G versus Fear X, which does have a big favorite in Gen G, who have only lost to KT by giving up Senna Nautilus. We do have a little bit of a trend going on there, and Fear X, who have been on a bit of a losing streak at the moment. Ooh, when you do that much stake setting, Valdez, it doesn't sound good. But we have been surprised this week already. We had the miraculous bro win. So anything is possible. I'm, I'm choosing to believe, even though in light of the evidence that is in front of us, I don't feel great about Fear X, their chances, getting bopped by DK, who are, well, DK uh, in, in 2024. It doesn't bow well, so they need a miracle here today. We'll see if Genji is going to give up Senna Nautilus again. Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. I think after no. this uh, first game against uh, T1 and KT, everybody was kind of watching and saying, okay, well, this is really just not allowed anymore. Uh, Genji, again, they've only lost to KT, and Fear X, they're on a 10 match losing streak against Genji as well, just as an organization. Um, coming into this one, only three wins so far. The intense race to the top for Gen G. And Fierrex are trying to end their four game losing streak, but they have a very tough schedule at the end of round one and at the beginning of round two here, starting off with Gen G as their first round two opponent. So this is not going to be easy, but we've seen upsets before. And so many teams, particularly on the east side, talk about this, how important it is, the strength of schedule, because you can kind of get into a groove. Whereas for Fear X, most likely they get to zero here today, and then that is going to carry over in their matches against some of their direct competitors. We'll see if it is going to be... At least a game win would be really big here already in of itself, I think, because when you look at the score, they're already uh, trading pretty far behind their direct competitors as well. And they don't really want to get in the DRX uh, slash Nongshim level of, uh, of game score. That's, that's why they want to stay yeah. far away from, because otherwise the road to sixth is going to be really, really hard. So Keen was the very first top Twisted Fate, and we're going to see how Clear does on his second Keen test of 2024. The first one did not go well, and Genji were able to 2-0 in the first time these two teams faced off this year. And now, being called as the ace of Fear X is Clear. I'm not sure if I totally agree with that. It's him or Willer? It's got to be Willer, I I'm, would I'm, say, I'm, lean, I'm definitely... Uh, of the belief that it is Willer, but it's one of those two, because the rest of Fear X just hasn't looked closer, even though he's been able to pick up 400 POG points, I think has been, even on his key picks, been pretty uninspiring. Chovy, the only thing he has in common when it comes to POG points is picking up two of them on the Azir. Let's see if Chovy will play tank Azir. I feel like that is such a Chovy thing to try and go for. As that is that was a very <laughs> cute drawing of a fox. Yeah. Love that. That is the fearless foxes after all. But this is Gen G. And they are quite the strong team. Pretty much the only team right now that you can say is on a similar level with T1 in the LCK. I would suppose that next would be Humble Life Esports, but a decent fall off after that over to KT, as we did see kind of witnessed in the first series of the night today. As Gen G feeling pretty confident about their current situation, they voiced regrets in recent interviews about their drafting against KT. We're giving the Senna Nautilus over and saying how a lot of changes happen every time there's a patch and they were just a bit slow to react to that, but they'll be ready this time around. And the evidence does support that. On the other end, Fear X. This team is one of the few teams this split where I feel like they've just been performing exactly to what we expect. Maybe a little bit below, but there's moments where their high aggression play style, although it has been neutered a little bit compared to some previous seasons, ends up working out where they end up making these big plays. But crucially, it's only against teams weaker than them. And they haven't really been able to, and this has already been one of the recurring themes for the entirety of the season of the LCK. The tier list is real, and, and there isn't a lot of 
beating up on teams above you, unless uh, we unless had, you're bro, unless you're bro somehow. And then we had KT, but <laughs> particularly given what we've seen since then, I feel like many people wouldn't mind me saying that it was more of a Senna Nautilus problem than it was a gameplay problem. As we do take a look here, the top lane matchup not looking too hot for Claire and Keen. He's been great. Had some standout performances. The Darius comes to mind. Uh, it's tough to go up against this player in the best of cases, and that is given that the rest of the map is even, which it will not be. It will not be, and Keen's got a champion ocean. He can play pretty much anything. We have seen Clear practicing his own bunch of top TF and also top um, Smolder. So we'll see if that even gets through the draft. In this case, uh, Genji do have side selection, and as you're about to see, I'm going to spoil it, and it's a big shocker. Genji have selected blue side. Imagine that. But that does mean that uh, kind of the onus nowadays we have moved into the situation where the red side does, it feels like it has to ban away some big picks, especially the Senna at least. Kind of have to. Another man that it does have a big champion pool, but generally doesn't use it as much as Chovy. Very happy, in quotation marks, to just go to his ear. We, we know for a fact that he does, in fact, not be happy about it. Uh, but he doesn't have a choice. So, might be the case here as well. My main question going into this, if Genji is going to take some liberties in draft, something that we've seen T1 in particular do, that he did kind of get uh, pulled back by Koma after the Nongshim shenanigans. And last draft that we saw was very, very straightforward. Genji generally, did, they're not really the type to do that. They're, they're a little bit yeah. more on the straight and narrow. I love how the coaches here are Coach Kim and Coach Helper. <laughs> so you got Coach Kim and his helper. The other coach, as over here we have Root and Duty. Hoping to bring Fear X to a spot where they can even get the one win over Genji, as you mentioned before. That would be a victory in their minds. As I mentioned before, Genji, they have selected the blue side. And I'm curious to see what gets through, because Senna's a big one. TF could be a big one if you're thinking about Keen. Uh, Smolder should be a big one that you may want to target away. Ash, another pick that hasn't really been at the forefront. Also, don't think that it's an execute champion. We'll see what makes it through here. Callista already going to get to taken away. And there is the Senna band, so Fear X. Passing the first test in having a game as... <laughs> in playing in a playing game. playing a game of League of Legends patch 14.3. Jeff also taken away. Smolder is the other one that we look towards that is quite strong. But the, with the current state of the matter, there's a lot of these picks that you feel like you need to ban away. Oriana, I think, is a really good example. And you don't really get the full space to do so. Azir is still available. It's Lucian, which I don't love. I would have rather seen a smaller ban. Won't be surprised if Genji picked that up. Yeah. Don't think they've been playing through bot as much as they have done in times past. But if Pace can play smaller, he will play smaller. Yeah, I don't really get um... <laughs> the Lucian. Like, man? why are we scared of Pace, Lehan's Lucian, whatever? Lucian is not really a big one in the meta right now, this so week in the LCK, and Smolder is. So Nautilus Vi? Maybe they go for the Kai'Sa angle that we did see the other day from Hamalai Esports. Yeah, you go Nautilus Vi and then you go Kai'Sa. Might as well all in on trying to counter this. It's going to be the Azir instead. Wondering whether Chovy still is going to gravitate towards the Tristana, which is something he has loved as yeah. a counter pick. That's so scary to blind pick in a Chovy. Yeah, there's also Yone. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I, I would advise against it as well. Lahens, Alistair going to be the call here. It looks like. Uh, and yeah, if, if that's a good idea. You could have maybe gone for Tom Kench, but I think this early on. Yeah, don't want to do that that, uh, that early on. And I also do see some difficulties depending on what the lane matchup might be. Alistair does have, barring level one, I think a bit more setup for junglers compared to the Kench. This is Zero Pick, though. I know it's comfort for closer, but I don't love it. This is the Cassante, probably towards Keen. Could technically be for Chovy. We haven't seen Cassante mid in a fair amount of time. 
and I don't expect that to come through here today. Yeah. They can't ban Tristana and Talia and Yone. So, <laughs> at the end of the day, I think Chovy's going to get his hands on something that will do well into the Azir regardless. As Zeri is the consideration here. Uh. Just match the Smolder. Surely nothing could go wrong. If you didn't catch that, Feldus was being sarcastic. Because in theory, what we have seen is that this doesn't really work. The one scenario where I can see it works is if in a late game team fight, pays out of position, doesn't have flap, and then Hannah like skates on top of him, you know, through a wall. That could work. That's that's and also no flash actually. Uh, th th those are those are the prerequisites. Yeah, and I think it would have been nice to have Vi, as you mentioned before. Yeah, I, I think it's just so strong. They like, might they might still get it. I don't know if you have Nautilus, so maybe you don't technically need two point and click. Hard CCs, but oh, two is better than one, I would say. Don't they just Yone? Yeah, really good vibe, man. Love that. Yeah. Definitely a good call from Genji. I wasn't sure whether they went go, uh, wanted to go for it, but they did. And it is one of the picks we have seen work out into the smolder. Zeri not quite as good as Kaiza, but at least in theory, it will make sense. That's that's good. That You know what, Firex? I don't think giving Smolder to probably our best team of playing around their AD carry is a good idea, but they do at least have a draft that clearly says we are going to try and kill this one big threat on Gen G. But the problem is, I don't think he will be the only threat. Um, okay, what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so we have one dragon with scaling, but what if instead we have two dragons with infinite scaling? Two dragons, Valdez! Yeah, but like... Two dragons! Why didn't he just play Tristan? <laughs> two dragons! <laughs> not one! Why is he playing Aurelian Soul? Double execute! Why did he just play Yone? Okay, and Lee Sin is going to be the final pick, of course. Just... I... <laughs> I don't know, man. There is no way this backfires, right? Genji just testing out some new tech in the LCK. Where have we seen this go wrong before? And yes, Aurelian Soul did get some changes. He can stack pretty quickly with his Q. Um, <laughs> is it going to matter? I'm not so sure. The Poppy does get locked in here as the final pick for the side of Firex. This is about as easy of a team, uh, as a read as you could possibly have. If Firex win the mid game, their comp is incredible, right? Early game, mid game, try and get Nocturne and Zeri and Nautilus to six and then start fighting. Try and get Zeri fed. Start getting these Ultimate Hunter stacks very early on and then make the game impossible. If Gen G get to the necessary amount of stacks on their two dragons, I know in theory you can look at the Ferex combo and go like, they have a Zeri, they have Zeri, that's good scaling. But not not compared to double dragon. And you know what? Gen G saw that they were gonna try and dive smolder and they're like, we just add another. Well one. yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I'm, Adding I'm, multiple threats is good. I just don't know if no, it's, it's, Soul was the right threat well, no, to it's, have. It's not. It should have been Yone. Yone or Tristana. Yeah, Yone, Sejuani. You saw how Malife Esports do that, right? Where they had Smolder and they had Tristana. And it was like, oh, oh no, the Smolder's getting farmed. But then you had a 6 and 0 Tristana as well. And it's like, okay. And Chovy is also the best Tristana definitely that we have. Could have done that. But instead, they gave us fun, Veldes. And that matters, I think. It does, it does matter. Um, <laughs> we like to have fun here occasionally at the LCK. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. The Aurelian Soul is being played into the Azir by Chovy as we hop to the rip for game number one. All righty. Game number one between Genji and Firex. Starting off right now. I am a big fan of Nocturne. I think that it is a pretty strong pick. You can farm extremely fast. Once you hit level six, if you get a successful first couple of ults, you become very oppressive in the mid game. 
And nobody's really able to step up in the lanes without more um, protection, as we do have some shenanigans here from Gen G. Just trying to get some vision down. We'll be able to get that going. The only summoner choice that I think is remarkable is that Lands went for Exhaust, which makes a lot of sense. Into Fear X, you have both Hannah and Willow that are going to be looking to dive in the enemy backline. So making sure that you have the opportunity to mitigate that is quite nice. As it makes sense that Genji would, the same way we've seen Faker do with the Hue, would be looking for an answer into an Azir that you know is just going to keep coming out. That is in the melee carry. I just don't know if specifically Aesol is it, and if so, what the what the larger thought process behind it was. We did, of course, have Aesol get some changes, then he was extremely busted, then he got hot fixed, and still is stronger than he was before, hmm. as Chovy, 59 unique picks. Can't believe he never played it. It was, 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 was there in the meta for a little bit for a while. Yeah, there were some players that were just like, eh, not really gonna play it. Uh, some other players that were like, I will play this every single time, aka Bulldog. Um, as we do have level two hit here, but nice headbutt away from Lahans. Still gonna take a big chunk of damage, but that's fine. As eventually you do just get to stack up pretty quickly. He's up to four. He also is an early game dragon. He wants Scorch, so trying to put as much pressure on Closer as he possibly can. Closer also not going for the tank variety, which makes sense. Not really the type of player to try and go for that. Showmaker definitely is one of the more adventurous players. And we now get the opportunity to not just track one set of stacking, but two. Although I think for Aesol it isn't quite as cut and dry the way it is for Pays when it comes to the breakpoints. Yeah. Also, uh, they're both dragons, so they both have scales. So I know Ox is at home giggling. I'm sure you guys can hear it as well. He would. He's having a great time uh, with the puns. Of, of the dragon scales. I really, really enjoyed listening to Orcs and you kind of lose it yesterday. It was, uh, <laughs> it was quite funny. Yeah, we were having a good time. It was uh, quite a first series, especially. It was, it was iconic. It was memorable. Yes, iconic. <laughs> <laughs> There's some farming happening here towards the top of the map. We do see Chovy consistently going for his very, very short Q timings to proc his Mana Flow Band and his Comet and move out of range before Closer really gets to do a whole lot more. So we do have Willer and Canyon both going for the full clear. Double wards being placed here to keep track of where this Lee is. And Willer already backed. Canyon looks like he's at the very least going to first do his Raptors. We'll see if he wants to go to another full clear just to try and optimize. Canyon is a big full clear enjoyer. It's something he loves to do, just farm up those camps that come in with a like 10, 15 CS lead and an experience lead on the first play and play through that. Uh, Pays, kind of awkward spot here, but gets the Ignite out of Execute and is in general just fine. Hadn't he used his potion. Smolder, as we've learned, is it's, it's kind of tough to really punish this guy in lane. I mean, yes, you can get some leads and you can delay his farming and his stacking, but at the end of the day, you're, you're not gonna totally shut him out of the game, is what we've learned. He's always going to eventually get to his, his break points and eventually be extremely obnoxious once he hits 225. And if that comes at, you know, 22 minutes or 25 minutes, it can change the way the game plays out. But uh, no teams have really gone all in on trying to shut this down entirely. Chovy already is up a full wave. Just Chovy, better, he just creates better. minions. Well, yeah, but I, I feel like recently he hasn't been doing just as much of that, and he's been focused more on having an impact on the map, something that he has historically struggled with, even though, particularly domestically in recent years, that just isn't really true anymore. But it is interesting to note that as far as champions go, with which it is very, very satis uh, satisfying to CS, Obviously, you're going to have a really good time with the Aesol and his Black Hole. Execute makes it really easy to consistently get all those minions, as we might have a trade here. Top side, Grubs for bot side, Dragon, although there is Prior here for lands and Pays. But with Pays backing, don't expect that they will actually look for Contessa. And also picked up a Call, which we didn't mention. 
they get that early on and already has been doing a pretty decent job of stacking it up as well. Yeah. Uh, Willard did a good job. He got the first uh, Grub and then he immediately went down to the Dragon. So also was able to get that extra XP from the Grub camp and then he didn't fully commit to it because he wanted to spend his time in a better place down on the bottom side of the map. This mid lane is just kind of, again, <laughs> Toby is taking a bunch of damage actually from the poke, but he will be totally fine, you would imagine. Not really just standing in front of Closer trying to stack with his Q on him anymore. But in terms of clearing waves and having Lehens here as well to help out, <laughs> he's going to get a nice back timing and be back to the standard state of just farming Chovy in just a moment. His pace here is going to get rooted down. Does not have his flap, and so he is being chunked quite a bit. But he brought a refillable potion. Trades, flash for heal. Not going to feel too bad, uh, too bad about a little punish coming through there. Nicely done by Execute to land the hook. Doesn't get distracted by pace moving back and forth, but... And then itself not going to be enough, as I'm pretty sure Cannon Wave is crashing here for Chovy. So thanks to Lahans, does get the back timer in. Should be able to pick up most, if not all, of this wave. Maintain his lead. As we do see, got most of it, I think. We're sitting at like 62. So not everything, but still not doing too poorly. And obviously, being a soul, going even, you're going to be perfectly happy. Given that you become such a nuisance in the mid to late game. And what I'm really going to be looking towards is how he's going to use his defensive tools to keep himself and hopefully pay safe against the amount of backline threat that the Firax composition has. Because the slow can be really obnoxious. Initially, it also isn't that big of a threat by itself, but it can quickly become that. I would also guess that he's going to go for an early Rhylize, meaning that that slow, combined with the amount of safety and flying that both of these two dragons do could be enough to make it hard for Firex to reliably take down his back line. Yeah. Dragons are pretty cool. I'm glad they added another one. I think uh, the more dragon champions, the better. Honestly. We have, what, three? I think? Shivana, Smolder, Aurelian Soul. Uh, Shivana isn't a real dragon, though. As And I, you know, I'm a... What? I'm a big fan of Shivana. I don't feel like she really feels she like a dragon. turns into a dragon. Well, no, I know that. But does she feel, outside of specifically her E and AP, like a dragon the way that Smolder and Aesol do? I don't think she does. Yes. Uh, they're trying to dive this dragon in the bottom side. I think it's going to work. Not much you can do about that. It's nice. Tower juggling here. Henna is going to live entirely. Execute does have to flash away, but they get first blood in the bottom lane onto this Nocturne very early on. Big win. Willer getting himself the early kill there, set up by Execute and Henna, doing a lot of damage towards Hayes. If he had heal and being caught by that hook earlier, might have been able to make it out life. Although, to be fair, it didn't look like uh, just a heal alone would have been enough. Nicely done, even the exhaust not gonna give him enough leeway. Only downside is that the kill didn't go to Hannah. That obviously would have been ideal, but Wheeler's still gonna be happy with it. And again, Wheeler, I think, has been one of the best performing members on this roster. Even though sometimes his desperation drives him to do <laughs> some silly things. Yeah. He's just trying to keep it together. It's not his fault. It, it actually isn't, which I know you agree with. But it does look silly sometimes. Some of his leaf flanks go a little bit too aggressive, but actually didn't go, because uh, we mentioned normally what you do is you go for Ultimate Hunter, but actually didn't go for Domination second this time around, so. He doesn't have Ultimate Hunter, and he's not going for Experimental Hexblade. And, oh, we're going to have a little all in here from Henna once again. Last time it was to get him low for the Nocturne, but will he actually dive Smolder? No, he'll just try to push him away. I said before, it is pretty difficult to really get rid of this Smolder out of the lane. As you can see, they killed him, but he's still ahead on CS. But now, he's alone. Ah, uh, no ults. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't have ult. Pretty unfortunate timing. They were pretty close to that one. Pace might just use his ultimate to clear out the next wave as well, and that will be the end of it. Yeah. Uh, we got an all out here in the top side. Desperate to pick up the buckler is clear. He's now kind of behind the play against a Cassante. Does have to flash, but now you're getting ghosted out. You're not getting away from this guy. I'm sorry, Clear. As Cassante will do Cassante things, and Clear does not respect it. And that is a solo kill for Keen. Big win there for Keen. 
wonder why Claire didn't try. I think I assume Keen held his W because normally he would try an ult, but obviously if Cassandra steals his W, that's never going to work. Nicely done there by the Key or by Keen rather, the top lane conundrum. Um, no pass on this test for Claire. Yeah. As we also, yeah. I, I want to get back on this Nocturne topic because. Experimental, experiment, experimental hexplate was created for this champion. I feel like also Ultimate Hunter is amazing yeah. on Nocturne. Maybe not in pro, just because you don't get to ult all cooldown because people are playing so safe. So that one I feel like is okay, as there is quite a lot of action actually. The Hens just have to pop his ultimate here, but is stuck around. There's so much CC between the Nocturne and the Nautilus. He will flash over the wall, but here comes Hena as he picks up a kill. Paranoia used just because Willer wanted to play it safe and make sure they got the kill, I guess, but kind of wasted this time around as Canyon goes on a merry little trip to follow Closer around. Long journey, not gonna lead to anything positive, and Fearx actually running the map here a little bit. It's good that they got the early kill on top side, otherwise the gold would look pretty dire. That's a kill going over to Hannah. Does have to invest a lot, does use his ghost and his flash, but two Drake lead early on. Kill on the Zeri, kill on the Nocturne, even though I do agree with you, I would love to see a Hexblade. Hopefully he goes Hexblade second. Maybe he just wants... I mean, Strybreaker as well is like not in a great spot. It did get, just get changed to be more expensive in um, trade for some stats. As you see here... He does use his W. Kind of wonder. Maybe Clear didn't have the mana after the early play. Uh, or he was worried that Keen was going to try and outpace him, but... Gonna be the end for the Poppy, unfortunately. These yeah. type of solo kills quite big. I think he should have had the mana. As, um, at least at the beginning of the trade, Lahens, he gets caught here. He says, I'm Alistair, you can't do that. But the chase potential of Zeri Nocturne is incredible. So you're not getting away from that. So try not to get out of position next time, I suppose, Lahens. Didn't even need to use it, or rather use the Nocturne activation as oh, King going in again. again. Yeah, clear a little bit closer to the turret this time, but the damage is there. Another knockup as we look at Smolder, and clear is not in a great spot. As uh, yeah, clear's gonna get solo killed again. Really struggling with the keen test himself. Ah, I know. Um, I forgot when you because Cassante has so much going on. When you use your ultimate all out you get your w back there you go so that's why he couldn't know <laughs> um why is, yeah, why, just why is everything. that why is that there i don't know i think maybe i repressed it out of anger, anger. Yeah. yeah so second time around yeah keen has, has red buff here as well so trying to get away from this Cassante is basically an impossibility this was the counter pick here for player one solo bolo, not the end of the world by itself, but another one. This is very quickly going to become a problem, and we haven't really talked about this just yet. But Closer is basically going to be forced to try and build Tank Buster, and with how fat Keen is, he's going to hit Koenig Rooker very early on. Mm -hmm. And Henna is going for Shift first, and I assume is not going to go into any form of Armor Shred until we get much deeper into the game. Gonna make it quite tough here. We haven't even talked about the dragon yet. It is cam tag, which I think Genji can be very happy about because they're they're just stacking. <laughs> they got a couple of scaly, scaly boys, and that's all they're gonna try to do. Sit back, play passive. Uh, outside of Keen, of course, who has a different agenda in his solo lane. Meanwhile, Toby and Canyon just pushing together. Just a couple of teammates having some fun in the bottom lane. And there was no no one there to answer. So they pick up that turret. They stay ahead on gold with their scaling champs. And, uh, you know, disclaimer, right? You're playing against Azir and Zeri, who can also scale incredibly well. But uh, the dragons have scales. So I think that's part of the reason why we keep saying that word in particular many, many times. As Lehens, thinking about a little dive here, did go for the Celestial Opposition on this Alistair, but not going to go for it as the rest of the team does come in, and the follow potential of Firex's comp is very strong. Willer looks like he just is going to skip the Hexblade altogether, actually opting into 
what looks to be Frozen Heart next, so he's going to go for the very gold efficient items afterwards. All right, there it is, the flash over the wall. Execute is in some trouble, does ult and flash away, gets away from Mom, and will be just fine. But a nice setup from Lehens. And they both have Hex Flash, so it's not the end of the world. Does trade his ultimate as well as Hanas for only paces. That's in of itself is something as clear. Sees Chovy is not impressed. Thriller is here. Now they're gonna try to dive on a Chovy who's in a lot of trouble. Did not respect the ability of Nocturne to come on over. That's just another free kill here for Willer. As Chovy kind of just chuckled his way into the lane and is feeling pretty bad about it now. I regret my earlier statement about Gen G not happy gaming. After the Double Dragon came in, I was like, ah. But they, they are also clearly playing with not a whole lot of respect for what their opponents can do. I feel like they've walked into a bunch of these situations. Like Chovy there, just walk into melee range of Poppy. <laughs> Should be fine. Uh, it's right. fine, right? There's no way that backfires. Yeah. It did. Particularly with Nocturne being out on the map. Willer level 11, so it makes it really easy for him to follow up on any type of these plays, so... Some hubris here from Gen G. Although it does... Ooh, can you try to uh, be cheeky there, trying to hit the Q, although... Given that it's clear, we wouldn't really have been able to go for anything. Uh, despite all that, though, the gold is still even. Which is... It doesn't really bode well for Firax. Yeah. They, they didn't get this mid-tier one. See that Gen G is trying to posture for this Drake. They don't want to let uh, Firex get three in total. Chemtech Soul is quite good for the Cassante especially. So we just stacking over the wall. And as a team, the five of them just in the brush. There's a knock on the wall here, actually. Keen in a bit of trouble, takes a huge chunk of damage. And now you don't have that very tanky Cassante at full health. Still gonna run at this dragon for now as Keen is running way far back to TP back into this fight. Should be able to, has a lot of gold as well available to him. They're trying to look for the cancel. Don't think they're gonna find it, but ideally they wouldn't want to give up two turrets just to get a Drake here. Maybe look for an exit play, but the turret is there. Look at Lehens. Oh, they're looking. <laughs> he has shut the door in their face and, and said, uh, you guys are not allowed to leave. And they don't want to go north, so I think we're gonna have a fight here closer. I think they leave. I think they're fine. For an angle, Keen and Lehens still very much Trying to posture around this, but giving them an out, saying, okay, you can leave now. And neither team seems ready to pull the trigger. Why are we A-ramming? There's no objective. Let it go. There's an Azir turret. Yeah, I guess. There's also a mid lane turret here for, for Gen G. Okay, Chovy realizes the folly of his ways. Like, okay, yeah, yeah. No, He's no, a no, realizer. Uh, there, there are side lanes that I do need to farm because due to his death, as well as the general level of activity on, on Genji on the map, he is actually behind pretty substantially in CS. Which is wild. Also, Keen is gone <laughs> for specifically Spirit Visage? Yeah, I don't really, really know why you would do that. Well, there has actually been, I don't know if uh, any of you have the had the opportunity to play it yet, there's been a Volibear build that uses Spirit Visage together with an Ending Despair. An ingenious hunter, very fun uh, to play, but it really synergized with his kit specifically because of the W heal as well yeah. as the shield. And I don't really feel like Spirit Fizz is going to get as much value off when you are Cassante as opposed to a champion that has it's built around healing. Yeah, uh, built around innate sustain. Uh, well, Cassante is built around everything, so maybe yeah, it's you, just know like, you know what? <laughs> you know what? And I don't think Spirit Fizz is fine. I don't think Spirit Fizz is a bad item either. I just interesting to see given... Rookern is generally better. Yes. Given how good Rookern has been, we do see Closer also is going to go for Leandris, which I'm very happy about. We we definitely have pro gamers who look at the patch notes and say, hey, that got nerfed. Bad now. Bad now. Yeah, we really have both. 100% happens. And, you know, they're, they're busy playing the game, learning about other stuff, and... Perhaps the analysts should let them know and stuff like that. I'm not saying that Keen specifically is one of those guys, but he is now going 1v3 on Cassante. Not very killable, as you guys can see, as the damage. Why did we really... ult him? Why did we ult and ignite the Cassante? Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. It's now running forward. Lahens with the engage. His mom 
will go over the top. Huge amounts of damage from both the Dragons as they take out the Nautilus and now the Poppy Clear knocks away three people. As Toby is still going into the four of them by himself, essentially. But yeah, kind of a broken up fight here from Fear X and they will just run away tails tucked. Execute investing a lot there and in general Fear X investing a lot. They're trying to kill a Cassante. Yeah, he doesn't have Koenig Rooker. Still 2-0. Still not going to end up going down, and then Gen G are actually the one pulling the trigger, which is kind of wild with a composition that has both Smolder as well as the Asol. They can just sit back, scale. Uh, we are currently looking at 194 stacks for Pace, 212 for Chovy. So Pace is approaching that point where he does become a absolute menace. As we take another look here, there's just this is that's Cassante. You can't invest that much. And given that they aren't really able to do any damage and still utilize the cooldowns, Genji's like, well, that's our opportunity to go. Even with Claire making his way into the enemy team with the cover of Knight in the form of the Paranoia, it just doesn't matter. It's too late. They don't break up the fight in time. If they're a little bit crisper on the TP timing there, if they have... I don't know, like, I don't even know, like, if you have someone who can kill King, but right now that's not really anyone. Maybe. Not gonna be the case. Genji maintaining, yeah, gold deficit, but not one that's relevant to really mention, given how these two team compositions look. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe Genji have just identified that the current meta, especially in the LCK, is pretty slow, and a lot of teams are picking these scaling picks, such as the Smolder, and are just kind of sitting back and waiting. And if they can get away with it, why not just go for multiple, right? Just pick up another dragon and go for it. It's definitely not something we see every day, but it is pretty interesting to watch because, yeah, Fearx did get a couple of early dragons. They got one Void Bub. Kind of surprised they didn't get more. And they even got early kills onto the Smolder. But what has it amounted to? You think Aso is friends with Smolder's mom? Because he is a cosmic dragon. I, don't I feel like <laughs> that might be a different thing than... Is that a conversation we should have on this broadcast? <laughs> I don't know. They're both dragons. I Well, isn't Aesol just no, kind of like the universe he's, he's or whatever? The size, yeah, he's the size of a galaxy, uh, canonically. So I, think I imagine he wouldn't be... He's probably got bothered. the size advantage and is, is probably not interested in being friends. That's my take. He doesn't seem like a very friendly guy, to be honest. Well, he's Brilliant taking soul. care of, of, of the little dragon. In this game, <laughs> I guess. Keen is just running at them. Here's Tovi also looking to run at them. Not going to get any roots as everybody does run away. And once again, it's the posture game in the middle of the lane. Zero turret in the same spot. I swear I just casted this five minutes ago. Side lanes aren't real, Valdes. We need side lanes. Let's get the turret. Hook is going to miss. And it's clear. It's oh. going to start getting burned, so we have... <laughs> Stacks. Hayes is stacking, and he's got it. He's got 225. And Jovi has the Andres as well. So clear is like, oh, I don't exist anymore. Ooh, nice hook here on the Jovi. Do they have the follow-up as they go in onto the Cassante? And the Smolder's just doing free damage on the right side of this fight here. Lahen oh. totally fine as a massive ult comes in from the side of Jovi, and everybody is just burnt to a crisp. I mean, Pace wasn't touched at all this fight. And it's just like that, they just crushed them in mid. He's full health. He's not done yet, it looks like. He wants more. He's going to flap over this wall. And Hannah, yeah, he's just executed. There he goes, 550. Even had a shutdown, because why not give extra gold to the Smolder? And that's going to be the second Chemtech Drake as well. Second Chemtech Drake going over. Smolder now fed. Aesol now fed. Gonna get the mid lane turret as well. And for Fear X, just looking at that play, you have to be the one to pull the trigger. They do when execute lands that hook onto Chovy. But you that that was after a large amount of just sitting there and like taking free poke from both Pays and Chovy. Closer has done a lot of damage to Key. He's tried. <laughs> As we take another look, so it all starts when Execute finds the hook on the Chovy. Things look not too bad initially. Will her ult? Yeah. Uh, that doesn't do a whole lot. 
And Hayes is completely unmatched. Fear X is just completely split on the call. Yeah. Uh, there's there's just like three separate fights happening at the same time. If they hard commit, then maybe. But also, Chovy being the one initially engaged on into him, then getting knocked away by the ultimate, it just feels a bit anti-synergistic. And against Genji, I don't think you can afford to make mistakes like that. It looks like Hannah might actually go for the uh, Black Cleaver Zeri build that we've been seeing pop up. Might be... And no hex plates on that team, even though it's good on Nocturne and Zeri. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, opting into other items. I think the Zeri build is fine. Just the, the Nocturne one is still getting to me. But... Uh, he is building the good items after that. Yeah. At least. True. It's very tanky. Yeah, I, to be honest, I feel like Clear doesn't look very comfortable on the Poppy. Oh, I agree. In general, I, it's his first game this season, and I think it was a team call. They're like, okay, this is pretty good into Cassante in the lane. Can you play it? And he said yes, but probably, you know, as we've seen, just didn't look very comfortable in lane. The ults have been a bit off. Um, yeah, it, it's not all his fault. I don't want to put all the blame on Clear or anything like that. Also, they're playing against Gen.G, so... It's kind of difficult to uh, really criticize at all as Closer is trying to take out Jovi. He does an insane amount of damage and he oh! will take him out and immediately gets executed by a little baby dragon. It's actually Jovi that got the kill. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't... What? I, I, I don't know. I, I assume it was the burn. I was just Leanne calling Aurelian really Soul a little baby dragon. Well, if you're the size of multiple galaxies, then he kind of is. Why are they in mid? Uh, you know what? Why not? Uh, nice little ult comes in from Execute. Now they're trying to get onto that back line. Do they have enough to get Paze out of this fight? This time the ult is good onto Canyon. But they don't actually do any damage to Paze. He's once again fine. He flashes away from Willer. And the follow-up was just not there as Willer is burning down. He will not get executed, but Canyon will finish the job. And there it is. Clean from Canyon's Lee Sin. And that right there is a really good example of why Genji in particular, it makes perfect sense for them to prioritize this smolder. The way that this team plays around their AD carry, I think is the best that we have in our league. And they're at worst the second best team. At worst. I mean, 2-1 plays pretty well around carry. Uh, yeah, very good point, actually. But... Tank W. Um. <laughs> Pace doesn't have sums. Maybe that's enough this time around, but Willer isn't here. I don't know if they can do this. Clear needs to find a really yeah. big ultimate. They're going to try, and let's see how it goes. Willer, he could just get on in, and nope. Doesn't uh, get into the pit at all. And yeah, he's, he's not even here. Um, Clear is going to go down, and yeah, Genji just going to press their buttons on the Fear X, who were desperate to try to get in there. Henna will take out one. They're struggling to get on top of this Zeri, actually, who did get a big ult is kind of ice skating around everybody, but you can't deal with four champions on top of you. And that will be the end of that fight. Pace doesn't up going down. Hannah trying his hardest, but it just isn't enough. Fair X looking rough here. Lost the Baron. As we take another look at this play, they, I imagine they are trying to contest the vision on the Baron, but it just doesn't really quite work out. And it's... Only Execute that is able to actually go in here to get a whiff Willer. The rest of the front line of Gen G is just keeping everyone at arm's length. No one is allowed to touch the little baby dragon. And then we get to this point where they are eventually able to take down Willer. That by itself, not the end of the world, but then they start with the Baron. And you already see like the health bars are so low here for Fear X. Closer is trying to do as much as he can, but Clear can barely approach due to the zone control that ASOL provides. And then on the counterplay here, just a lot of damage. Genji doesn't have to go for this. Canyon flash ulting in. Pays. Walks up a little bit close to Zeri. Does have to pay with his life, but that's the end of it, right? Execute ends up going down. Hannah makes it look exciting for just a little bit, but Kang is able to get on top. That's Baron buff gone. That is the gold lead now very firmly in favor of Jinji as they pick up the third Drake. And that is probably the end of the game, Veldas. Yeah, it's looking pretty likely. Jinji, they cross their T's, dot their I's. We have 330 stacks here on the Smolder. And I'm sure at least over 200 for Jovi, probably even more than that at this point. As he's got that empowered ult just ready 
and waiting to go for the push. They still have Baron here for about 45 seconds. As you see, a massive jump in gold at about 24 minutes and then at about 27 minutes. A couple of big team fights won by the side of Gen G around the middle of the map. And now they're looking to win yet another one, this time inside the base of Fear X, but not even going to overstay their welcome. Just not feeling very pressured to get the job done just yet. And they have nowhere to go. Like, Fear X have nowhere to go. Gen G are not in a rush. They can just sit there and siege. Their poke is always going to win out. And it's up to Fear X to actually make a big engage happen. But now with these... Or with the pressure rather that's available to Gen G by virtue of this Baron. <laughs> we're starting to see like just a Q here. Fear got hit by a, a smolder Q. Yep. That's unfortunate. Shouldn't have done that. As, oh no, don't try to collapse with Cassante. That, that, no, 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 Guys, no, he, he no, has, let it go! He has Unstoppable, it allows him to not be CC'd by anything. Ah, um, uh, yeah. You so, know his health? Azir ult doesn't work on him if he's in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think they're just very desperate at this point, and... Yeah, probably probably not the right call, but they didn't want to fight this group of Gen.G members either. So, they elect to at least push Keen out of the mid lane for just a moment in time. The inhibitor goes down. Baron buff not needed for this line of play. Genji are really playing it slow and steady. They're not 162 stacks on Trovi, actually. Yeah, they're not really taking any big risks as we do take a look. Yeah, the top lane gap in this one quite substantial. And I'm kind of wondering, if I remember correctly, back when Clear did look at his best, which was in 2022 together with Peach, and June, Clutter, uh, and Seta was often a carry player and actually did quite well in that. I do think that in these tank versus tanks up in particular, we meme about them a lot, but when you do start falling behind, I do think that it becomes very, very unplayable very quickly because of the lead that your opponent will get. Wonder if they want to try and put clear on a carry, but I also simultaneously understand, like a Gwen would be something that comes to mind. Do you really want to put a inexperienced player against key with all the risks at all associated with that. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, do you want to put anyone against key? You, you kind of have to. Where is Dove, man? Yeah. Dove would play a zero top into the Cassante and he would make it work. Perfect pass the keen test. He did. He was able to do that. He, he did. Lo he looks good in that lane, you know, Santa Nautilus aside. Yeah. Perfect, I think, has really been impressing us. Even though today, obviously, he wasn't able to really make it work. Still had a good laning phase in both games. Genji have decided uh, that they have waited enough time to uh, <laughs> to go in for this one. Ult away on the canyon once again. They're trying to kill Cassante. This time, they have an insane amount of damage. Nobody's helping out. Come on! Hill is running away. Yes! They finally get him. Another press of the R buttons on a Jovi who is isolated, but he is able to dash away as well. Massive ult! It's all four of them in the back line! And the damage should be there from Pays as well to finish this one off. Even has an arm guard just to survive Give it to at the him. very end. The Penta, let the little baby dragon get his Penta. Let him have it. Not the minion! No, they're slowing him down. <laughs> the zoom in, the Q comes in, it's a Penta! For the little baby dragon, pays well done. And smiles on the faces of Gen G. Fear X, they gotta try something, but it just wasn't enough, even without Canyon there and Keen getting blown up. They had to invest so much. And all they got was killing Cassante. Not going to be enough. Gen G take a deserved 1 0 victory here in the first game. Slow and steady wins the race. The two dragons, the double dragon, coming out here to get the job done for Gen G. I wonder who won in stacks at the end of that one. Because we saw Chovy was at like 360-ish for that final push, but then Pays finished with about 400. Yeah, after that fight, I'd be leaning towards Pays just because he got so much stacks from killing everyone. But I don't know if we'll know. Maybe the space can enlighten us. We do need to know who won the dragon stacking fight. I do yes. think that's important. Very important. And I'm sure we'll uh, we'll hear eventually. As big focus on pace, he did pick up the Penta. I probably wouldn't vote for him for POG personally. I, I, but I, I did not. I do feel bad about my vote. 
Because you know you know why I felt this. You voted for Cassante. I voted for Cassante. I think it's fair on this game. Yeah, I, 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 he did really well. Two dragons, they they farmed, they did boom boom damage, <laughs> they and did then Keen kind of just manhandled everyone in the game and just ran at them. He did die at the end, but that's just you know putting his body on the line to help out his team. Either way, guys, we're done with game number one. We'll have a break in the space afterwards. We'll be right back. ペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタルペンタ
Welcome back to The Space, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Atlas, joined by Huni and Wolf as we dive into the breakdown of game number one between Gen G and Fear X. This one, you know, started off a little bit messy, but I think, like, how do you mess up Double Dragon, gentlemen? Like, I, I feel like this, this whole Double Dragon idea, pretty ridiculous. Like, this time Smolder's got a dragon to look up to? Even understands who to emulate, who to build stacks after? I mean, I think it took a little bit of time. They had to blow on the Super Nintendo cartridge to make sure <laughs> Double Dragon was going to work in this one, but I, I, they eventually got it done. Um, I, I just want to give shout-outs to Fear X's Raft because I actually think it was a pretty good one. Nautilus early. Going Zeri into Smolder actually feels really good because there are times in the game before Smolder is really fully online where Zeri could have a strong mid-game, and if she gets accelerated, she can absolutely crush the Smolder in team fights. And then the Nocturne pick is really nice here because it's going to allow you to potentially pick the Smolder in team fights in sides. The Aurelian Solo is going to be vulnerable. The Poppy was the one part that didn't really work out very well, and I think this is just because it's Clear's first professional game he's ever played on Poppy. Landing phase a little bit weak. His ult timings and, and the choices of how he ulted were a little bit off, so obviously needs a little bit more experience there, but everything else about this draft, I really liked for Fear X. I mean, 100% really agree. Like, it's just like, thing is, like, they re it really desynced between the 4-5, like, when they have a Nocturne, like, the reason why I think Fear X in this game, like, it was, like, really kind of frustrating to watch it, because even though they have a lead, they couldn't really accelerate the, the game, because, like, they, they, they were, like, really weak at just playing at the side map, which, even though they have a really strong in the four member, but, but but they, it's just like the Nocturne and Poppy. I mean, sure, like Poppy could kind of pressure, but I think if he was a better or like has a better choice, I think it would have been just like more silent pushers, right? Like there is a, you know, Nar, there could be like any, like other split pushers, but the Nocturne would have been like, could be easier to play the map. Yeah. Um, but despite that, things went relatively well in the early stages of the game for Fear X, and we wanted to highlight it. This dive actually working out very well to start us off. There were some really good plays here for Fearx, and they were able to be proactive. And once again, Willer is just such a quintessential part of this roster, making plays in the early game, just making sure that they can get early leads here. And uh, overall, also, I would say some mistakes on the side of Genji. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, I think that Genji, like, obviously, as we kind of highlighted, like, from the draft, they do have a double stacker. It's an only game. Like, they have to be way more cautious. Like, Getting the vision and actually using this type of the path, like taking the risk, it's really unnecessary. And also, lane phase was a way just spicy for sure. I mean, also, I think I'll, I'll like to shout out to FRX the like they kind of play really well trying to make like volatile on the lane phases, like, so make sure the wheeler can actually jump in, like if there is an opportunity. And I think it's like it was like really fitted. That's why in the composition that when they have to get accelerated early lead, it's just like at the, it's just hitting the middle game, they just have to be more, you know, had a, has a better clear plan. Yeah, a little bit more proactive, perhaps, push these advantages a little bit more. But unfortunately, Keen got back-to-back -back solo kills on the top side of the map, so there was a big gap in what FearX were trying to do, just given the fact that the Poppy was so far behind. And that kind of leads us towards our next highlight, because we feel like this was where the game just kind of was over. I mean, notice that Execute, I mean, Execute is the type of player who will make plays like this, but he just kind of instantly goes in and looks for the ult. And at the same time, Clear drops his ult on top, so even though they have a pretty decent engage here, as you can see, they're waiting for opportunities, waiting for opportunities, executes fishing for the hook, and then eventually he decides to go in here, and Chovy is knocked away by Clear's ultimate, and so the follow-up is really tough, and gets the hook here, waits for his opportunity, drops the ult instantly, but then Clear pushes those targets away as the ultimate drops down, and this fight gets super awkward here, because unfortunately for the side of Firex, they still have to deal with this Cassante, and he is just too big. And Jovi, he could just return to the fight and drop a massive ultimate. Yeah, I mean, it's just like it was kind of really unfortunate. Like, probably he wasn't really actually aiming the the two member that who actually got engaged on. But I think it, as a result, I think it was like really, really, you know, bad timing. At the same time, like bad aim. Like, just target was like target selection was a really, really poor. But I mean, it's just like thing is like the. It's already bad shape for the VRX that they were not able to accelerate the game. And this is the thing, like when they're when you are at the other positions, like sure, like sometimes we suggest is like actually play really strong early game. But this is the problem. It's really tough to pl uh, play like accelerate the lead against a great team, greater team rather. And even though you play for scale, a lot of time you just lose the game at 10 minutes. So it's a tough 
tough situation, I'll say. Yeah, a lot of extra pressure as well when that is on you. But we did have the casters ask for a bit of a stack count, and it was neck and neck. At the end of the last team fight, Aurelian Soul, 391, and Smolder was 394. But as you just saw, Chovy murdered some minions under the Nexus. So at the very end, 400 stacks for Aurelian Soul, 396. Clean for play. the Smolder. Denies pays the stacks really quickly there. You know, Pace got a uh, pentakill, but we know what really matters here. Exactly right. And it's about the celestial being, you know, the size of a universe. And I think that, you know, thematically it makes sense that Aurelian Soul has a couple more. Let's jump into our uh, POG as Keen. We'll pick it up on the Cassante back to back solo kills in lane, and honestly, he was the rock for the team, even holding strong in the early stages. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of scared. There's a, there was a decent chance that he might get up robed because the pays got the pentacle at the end. Yeah. But I'm really happy that he actually got the POG because like he bought it so much time for the team that get these double kill. It makes really impossible to play for Fiorax to play the map, and also like it's just I mean it's just Cassante in lane double kill in the lane. It, it's gonna it never gonna fold out. Yeah. No. I mean. Let's see who's exposed. Yeah. Who's exposed? Yeah. All right. Observer, Vietnamese cast, two media, right media. We knew that one was coming, but center media. Yeah, center media, I feel center like, media. was uh, on the up and up uh, recently. So this is a little bit of a, a faltering, but that's okay. Not everyone can be perfect. It is now time for us to throw it back to Valtez and Chronicler as we dive into game number two. Thank you, Spacers, for that wonderful breakdown, especially the stack segment. I'm glad we got to see that Chovy, at the end of the day, is the better stacker of numbers and number go up champions. Uh, although he did get fewer uh, pentakills in that game, I suppose. Firex have gone for red side for game number two, which they just played on and is generally not as popular as blue nowadays. I am a bit baffled by that, Veldas. Yes, Genji had some fun in the last draft. They went for double dragon. One can only hope that one day we will see the illustrious triple dragon where we do add Shivana. Well, you said Shivana's not really a No, I, I, okay, we will, we'll go back to this conversation because I do have very strong thoughts on this. But right now, I don't think we're going to see that again. I think Genji was taking some silly risks and they didn't really play that game out with the highest level of respect. I want to see Firex punish them. I want to see teams get punished when they play sloppily. And I'm worried after game one that that isn't going to happen. Smolder does get banned away, which is a big win. Varus is the obvious next AD carry to be picked up here. Oriana is open. Azir is open. Chofi will just be picking up the Azir here. Makes a face because he has to play Azir <laughs> again. He looks particularly annoyed today. <laughs> By that, but maybe just some dry eyes. Um, yeah, first pick is here, is back, apparently. Generally, teams weren't doing this because there were a lot of counter picks to it, and Closer is definitely a guy that can pick up a bunch of those counters. But Azir just very strong in the meta right now, and a lot of teams are having success with it, so it's back in that first pick on blue side kind of position. Nautilus Varus available in the trade if they want it, they'll take the Nautilus first. Maybe a Cassante pick away here, put Claire on something he's more comfortable with. And make sure that Execute has a target that he can go in on. Because I want this man to say no to the voice inside the head that says hook the target that is in front of me. But I don't think he will. I think he will keep hooking. And as long as he does, should make sure that at least whatever he can hook is a good target. Not going to be the case here as Zeri picked up for pace this time around. I, Hanna actually had probably the best game of anyone on Fear X. It just didn't really matter at all. Uh, I guess Wheeler had some good moments, but really did feel like his build wasn't <laughs> really what we were looking for. That is Spell that is a close. That's a closer pick. That is a clear pick, and it does really feel in line with what we identified as a key problem in these drafts before the Senna issue showed up. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Uh, red side third pick, it gives you an opportunity now to ban certain things away, such as top TF into the Cassante. Like Udir, probably? Yeah, could definitely see it. Sejuani going to be taken away here. Willer might get targeted even further. 
deny him the opportunity to synergize too well with some of this engage to come through. Both Cassante and Nautilus have been a lot of that. So the final ban is here from Fear X. So Willer had a lot to say about it. And so it will be the Poppy ban, which could also be for the top lane in response to the Cassante, as we saw uh, Fear X do in game one. Really is a double whammy because Poppy and Azir is also a combo that a lot of mid jungle duos like to play. If it doesn't get picked on R4, I imagine Canyon is just going to play Lee again. And that, that'll be the end of it. Final ban here. Maokai does feel in line with a lot of these tank junglers, but no. They don't care about the Silas, which is interesting given that it was hovered by Fear X. But it is closer, so if you ban Silas, he probably just goes Yone or might go for a Akali instead. And in that light, I do like the Sejuani ban, because whatever closer we'll pick, it's probably going to be melee. And you don't want to give over too much synergy with the Permafrost. Nocturne again. I'm going to bring it back. And it's pretty interesting. I. I like to better into the smolder. Yeah. But again, I'm, I'm kind of personally uh, pretty high on the Nocturne in, in terms of where I think it should be picked. But I mean, he had a decent game on it outside of Ulting Cassante that one time. We saw the value that it has, and he's going to run it back. Lee Udir, call of the day. It's not exciting, but it'll get the job done. Or Vein Top. I don't even know if that's exciting. I don't even know if Vayne is, is, is the angle there. Quinn? <laughs> no, it's Udyr. Yeah. I want to go back to Double Dragon, Veldes. What is... Th oh, we didn't even talk about Talia. Uh, what? I, I, I mean, I just didn't expect Closer to play Yeah, it. no, we know why we didn't... <laughs> yeah, we... we First we didn't time Talia this season. Talk about Talia, because Closer... You can argue that he hasn't had the greatest split, that he hasn't really been able to have the impact on a lot of his comfort picks. Closer on Magus, outside of Azir, has just never really been it. And Talia does really fall within that realm. Yeah. I mean, you definitely do have pretty intense dive potential with Talia Nocturne and potential to just affect a lot of the map in terms of they don't have globals per se, but very long range ultimates where you can join into fights from very far away before your opponents, and you can go together. So maybe looking to get some uh, value down on the bottom side of the map. I wouldn't mind trying to see them set up some dives down there. They certainly have the comp for it. I just hope that the lane isn't boom right from the get-go. You know what I mean? <laughs> because Asking uh, a lot there, Valdez. Especially for the mid lane. That's going to be a big one. Because you have to have some control there if you are going to set up plays like I just mentioned. We're going to see Genji again go for scaling. But last game, they had a scaling composition, and they stayed on basically even until they stomped Ferex down. See, Ferex this time can put up more of a fight. I certainly hope so for the fourth game so far tonight as we do hop onto the rift for game number two. All right, here we go, game number two. And so far today, it has been a bit one-sided in a lot of our games. Yeah. I hope that this one can be a bit closer. How are you feeling? Please no. <laughs> Don't flip the game level one. Uh, okay, well, they're going to do it. Flash on in from the hands as he gets the Q onto multiple closer in a lot of trouble here. And the flash comes forward. Toby picks up first blood. Remember that mid lane I was just talking about? Looks like it's going to go pretty heavily in favor of Gen G this time around. And so there you go. Just trying to get some aggressive, or rather Gen G as a team to be all there. And they get punished for it. And this is something that Udyr can do, uh, just be very annoying to the enemy jungler. Uh, but Firex are able to support Willer very nicely. All right, pack it up, Velvis. What? No, 
I'm not. I, hey, they, they didn't need the. Why would you flip the game level one? You don't need to. I mean, it's pretty common to see teams go in there as a, a set of like three or four to try to get a ward in at like one minute, one minute 15. Yeah, but I think they knew. I think they knew they were getting into a fight. They certainly kind of checked it half heartedly. And then. It's like, I know we have to do this. Yeah. A multi man knockoff there from Lahens being the big difference maker. And things right now. Hey, he doesn't have flash. Oh. A lot of damage. And uh, obviously only has his E, so can't really hear, uh, hit Lahens as much as I ideally would like to. But so some early lane in control. And given how the situation played out, Chovy, until he actually backs, will not be able. Ooh. As that, that hook, that could have been. Really big. Pace does as well if summoners available, but getting those would be huge. Oh, no. Oh, execute. You don't have a flash. Yeah. This aggressive trading. Uh, they're beginning to see it. Oh, that was pretty cute. I don't know if it's going to matter as execute is just dead. Okay, Canyon clears the bottom side of his jungle, hits level three, goes bot. With all the pressure they were putting on, Tenjiri able to punish them. And the worst thing here is that normally you would be at risk of your topside jungle getting invaded because they knew Wailer started on topside and Nocturne his uh, clear is so fast. Realistically, he's always going to be on the opposite side of, or on the same side of the map rider, but not near your play. As we do take a look at this, now, I do think it's important to note that this five game loss streak does involve a whole lot of call me. So I don't want to draw too Also two games of BDD though. That is true, yeah. But it was uh, against T1. One of them, at least. Yeah, the other one was against Hava, I think? As we do take another look here, in theory, I do think the level one isn't too bad. You have Talia with the repeated damage. Noxon's passive is quite strong. And here, Execute, the hook, unfortunately, doesn't, you know, stop Lahans in his tracks, but instead hooks him into the middle of three people. And he dies. Yeah. I feel like, you know, maybe you can hook the wall, but it's kind of an awkward angle there that's pretty sharp that maybe you don't quite get the hook into the wall Where you're is looking a level for. Up? Yeah, and he's about to find out that Canyon is here. And Canyon just hops the wall. <laughs> Nearly kills Closer. I think if that Q lands, he goes in there. Closer doesn't have flash. If Closer doesn't have E, he would, yeah. I'd probably kill him. He'll die, but it'll be funny and definitely worth it. <laughs> Okay, he should not be able to get this. Surely. Yeah, he's gonna get it. If, no, he's fine. No, he's yeah. not. And he denies the Q. Tovi's here, but he's like, huh. Not much I can do about this, I guess. Wheeler, man, he's trying. <laughs> he really is. Yeah. Kane's only level three. Does actually have to pay for that invade with a lot of experience and his uh, jungle clear. Gonna be pretty substantial fine. Maybe a window for Willer, Valdez. When he hits level six, he still didn't go Ultimate Hunter, but he can make it, he can make it work. It could happen this time, right? Yeah, uh, oh. I don't think they saw Canyon here. Closer is in potentially the worst spot against this. He does have his flash in a second, and he does barely get it, as meanwhile on the top side, clear. Is going to survive here. Fear comes down on Akeen. He's in some trouble, but he is Udir. He gets the stun oh. down, and he just runs it off. He even gets hit by the Q. Doesn't care. Here oh comes God. Canyon, and he's going to let them go. Not quite going to chase on that one, and that's just fine. This is his Q on the minions. They needed that. They needed that kill really badly. I don't even think it matters that much. Obviously, it's good if Willa gets an early kill, but the flash being invested. And the, the, the runoff effect of this is huge as well, because it means that Wheeler had to back. It means that Canyon gets to pick up these early Void Grubs and also sets in on a little bit of a better path when it comes to experience. Still going to be behind, but at the very least, we'll be able to generate some objectives for his team as we take another look here. Hey, the up, double up? cookie ends up being huge here. Just the right amount of health. Oh, it's actually, it's the positioning from Widow there as well, really cute actually. He's saying that he lives. Yeah, making sure that he tries to guide him upwards, but just isn't enough. Double cookie, actually making the difference there. Yeah, one of the one of the few times where it really does come down to just that extra bit of 
missing health and mana. Health especially. Uh, Cannon able to get the three Void Pups and get the Raptors again away from Willer. Nocturne certainly loves his Raptors, and he's been denied those a couple of times. Definitely very annoying, if nothing else, as Willer is still ahead 11 CS in this game. Should be able to hit level 6 on this red, I would imagine, and then we'll see where he wants to go. Not top. Let, let top go. It's, it's okay. Really, realistically, a lot of the lanes feel quite bad to try and gank. The best one is probably mid. If you can find a combo, uh, oh, clear. Uh, find a combo together with Closer. And you can obviously spell shield the ultimate from Jovi. So that is quite nice. But top side or bot side, very hard. Seri is extremely slippery. You already mentioned it. But I think even more so than the Smolder is, as long as you're near any form of terrain. And then there's also Alistair. And then top lane is. Yeah, don't don't try to gank the U there. Yeah. Just accept what is happening. Yeah, Willer got level six and he did not go top. So he, he knows. He knows. He knows. I go bot lane. Maybe a jungle play, but I think mid or bot is most likely. Maybe collapse together with execute to try and regain some control in this game. <laughs> There's like I just wanted to kill you, man. I'm sorry. Uh, it looks like this dragon. No, not quite. We do have the bottom lane roaming up from the side of Firex. And Willer is here. Ward is going to spot him. Closer here as well. Wouldn't mind it if Firex start up this objective. Claire just not having a great time. Even without the kill going over to Keen early on. Still doing great as the hook. Yeah, and the chains of corruption as well. Lahens is only level 4. He has to flash away. And now... It does move on over to Pace, who does proc his ult. He's trying to take this fight, but the Nocturne is right here, and Pays is free food. That's a double kill. As now Canyon comes in, he'll pick up a kill himself. He's looking for Execute, but with the Nocturne behind him, he's just going to let it go. Big mistake from the bot lane there as Wheeler gets out as well, because they knew that Nocturne was on the bottom half of the map, going to be looking for an ultimate. Still took the fight in the... 2v2 troubles of Lance and Pace do continue. Lance is the one. If you have ult and you get hooked there, it doesn't matter at all. There's no follow-up. But level 4, definitely can't afford to have that happen. That's a kill, and that keeps the dream for Firex alive. As Jovi <laughs> doesn't care. Jovi's like, I knew I was going to get stunned, so I just dashed into him anyway. Got the shield. Worth. Somehow won the trade. Got this plant. Willer is here. What are your thoughts on plant? The, the healing plant is fine. Yeah? Okay. I mean, I like the plant, but... I don't know, maybe you had a strong opinion to it one way or another. Yeah, certain plants, not a big fan of. Well, I know you hate blast plants. Yes. Uh, here's Closer. Well, Hens is in a lot of trouble. He doesn't have flash this time around. Yeah, he's just dead. That's going to go the way of Henna. As this is what I was talking about, trying to make plays on the bottom side of the map with Closer and Willer. We're getting it done. Big impact there from Closer with his ultimate make his way towards the bottom half of the map. That should possibly secure them. The objective here, hopefully, will be able to get themselves a dragon. Still no dragon being taken. It's quite remarkable, really. It's been a while, but it looks like they don't want to take the risk, and that is a bit of a missed opportunity. Ideally, I would like them to try and get at least some of these objectives, but not going to be the case, whereas Canyon is going to pick up the next three grubbies. Now they go. It's a little late. The Void Bobbies. The Kevins. Yeah. The Gentlemen. Mm. And they finally have this Chemtech Drake going down. So no Chemtech Soul this time around. Could still be Ocean Soul. As this is the first hook onto the Hens. And it was already an issue from here, especially because the chain's over to Paze, and he gets stuck in this as well with a Nocturne on the bottom side of the map. And then in that 2v2, they feel pretty confident because Canyon is nearby, but Canyon doesn't get to join the fight enough. in the same way that Willer does. Take another look here. Uh, oh, okay. Stop it, stop it, it's not. And in a funny way, the flash from Paze actually helps him out a little bit. Um, because I think otherwise he might have had to walk over. Please, please, please. Oh, I 
That's all he was saying there. Lahenz is like staring at a level 6 Nautilus with no flash. It's like, I bet I can take him. Well, you cannot, Lions. Ends up going down. Nice roam from Closure with the loss of his mana, making that impact in the bottom half of the map. Right now, you know, Fear X, they're only 1k gold down. They have a well scaling composition. Willow is fed again. There's a possibility here, though. And he has a stri uh, Stride Breaker. Yeah, well, that's not great. I didn't want to mention that. I would rather have him use his gold for good items, but what are you going to do? Yeah, it is uh, It is an option. Definitely makes him um, a bit stickier, I suppose. But either way, able to I, pick that one up. I just like the movement speed from x Blade so much. I know I'm talking to and you. And the ultimate haste. Yeah. But he is, he is also not going ultimate hunter, so maybe his call is just that. I'm not about that. <laughs> Which I'm Nocturne's not about his ult, you yeah, know? Like, exactly. whatever. He doesn't really it's like need playing, that. playing Fiddlesticks and be like, nah. Yeah. I don't need that. I do think, though, that maybe he has identified that, okay, well, these, these the meta, the LCK, whatever you want to say, is pretty slow in general, so perhaps I don't need my ults off cooldown as often as like solo queue or other regions and he says well i'd rather put those points into something else um it's definitely non-standard nocturne uh thought process you could say but willer is uh owning it for two games in a row owning the thought process not the game um <laughs> well, I, just to be clear you know you individually know? i think he's played two good games this doesn't really matter that much mm -hmm. And while the lead for Fearx in the jungle is looking pretty good, Kane does also have two kills, which means that he's not that far behind. And this is a very, very important fight here for Fearx. Or rather, the fight that ends up coming in about two minutes when we look towards the second dragon. I don't think you want to go scaling against Gen.G. And last game, it was mostly a compositional thing where they were severely outranged. In this one, it's more just about the form of these two teams. Genji and team fights are a very, very tough nut to crack. They are really, really strong on these classic front to backs. And this comp has it all. Two tanks, great engage, great disengage, and two hyper carries. Pays knew he was in there and he's just running straight at him, saying, okay, no, we take this fight. And Keen is quite tanky. He is going to avoid the chains as well. And now looking to potentially turn this, but again, no need to really force this one. Trying to just posture around the Rift Herald. As Paze really wanted to make it clear that uh, Willer was not allowed to stand in that brush. Let it be known that Paze is not afraid. That is his brush. He's also playing Zeri, so it's not exactly fair. No, that that's the reason why I think the Stride Breaker into Smaller made a bit more sense. I feel like with Zeri in particular, the window that you have is so small due to the way your dash works. I think with Smolder sometimes you can actually find a way to do some meaningful damage early on, but yeah, we saw their pace. As long as he stays near a wall, should be good to go. So Canyon, after that posturing from Perex, just gets a free Herald, which should lead yeah. to the first turret blood. Genji, the pace, not the highest. You know, not, not breakneck, but at any point now, they're going to start accelerating, Veldas, as they always do. Between, like, 15 and 25 minutes, you feel like it's an even game, and then they have, like, an 8k gold lead in the game. Too. <laughs> and it's not a, it's not exciting, but it gets the job done. I mean, their team fighting is very solid. See that Keen here? He's just trying to get Demolish Prox. He is going to take out the entire turret. Just that one minion tanking one turret shot is all he needed. And he picks up the turret after... Long, hard-fought battle in the top lane between those two. Uh, the Udyr is 10 CS ad as well. He is farming it up pretty nicely. And somehow Keen will find a way to make that Udyr very relevant. Whereas in many games in the past, we've seen Udyr just kind of runs around faster and is more annoying. I, I do have faith that Keen can get something done with that uh, slight top lane lead he has. Yeah, we really went... Oh. Double TP coming in here. Spirit Visage done for clear. That's his only item. <laughs> yeah. Both of these guys cannot be killed. Although the heavy indexing into magic resistance is noted. It's, here on it's the side good, of clear. 
I, it, it is good in this scenario. Zeri does a lot of magic damage. Chovy is one of your biggest threats. Also looks like he's going for maybe Lich Bane second. Yeah. So not going to be feeling too bad about the fact that you have Merc Treads as well as his Spirit Visage because Canyon's damage not really expected to go towards you, but they do need him to actually be in the front line and tank. This is where I foresee some issues for Fear X. Yep. Don't forget the huge amount of magic damage from Udir. Act I mean, yeah, it is a lot. He didn't build a Leandris. Um, we do have an ult on two ults into Udir. And a hook comes down, and Keen is actually in a bit of trouble. Yeah. And there you go. Didn't even have ghosts. I mean, he just gets CC to death. Meanwhile, Canyon is charging through everybody. And he's just going to turn around as he doesn't want to be isolated behind their enemy lines. As the hook is going to go astray. Q comes in from Canyon, immediately gets stunned up here. He's in trouble, actually, but the damage is coming in from the side of the Zeri. But that's a kill now on the Canyon and Fear X. 5v3 should be able to get this one done. That's a kill now on to Jovi. As Paige is like, man, I was playing this one out, but my teammates just disappeared one by one. All went in as Paze. Oh, doesn't have to use the summoners. There are some good sidesteps from the Zeri. But it ends, or it starts rather, with King dying. It feels a bit questionable. Oh, boy. He didn't really, yeah. Uh, That's he, Lethality Varus. He would have died. He would have 100% died, yeah. Really not afraid there from the young AD carry on Gen G. But. This is a classic tank thing where you're like, no, I actually cannot die. And like, generally, you don't, but if you have three people wailing away at you, eventually you will. And crucially, actually collapsing on this, I think, is hard because three of the members of Gen.G are on the other end. This is where the vision plays a huge role. I think Keen didn't expect three people to be there, so just ends up going down. And you can never win in these type of broken up skirmishes into a Nocturne. That play... It's a mistake from Keen. He oversteps into limited vision. And then the follow-up. Well, is that part big was issue. like, yeah, that part was kind of whatever, but Canyon going in here thinks he has the angle. And, and, and I can only assume that he gets hit by like the one stone. Yeah. That he can go for a big play. But taking that risk is just wholly unnecessary. When Keen was already about to come up. Yeah, I, I think it's just disrespectful. I it mean, is. Genji, they yeah. didn't they didn't have to do that, but they were just like, you know what? We're we'll better, send it. We're better than these guys. Let's just take the 4v5. There's a lot of cooldowns down, and they just sent it. And Fear X were like, no, you know what? We'll stand up to you guys. Look at that. And now the game is very even. We've got a fed Henna. We have Willer on two kills. We have Clears not that far behind, and he's Cassante. Uh, Fear X have put themselves now in a position where they could potentially come back in this game. They weren't that far behind either, so a team fight like that has got to feel very nice for them. Important to note, as well as that it's Hextech, and Hextech to Leah, Hextech Nocturne, Hextech Lefel Viveris, hmm. really, really tough to deal with. The amount of slowing and damage that it is going to come out of that soul if Fear X can keep stacking is going to be big. It is important to note, though, and I think it's justified that we're criti uh, critical of Gen G because that was just a really bad play that it didn't need to go for. They're still even in gold. And they do have a composition that ends up scaling very, very well. Hayes is approaching his third, or rather has just finished his second item. Should be approaching his third relatively soon with how much resources he's getting. Jovi is coming up on his second as well. Huh. Abyssal Mask Nocturne. Wait, Nocturne? No, uh, uh, no Nautilus, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I, I, I don't hate it. I feel like I it, do. It, it would be okay. You know what? <laughs> Let me. If, if he had the Udir, I actually, I actually, I think it's good. But he doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't have Udir. So, if you want to go for something that gives you a lot of MR, I do think that Broken is still the way to go. As opposed to Abyssal. Yeah. I guess he feels I mean, like his own damage plus closest damage is going to be more useful, but. We'll see uh, how much value he's able to get out of it. I'm sure the space will take a closer look at it as well. Yeah. We've been seeing a lot cool. more people building it recently. So maybe just as a whole, people are seeing it more often. They're like, huh, maybe this item should be built more often. And, and players are taking opportunities to build it themselves. I, yeah, I, I do agree. I think if you're going to go for a straight up MR item, just go for that. I'm not really sure that they need the extra I, I, Shred. 
Although I'm like he's wondering. not going to be building a lot of shred, so maybe that's part of it as well. Maybe even Force of Nature is, is, is better. Which I don't know about. Force of Nature is not in the best of spots right now. Is Ulchovi. They're playing I it. feel like they're purposely playing on the edge. Yeah. They're like limit testing. Yeah, let me feel something. Hey, Peace. They're trying to force your summoners, man. It's not using them. Yeah. Henna just, uh, he threw out an ult and then didn't really, I guess his Q was off cooldown immediately, so just not really able to put any more damage into that one. Keeps him at bay, at least. I suppose Henna's ult has got a pretty low cooldown. Imagine if Keen actually did go Leandris, which I know isn't real the LCK, but he's doing this much damage to Claire, who is spamming MR items without any AP. Well, he's Doran's ring, I guess, but that doesn't really count. Yeah, could be nice. I mean, he is going to be supremely tanky. But, uh... He will. As we do know, eventually, Cassante becomes a bit more obnoxious, whereas Udyr is like, yeah, he's unkillable, but is he doing what Cassante's doing in late game team fights? Not really. It's not really nearly as obnoxious as uh, Clear will be on the Cassante. A big fight coming up here. For Gen G, this is a necessity. I don't think you can give over Hextech Soul Point. And this time around, they need to be more crisp on their execution. Otherwise, Fear X might bring us to a game three. Uh, Willard, pretty far forward. Don't really need to be that close to press your alt button, but, <laughs> you know, just landing some cues. Clear covering the flanks, which is very nice to see. And the vision advantage is going to be in Gen G's favor that they clear out this mid wave and they have position in this uh, <laughs> jungle uh, brush just now coming in from behind here as Keen is running straight at that back line he's being shredded pretty effectively he gets peered down here and oh. down he will go as Keen again he thinks he's unkillable but we know he is very killable as now Lahens in a really rough spot himself he's gonna go down as well and now Gen G, they're going to get hooked here. Jovi is going to be taking huge amounts of damage from Henna, who just flashes away and breaks the ankles of Jovi. But here is Zeri and Lee Sin. Can they do it? 2v3. Pace trying to kite here against a Cassante. It's not quite going to work as he does get knocked up and Fear X destroy them in the fight. And that is a huge win for Fear X. They set themselves up for Soul Point. They take down the Zeri. And they might bring us to a game for even a single win. Want to reiterate, would be big here for Fear X, even if they don't end up taking the series. Just getting a win is going to make such a big difference when it comes to that playoff spot. They're already trailing by seven games to DK. So game score is everything. And here, this is the power of paranoia. It just feels disjointed. Keen is in by himself, but the rest of the team, yes, some of this zoning is due to the fact oh. that Claire is running around, but. By itself, that's not enough as, oh, I am pretty sure Claire is about to die. Yeah, he's Roll dead. You do see that they are angling towards the Baron, but uh, not on that fast of a reset. And you've got Lethality Garus as well, so not really in a position to do that. Nice little pick off from Gen G, who I think that last team fight should come as a bit of a reality Fire check. Oh, yeah, no, because we have seen a couple of wishy-washy team fights, and Fear X are playing really well, and they're just straight up playing better team fights than Gen.G at this moment in time. Yeah, that, and that one right there, the previous one was just Gen.G straight up goofing. This just felt like Fear X outplayed them. Great use of the Nocturne ult, isolate the target, and punish this Udyr who feels like he is completely invincible. So take another look at this. It's rather straightforward. There's no summoners and no ultimate here for clear, so it's not really a way where he ever gets out here. If you get a teleport, you do see some pinks towards the Nash but they don't really have the damage to burst this down quickly. Varus, rather lackluster, just to Leah. Alone, not gonna be enough. Yeah. And they do use Jovi's teleport to make that play happen. Um, but they will have Keen's one for if we do get into Baron territory. Baron take territory, I suppose, in terms of the time of the game. So. Should be just fine with that, although Tobi is going to go down to the bottom side of the map without his TP. I feel like they are confident enough to take it 4v5 until Tobi does get there, I suppose. 
Although the 4v5s have been a little bit of a pain point here for Gen.G as another hook is going to land from Execute. They bring out the Weaver's Wall. Because they're really committing to taking down the Hens here. He is going to get picked off. If the damage comes through, one more rock would do it. But it's the arrow from Henna that does get the job done. And that is now no cow left over here on the side of Genji. There was a lot of investment this time around, though. So I don't know if you really want to go for Baron. I think that just the kill in and of itself should be a win. If you can force a fight, though, that would be huge. But Genji is staying safe here. Big is that Pace doesn't have a third item yet. Also, not going for something with... <laughs> <laughs> what is happening shred. in this game? Zoning the five of them away. They have that Azir turret, which they can play around very nicely. As going to use the Unstoppable is Kane, and Pay's able to get over the wall here as well. Chains of Corruption into the air as Toby gets the four of them, and just like that, Genji decide they want to win a team fight. Toby has had enough of the fooling around, and Willer will go down as well. It's a triple for Canyon. It's a clean ace, and I think they might just end the game. Just when we start to get the feeling that they can't keep getting away with it, they can't keep disrespecting their opponents. There's no way that it doesn't backfire. Gen G do this. In the end, all that matters is getting the Nexus, and that they did. The I guess way so. in which they did it does <laughs> not deserve any awards. But, well, I, I guess I have to vote Chovy, because yeah. he, he did just. <laughs> I mean... They did just win the game there! That was the one play that won Genji the game. Oh my god. Is it, and I can only imagine that Fear X was saying the same thing that Aiming said when they were playing against T1 after they got clean ace, like, from an even game state. Because frankly, Genji did not look all too hot today, but they get the 2-0. And that's what matters. Yeah, they had a bit of fun. I, I do think that Fear X... Um, they're playing their hearts out there in that game number two. They get a, a couple of team fights that go slightly in their favor. But the issue against the really good teams is that they know how to push their leads really fast, but they also know how to mitigate their losses very well. And even though Tenji, I feel like, didn't necessarily do a great job of that, Firex still were never able to get the one team fight that got them over the edge to a, a winning game state that was very difficult to lose from. So even though they were taking a bunch of team fights, they never broke the backs of Gen.G. And then eventually Chovy just sent out a prayer to the church of Chovy and, uh, you know, dusted off his hands and he said, okay, I did my job here and the game ended. See some sheepish faces uh, and grins from the coaches as well. They know Hayes didn't even get to get to his third item on Zeri. And it, I think 0-2-10 on the uh, on the pick lands. Not his best day. His, uh, his Nautilus got picked out a bunch of times, but all you need to win the game is just that one play. They did find it. I'm sure Chovy is going to basically hark up all the POG points specifically because of that. Yeah, I mean, before Genji started losing team fights, the score was like 4-3, to three and nothing can really happen, right? And then Genji yeah. were losing team fights until Chovy bolted four people and I, won the game. So yeah. it's like kind of hard to <laughs> vote for anyone else, you know? I was just by process of elimination, I was like leaning towards like either Pays or Chovy, depending on how the later team fights went. Yeah. Uh, but then there were no more team fights. That was just... And Kenyon, Keen, and Lands uh, taking taking some unnecessary risks in this one. The early laning phase, though, is still something that Genji is going to have to take a look at. I do think that this is an exploitable part of this roster. And consistently we see some form of struggles, but this play is the one where you're like, oh, Genji, what? This was 4 5 to. They had lost Keen. Yeah. And they said, you know what? I'm going to send it. <laughs> and they did, and it backfired. This one as well the game. got broken up by Paranoia, but I do think that Keen went way too ham, you know, overestimating his tankiness. He said, okay, I'm fine. I'm in the back line. And then he just died. It's a weird game, Veldest. I, it, it, you know, some games afterwards are like, man, that was a that was a great series that fills you with satisfaction. Yeah. That that was the opposite of this game. <laughs> it's like they build yeah. up to this huge cliffhanger. Okay, okay. okay. All right. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for this M Night Shyamalan twist, and it doesn't happen. 
Let's see, let's see what they say. Focus Cassante is what they're saying. I can go for this, I can go for this. Frontline, frontline first. I think we can end. Wow. That was refreshing. And that was it. <laughs> that was the end of the game. Look at the gold crap. Like, what? What world are we living in? I fear we live in a world where, as long as Senna is banned, both Genji and T1, in their own way, are going to keep getting away with it. And no one's going to stop. <laughs> Yeah, they kind of just got away with it. And uh, I love how right before that they're like, yeah, focus Cassante. Like, <laughs> very interesting calls. But uh, at the end of the day, you sweep four people, you win the game, and you take a 2-0. And the 2-0 is all that matters. Clean 2-0, nothing to see here from Genji tonight. Guys, we're done on the cast. Let's go over to the space and see what they had to say about that wonderful game, too. Clean two zeros across the board today. Fantastic work, gentlemen, as per usual. And yes, we are back to break down game number two. And honestly, we saw the gold graph. Thank you for pointing that one out, uh, Valdez. It was a little bit of a flat line, even though it started out with a level one kill. Yeah, it was a very messy game. Um, the level one didn't end up meeting too much. And just like game one, Wheeler was able to make some proactive plays early. I think that Fear X definitely have started to figure out that they're a very proactive team in the early game like Live Sandbox was before them. Maybe if they can continue to push towards this identity, they can keep um, this play style and kind of refine it. Maybe there's a, you know, an upwards trajectory for the squad going into round two. Yeah, I mean, also, if you see the draft, like, together, I think it's a, as a just composition wise, like, it's the same thing. Like, I mean, Genji, you know, brought these, the Zeri. I like, just look at the bottom and they brought the, uh, the Varus Nolis, like, still, it's the same as a game one. They did punish like a little bit, you know? And also they were like on the road that is just trying to stack on the Drake, like which is like also the 5P, the Talia bringing Talia as well. And also having one more Nocturne got the really, really fast and double kill on the bottom as well. And there was a lot of good factor that also top wasn't really bad as much as game one either. So it was going well, but until you know, Zeri hit it. So I think it's, it was like everything about like really Zeri and sure, like Genji's did, like kind of there was a hiccup moment, but still it didn't really matter. It's like same thing. The the Fear X couldn't really find out the opportunity to exploit the snowball, and it's just they got they got you know basically Genji the value. To me, it was a little bit sad though because it felt like Fear X kind of won everything until they lost the game and it was over. And, and I felt like they may have deserved an extra opportunity to get back in. But let's have a look at uh, this fight in the mid lane because this is a demonstration that Fear X actually pretty good, you know? Yeah, I mean, Keen is, it almost just feels like he's messing around. Like he's trying to get some additional information and the rest of the team is trying to secure Dragon, right? And so you have the opportunity here as Keen to make a proactive play, but he's just instantly blown up and then it gets very messy. The, the uh, drive around here from Canyon is, is very funny. But now you've lost a player, and maybe it's not time to go in as Lee Sin into a bunch of CC. I, I mean, that's just my personal take on this one, but Canyon, he had, he had different ideas, and uh, he was swiftly taken out by a great fault there from Willer and his AD carry. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's like this is like definitely like kind of was like limit testing from Genji. Like, sure, we lost one person, but like, we might as well just try to 4v5 because like, we, there were. There was really good shape. Like I thought, game was over until there, and I was like, "Oh, I guess they're just like they're gonna win." I guess no matter what. That's why, probably. I mean, that's my assumption. Like that's probably their thought process behind. Like, sure, we're just gonna we have a better scaling. Already scale is done. Like even though we had like bad fight, it's gonna be it's gonna take a longer. Like we're gonna probably playing like five minutes more, but probably doesn't matter. That's what I felt. Yeah, and it's sort of like that that confidence that we do get from some of our top teams here. I think T1 has been uh, definitely another one that has been playing to that a lot. It's just that assumption that you're better and that you're going to win. Genji last season also had that as well. Um, they managed to win three LCKs in a row uh, off the back of it, right? Like, it's just that quiet confidence that we'll just find an angle. And guess what? They did. Yeah, Genji... Um 
I don't think they're very good at happy gaming, let's be honest. Like, <laughs> one is very good at happy gaming. They do the fun picks, they do the, the really fun strategies, but they bait people a lot. It's really, really successful. Um, on the side of Gen G, they kind of just keep it stock standard. Uh, now, Lehens does get picked here in this moment, and then, you know, there's a bit of an awkward moment where Genji are like, okay, the best plan here is actually to push mid, and Fear X actually don't handle this very well. They see the Azir turret go up, and they're like, oh, we can't really chase here. Keen's wrapping around as well, and then what everybody is it, groups. Yeah, everybody groups, and guess what? It's a 4v5 again, and it's the only different thing is like Genji just, you know, it just replaced like top, the support to top. And Toby, like, I think he was, like, so tired just just have, being happy gaming, and it's like, no, I'm going to end man. the game. I'm just going to end it. I'm just going to send it right here. It's just, I feel like there was no respect shown to where Chovy was there. I thought the call to push um, mid from Genji was fantastic, because you're going to get map control from that. You can buy a ton of time, but then Chovy just saw the angle, and he was like, I guess we, we just win the game. Uh, and they did. Uh... It's as you said, Atlas earlier. It feels kind of tragic because Phyrex did some cool stuff. They got their coordination together. They were very aggressive. They did a good job punishing some of those mistakes. There's Huni. He, he nods. He agrees as well. <laughs> um, and uh, then Chovy just said no, and the game ended. And that that's kind of a heartbreaking loss um, for the Phyrex boys. Yeah, I would say so too. And it's like that winning until you lost thing. You know, the very famous quote from Skara that uh, echoes through time. Uh, it it just really is a bit sad that uh, you, they couldn't hold it together for that last moment. But do you know who could? It was Trovi. Let's give him his POG, shall we? Um, see whether he does make it to 700. There he is. Equal with Faker still at the end of the day in first place for our POG points. I mean, for sure. I think he, you know, he was like, no, I can't lose Faker. You ever and just get POG with one highlight? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what they—they they should have put in the level one, right? Because like he got the kill with an auto attack. That's true. You know, it was all Trovi. Well, I mean, there's a there's a still good fight, but I think this this mean it just means a lot. This fight actually just turned around. Like it was a whole a whole game explains everything. Yeah, and honestly, I think that there is there is no better option, right, than uh, than choosing Trovi for this because it looked like yeah, and it's 12 out of 12, and I don't fault anyone. Because there was that one moment that, that Gen G were in control. It was actually just that one moment, and then immediately afterwards the Nexus exploded. So you hit a five-man ult, you pick up the POG, and that is how it goes. And now it is time for an interview. So here is G Sun for the interview translation. Take it away. Thank you very much, guys. This is Jason for the POG interview translation, joined by Keen and Chovy on the side of Genji. Congratulations on the win, guys. First off, how do you feel about the win to kick off the second round? Well, personally, I don't think the games were easy today, but I'm so relieved that we got a win in the end. Yeah, same. It was a very difficult match for us, actually, but at the end, I was able to find the right angle and close out the series, so it feels good. Chovy, one more time, you are tied with Faker as PUG leaders. It's going back and forth and back and forth. The contention is real. Are you paying attention to the PUG standings competition, too? Not really when I'm playing the game, but I think it's a great point or like something to enjoy for the fans so I'm glad that I'm providing something for the fans not only by playing the game well, in the first game, Chovy and Pays kind of played double Dragon Comp, so we had so much AoE damage coming from Aesol and Smolder. Tell us about the composition. I think right now Aesol is really good uh, because of the patch, but having Aesol and Smolder at the same time was definitely really difficult going through the laning phase, so I think this comp does have strengths but also has some weaknesses. However, Keen's Xante was the one that bought time for Gen G. So let's take a look at this back to back solo kill from your Xante. Based on the matchup, it is actually not easy to get a kill as a Xante into Poppy. How, do, how did you see this angle? I was able to kind of force out the W from Poppy. So I was looking for a bit of an extended fight here. So I got the kill. 
one more time here. At this time, Poppy had her oat, so I was just gonna try to go for a trade of oats, but somehow it turned out really good for me and I got the kill. So the first solo kill was something that Keen was looking for, uh, looking for, but the second one, uh, Keen said he got a little lucky. Also, I have a question about your itemization too. You didn't go for the worker, instead you went for the spirit visage. Tell us about it too. So, Urgurn is really good because it gives you shield before the fight even starts. But Visage is more about, you know, like lifesteal and like more health. But it depends. But that game, I thought Spirit Visage was a little better. Pace got his fourth pentakill at the LCK in his career. Everyone was doing their best to give him the pentakill. Tell us about that situation. I mean, he got a lot of pentas already, so like... I just wanted to end the game early, but Chubi and all the other players were like really cooperative, helping you get the penta, so yeah. I guess. Good for him. Nakeen, you know, he's a cold guy. He's a cold-blooded guy, you know. He's all about the business, but as a friend, myself, I really wanted to give my boy Pace the penta. Keen. Then, anything you want to say over to Pace? A, a word of celebration? Congratulations, Mr. Pace. Congratulations on your penta. I hope you get another penta in your future as well. It should be another win for your Azir. You're now having... This is your third consecutive Azir POG for you. Do you think it's going to be target bent next time? Doesn't really matter. You know, if they bend Azir, I have other options. If they don't bend Azir, well, I have a very high mastery on the champion, so I don't. I just don't really mind whether I get a zero or not. Keen. Game two. Fear X absolutely had the control all over the map, actually. They were having a lot of Drake stacks and they were ahead of gold at some point. So, what did you guys focus on in order to turn the game around? Yeah, we were making mistakes uh, in the mid game a lot. So, we were in a very rough spot, but we were able to find the angle and turn the table around to get the win. Speaking of turning the table around, let's take a look at this replay. Chobi absolutely turned something around, turned all five members of, on the enemy side around. So I was counting their the enemy spells, and then after I saw the major skills like Talia, W, or like E, all the other major skills getting used before the sweep, I was pretty sure that I can make that play happen, so I just, I was just sending it. Keen, uh, you didn't mention about that play though about you know looking for a turnaround in the game chubby any words uh, regarding that i mean he's full on business mode so not surprised and it happens as you did an amazing job job uh, he was well, definitely focused up to win the game next week genji is going up against kwangdong freaks and kt roaster a very important two matches for genji to kind of solidify the position on the standings I think both teams are on a great momentum at the moment, so I think Genji keep uh, gotta keep the good work going. Same, I think all of the LCK teams are doing a great job, so there is no easy opponent right now, so we have to keep working hard. And this will be the end of the interview from Key and Chovy, and back to the space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jisun, for the interview translation. Great to hear from both Keen and Chovy. Chovy after his five-man ulti. I was just thinking, when was the last time I saw a uh, five-man ultimate uh, from an Azir? And it's been a while, because, of course, often, you know, even the, some of the best ones are four-man. Um, that was ridiculous. So Sometimes impressive the other team is grouped up enough for you to actually It is it. very true. There are certain <laughs> things that do have to go your way. Speaking of going your way, Gen.G, 9 and 1 alongside T1 on that scoreline, but a little bit below because they haven't been as decisive in their wins. I mean, I'm really looking forward to the T1 Gen.G series. I believe it's coming in two weeks of the Saturday showdown. Yep. Bro, like that's going to be banger day. Someone will fall off from the, you know, the winning streaks. Speaking of bra, 
Um, yeah, we got Bro against Kwangdong Freaks. Oh, two. baby. Pool Bay Boogaloo. Um, I think Pool Bay will be starting. I we, we don't know for sure. Karis actually had a pretty good series against Kwangdong. Uh, you know, weird to say it, but uncharacteristically actually overperformed. Um, and then D Plus also get their rematch over DRX. They absolutely stomped them. So tomorrow could get wild. Uh, it could definitely be a little bit weird. Yeah, this one could be about building momentum, continuing on that train as well, or some interruptions. But we'll have to just watch to find out. That'll be coming up tomorrow. For now, this is Good Night. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.